I'm S.T. Karnick, a Senior Fellow and Publications Director at the Heartland Institute. The subject of this panel is Green Energy and Exploitation. The green energy movement presents itself as a benevolent endeavor. Saying your goal is to save the planet is a highly effective way of disarming criticism. We have in fact seen how effective it is. But when the remedies being presented involve child labor, enslavement of disfavored minorities, environmental destruction in low-income countries, and in low-income areas in, in uh, higher-income countries, and other harms toward vulnerable and especially low-income people, the high-minded sentiments can ring hollow. When do good intentions justify the mistreatment of powerless people? Our panel will explore that issue this morning. Our speakers, I'm going to introduce them all at once, and then they'll just come up and speak their parts, and you can reread their names in your programs and read their full bios there. I hope you will do so. Uh, these are three excellent speakers. I've heard all of them speak before, and they're so good. Our speakers are Vijay Jairaj of the CO2 Coalition, H. Sterling Burnett, PhD of the Heartland Institute, and E. Calvin Beisner, PhD of the Cornwall Alliance for the Stewardship of Creation. After the panel's presentations, we will have a question and answer session, and I'll give you the protocols for that when we get there. Our first speaker is Vijay Jairaj. Welcome, Vijay. Thank you, Sam. Uh, good morning, everyone. Well, today we can have a look at climate imperialism or carbon imperialism. Well, there's a growing sentiment in the developing parts of our world on the current crop of green policies uh, being similar, very similar to the colonial era. So I want to begin by this quote from Thomas Sowell, which says, freedom has cost too much blood and agony to be relinquished at the cheap price of rhetoric. So now, we know that many countries uh, went through a lot of uh, uh, suppression under colonial rule, and uh, it's past, yes, but then uh, they became free uh, in the past century and are, are all considered as autonomous now. So just to give you an example, uh, my country, India, uh, there were terrible manufactured famines and thousands were killed in the freedom fight before we got our independence in 1947. And there are many other countries like India. So, but now this hard fought freedom is being threatened by climate policies put forward by climate alarmists. So these climate policies are rooted in rhetoric. They are persuasive and impressive PR about the end of this world due to man-made climate change. And it often lacks sincerity and accuracy in science. And it is also accompanied with no empathy for developmental needs of people in these countries. And the current situation of these people cannot be understood just by reading a report or even by making a short visit there. The state of poverty is really brutal. So how do we define climate imperialism? It's when a group of unelected people in elite global political bodies try to enforce their restrictive energy policies on people in sovereign nations. And you have the definition for climate imperialism. So how, we all know that uh, there are multiple routes through which the climate alarmists enforce these restrictive policies on people. It's, it began with the Paris Climate Agreement in 2016, and then we have the net zero now. Besides, they have a wide network of environmental activists, nonprofits, celebrities. They have infiltrate, infiltrated the academia, and they use the mainstream media effectively. And most importantly, they are cutting off funding to fossil fuel projects uh, in ex countries in extreme poverty in Africa. It does invoke a lot of response. And here we have the Niger president who says, Africa is being punished by the decisions of Western countries to end public financing for fossil, foreign fossil fuel projects. We are going to continue to fight. We have fossil fuels that should be exploited. 
it is frankly unbelievable that those who have been exploiting oil and its derivatives for more than a century are now preventing African countries from reaping their resources. So that's the reason why he says that if you look at the energy disparity across the world, a kettle boiled in UK just twice a day consumes more electricity than a person in Mali uses in an entire year. And for a person living in Tanzania, it takes eight years to consume as much electricity as an average American uses in one month. And forget people, consider electrical appliances, like a freezer in the United States consumes 10 times more electricity than a Liberian in North Africa does in a whole year. So imagine people who are benefiting from fossil fuel driven wealth asking people living in extreme energy poverty to stop using coal. The reaction and response to this has been much severe in some countries uh, that have a larger population and more power when it comes to global diplomacy. One such country is India. And here's the quote from Indian Prime Minister in 2021. Attempts are made to shut the path and resources for developing countries through which developed nations reached where they are today. In the past decades, a web of different terminologies were spun for this. The issue of environment is also being attempted to be hijacked for this purpose. We saw an example of this in the recent COP26 summit. Today, no nation exists as a colony to any other nation. But that doesn't mean the colonial mindset has ended. So he's referring to the, the climate policies that are being enforced upon these nations. But we must know that uh, responses have not just been in the form of statements, but also in, in form of policies. Uh, something that I call as the bipolar twin or twin strategy through which leaders in developing countries show up at international conferences uh, pledging emission reduction. But back at home, they speak truth and commit to domestic energy policies that ensures reliable and affordable energy access to people. Now, they are far from perfection, but they are trying their best to accomplish this. And among the countries that are leading in fossil fuel consumption, in defiance of this global green policies are China and India. As you all know, China is the biggest fossil fuel consuming country with more than 50% of global coal consumption happening there. And this year, they are renewing the coal supply contracts for all mines and adding another 70 gigawatts of coal and gas power capacity. But make no mistake, if you focus on India, the highest percentage rise in coal this year is going to come from India, not from China. And they are doing this by in in increasing the import of coal and removing any policies that inhibit the growth of coal sector. Sticking with India, a little bit more detail on it. Uh, if you look at the energy consumption by source, uh, the population is currently around 1.4 billion. And 90% of primary energy to these people come from fossil fuels. And this is why India is keen on increasing the capacity of fossil fuels in the country. Their coal consumption has doubled since 2007. And it is only fair to call India as the growth engine of global coal demand. Some argue that India and China are wasting a lot of time uh, and energy in renewable energy installations. But a closer look shows us that the year-on-year -year change in primary energy consumption uh, is way different between renewables like wind and solar and fossil fuels, especially coal. So the country is trying its best. Despite that, it, has, it is facing a lot of criticism and even challenge. Uh, we, we do not know for sure uh, that they can come up on the top always. But there are more critical things to be looked at. Uh, which shows the kind of energy poverty that exists in these countries. Uh, if you see, Ch India is the second largest consumer of coal in the world. But when you look at per capita coal consumption, the scenario is totally different. India has the lowest per capita coal consumption among the top 10 coal consuming countries in the world. And if you look at Australia, it has seven times more per capita coal consumption. And if you look at the renewable champions of Europe, they have four times more coal consumption than India. 
So imagine uh, sitting on the wealth created by fossil fuels and using them presently and asking countries not to consume the same coal. And I love this quote from the former chief economic advisor to the Indian prime minister. India cannot allow the narrative of carbon imperialism to come in the way of realistic, rational planning for the country's energy future. Coal will remain and should remain. The time is ripe for creating a green and clean coal coalition that, rather than the unconscionable calls to phase out India's cheapest source of energy, will serve the cause of India's developmental needs. And this is even more interesting. This is from the Minister of Environment and Climate. And he says, how can anyone expect that developing countries can make promises about phasing out coal and fossil fuel subsidies when developing countries still have to deal with their developmental agendas and poverty eradication, coming from a minister who is supposed to reduce emissions. And that shows us the current mindset of the leaders there. In a sense, they don't have any other option uh, but to make sure that uh, the economy grows and people get reliable energy access. The argument against this in the West is that uh, isn't our world dying because of higher temperatures? Wouldn't it be right to prioritize scientific propaganda ahead of the very lives of people dying in poverty? Well, my answer is no. Especially when this is happening. You have uh, ice records in the Ar Arctic showing uh, no major, no unprecedented collapse of the ice sheets. You have UH global mean temperatures showing no alarming increase in temperatures. And you have regions in Japan who have shown no increase in temperatures, mean monthly temperatures for the last 70 years. And there are regular cold weather events, record cold weather events happening all over the world. And the icing on the cake, uh, if you look at the current crop of climate models that are uh, supposed to show us how warm our future will be, they are more than 90% of them are faulty. So how do you trust them? If you look at my country, India, rainfall records from the last 150 years shows no unprecedented increase in drought or extreme rainfall. It has been happening all along. The other side of this thing, how are humans faring in this climate optimum? If you look at that, uh, we are producing record crop production. So nothing to be worried about. And uh, the major food crops, rice, wheat, and maize, has shown incredible increase in production in major agricultural countries like India, China, and US. And certainly, we cannot depend on the solutions they are providing to the developing countries, which are renewable tech, because they are proven to not work even, even in uh, advanced states like California, Texas, and Germany. So when you ask the developing countries to go back to preparing for an exam under candlelight, which I did. Make no mistake, don't confuse this with a romantic candlelight dinner. It's horrible <laughs> to sit under that. We, we are not going back to that. And uh, we are not sitting in 104 degree Fahrenheit uh, with our uh, newspapers trying to cool ourselves. We are not going back to that. So the developing countries must not allow their domestic energy policies be dictated by climate alarmists in the West, especially the UN, the World Economic Forum, and the Biden administration. If these countries uh, give in to the pressure from the West, it will cost them dearly. It is my humble effort to bring some of this in my book, Climate Imperialism, which should be published in the next six months. Uh, it will reveal more in detail how pseudoscience and green cult undermine the hopes of billions of people who are living in energy poverty. Thank you. Thank you all for being here today. Glad to see you could get up this morning. I'm not a morning person myself, so... Uh, I'm here, it's good to see you're here as well. So, uh, no, I didn't have it up. I want to start out with a question. I want to see hands. This is actually an interactive uh, presentation. Who likes slave and child labor? <laughs> I, I'm having trouble with the vision, but I don't see 
any hands. Okay. Well, okay, we agree on something. And yet, we are pushing modern technologies, um, more expensive, more labor-intensive, more uh, environmentally destructive technologies that are and do and shall for the foreseeable future, as far as I can tell, depend heavily on labor, uh, a child and, and slave labor. Now, modern electronics, uh, everybody, everybody, I've got a cell phone in my pocket, everyone's got a cell phone, right? Now they all use fossil fuels because the plastics are all made from fossil fuels, but internally they all have materials, technologies, batteries, wiring, uh, uh, um, I'm having a senior moment here, uh, chips, that all require rare earth and critical minerals. Um, you can see some of it up here. Uh, I call them conflict minerals because most of these minerals, where they're mined, uh, in, in the old days they called, talked about conflict diamonds. So you had warlords profiting from uh, the diamond delivery or gold. Uh, well, you've got the same types of people, uh, the people that you'd like for your neighbors to watch your kids if you were away for the weekend, uh, who are in control of these critical minerals. Uh, corrupt governments, uh, authoritarian governments, and if you look, um, you'll see uh, the different minerals, you'll see uh, some of the, in a second, you'll see some of the countries where they come from. The uh, International Energy Agency notes, this is electric vehicles and fossil fuel vehicles. Electric on the top, fossil fuel on the bottom. Critical minerals, how, which one has more, demands more critical rare earth minerals that come, well, when it comes to rare earths, China dominates the world market. And when they're not producing them, they're refining them. They finance rare earth production in other countries, like Afghanistan now. Um, but then the rare earths themselves are delivered to China, where they're refined and made into usable materials. So if you've got an electric car, you're asking China, don't control my life. Uh, you're begging them, I'll do anything you want, just make sure I have my electric vehicle. Because we're not producing those things in America. Uh, Cobalt, another thing. Uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo uh, is not the largest reserves of cobalt, but they are by far the largest producer. And I want you to look at which technologies use cobalt. Well, uh, offshore wind by far and away is the largest user of these critical minerals. Onshore wind is the second largest user of these critical minerals that are provided by slave labor and child labor. And uh, solar is the third largest user. So if you want more of these things, you're actually encouraging bad actors uh, using slave and child labor. That's just the, that's the way of the world right now. We can, we can say we shouldn't be doing that, but when you say we've got to have more of this, when you mandate it, you're actually saying Okay, ramp up the mines in Congo because we don't want it expensive. We want it cheap, right? Um, a single offshore wind turbine requires three metric tons of copper and magnets, uh, composed in large part of hard to find and mine minerals and rare earths. Uh, a much larger offshore wind turbine requires even more copper and magnets. Uh, in addition, between 200,000 and 1,500,000 pounds of earth must be mined and moved to produce lithium, copper, nickel, and other metals and trace elements necessary to produce a battery pack, a single battery pack for an electric car, much less the huge battery farms that we're going to back up, supposedly back up all the wind and solar uh, um, facilities. That's a lot of earth. That's a lot of labor. And it's a lot of slave labor and it's a lot of environmental destruction. So, which leads us to the question, under what conditions do these minerals come from? This is cobalt. Necessary component for all these green technologies. 
Biden is pushing on an expedited time scale. The largest producer of cobalt, Democratic Republic of Congo. I mean, it's not even close. It's not even close. Uh, and so you say, oh, well, at least we're enriching, we're, we're enriching those, the good people of the Democratic Republic of Congo. They've got a lot of poverty there. We're enriching them. Uh, the people that are getting rich is the, the corrupt governments and uh, the warlords and the mine managers. Um, I, I think for some situations, um, a situ uh, um, an image tells a thousand words. That's the old adage, right? So I'm just going to scroll through a few images. That's, uh, that's your laborers in the cobalt fields there. Um, can, can you imagine that situation in a mine in the U.S.? You think anyone would get away with that? There's, there's a big one. Formalization of child labor. These little bitty pits that kids go in and dig out uh, and then carry the heavy uh, minerals. There's some of your uh, well-paid workers in the Democratic Republic of Congo that are uh, providing the minerals that we have for our cell phones and our uh, wind turbines. Fantastic working conditions there. This is a teenager putting her infant in a cardboard box so she can go mine in, in, in the Congo for our cobalt. No, but we're greener than thou, so it's okay. And then there's China, uh, where they have the, the Uyghurs, slave labor, uh, the, the, the work re-education camps of the Falun Gong. Uh, I don't know anything about the Falun Gong's religion. I don't know if there's some weird cult or not. But I don't think you get to, to force them to be re-educated re and work slave labor because you don't like their religion. Uh, these are some Chinese working those rare earth mines. Notice all the safety equipment they're wearing. Uh, the, the respirators and the masks and the oxygen. Oh, wait. You, you don't see any of that. Then there's the environmental destruction. This is just the waste, the tailings from these mines that's just flowing out into the rivers. You know, we, we worry about mining here in the U.S. Do you think any mining company would get away with that? Maybe 150 years ago, maybe 100 years ago, not today. Yellow. Uh, you like that yellow? If, if you like your water yellow, go to a rare earth mining or refining facility over there in China. Uh, it, gives, it gives a whole new meaning to the Yellow River, right? That's toxic waste going straight into the stream that people downstream use water from. There's uh, uh, the earth thanks to the Chinese Communist Party. Now, uh, some people say, oh, well, you're hard on China, you're hard on the DRC. Um, I, honestly, I'm, to some extent, I understand why they're doing this. They're satisfying our demand. If we weren't demanding these materials, we wouldn't be seeing that. More well-compensated Chinese mine workers there. Uh, I, lo I love that machine. That looks like it could be upset out of some kind of sci-fi movie where you're on Mars mining something, right? I, I think it's an amazing machine, regardless of what it, you know, whatever it's doing to the Earth. The machinery itself is, wow. There's the, you're killing the planet to save it here, you know. Uh, Western countries are very concerned about the planet, and this is what they're producing elsewhere. But at least not polluting the air. Oh, oh, but wait, they are. This is the refining of these materials. We don't get away with that here. We don't get away with that in Western Europe. Um, uh, Australia doesn't allow this kind of thing to happen. Um, so all these materials are produced by child labor, by slave labor, by, even when it's not child and slave labor, by workers who aren't 
operating under the same conditions we expect in the West, as far as safety, as far as health, as far as, um, you know, uh, payment. Uh, I asked at the outset of my talk who's in favor of child and slave labor. I didn't see a single hand go up, and yet, if you ask the question honestly, evidently it's Joe Biden, the Democrats in Congress, and agency heads who demand ever greater amounts of green energy. You say, well, no, they don't like that. Well, their words say they don't like that. I admit that. Uh, but the impact of their policies seem to do so. So even the Biden administration's own State Department has acknowledged that child labor is rife in the production of cobalt. You can say, oh, Sterling, you're, you're just making this up, even with the pictures. That could be anything. No. This is what the Biden, uh, this is uh, the Democratic, uh, the Department of Labor's report S says uh, child labor is used to produce all these things. USMC and the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, and let's see. It says, uh, it's a memorandum of understanding between the Department of Labor and the Ministry of Employment for Labor and Security about child labor. It says, well, we want you to do less of that. And, and the Congo says, okay, we're going to do less of that. We have a, we have a memorandum of understanding. Thank you. Uh, now, how much uh, cobalt do you need? Right? Uh, do you think we have much enforcement power on them when we're demanding more and more of what they provide? You know, I think you'd be a fool to believe that. Um, so it's not as if they don't know this is going on. What about China? Well, uh, we're, we're, we're tough on China, right? Uh, <laughs> I like this. Uh, I like this. So we, we're going to get tough on China. And how do we get tough on China? We go to Africa for more stuff. So we, we're saying no more, slave, no more of that slave labor in China. We're not going to let you torture the Uyghurs. Instead, we'll just have you put more kids in the mines in Africa. So uh, they passed a law. Um, they, uh, the Biden administration signed the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act in 2021. Sounds good on paper. And, it says, and, and under that, they blocked the import of uh, thousands of Chinese solar panels. So they selected a group of uh, ships, and they found, and they said, oh, that's slave labor. We're not, we're not going to allow these in. Um, and yet, this is the reality of today's situation. You notice I had a lot of pictures of the DRC mining. I could have had hundreds of more. There are very few pictures coming out of China of the uh, labor. Government has a little bit more control there. How much oversight do you think the U.S. government has over conditions in China? They, they, stop, they block a few thousand solar panels, but how many batteries have they blocked coming in for your cell phones and for your electric vehicles? How many out of the probably millions of panels coming in, how many solar panels did they really stop? The point is, we don't know. We, don't, we have no oversight. We have no grip on the Chinese as long as we want what they have and we're not producing it. So there's the alternative. I don't think we could get all the rare earths and minerals from the United States that we do, that we need, but uh, we could get a lot of them. Uh, I believe the U.S. government should not be offshoring pollution uh, to satisfy our green energy demands. I think that's morally objectionable. Um, so what's the answer? If you, if you want green energy, the answer is, well, let's get more mining done in the United States. How long does it take to get a mine permit in the United States? Well, under Trump, they were saying it took 10 years. Well, 10 years is better than never, I guess. Um, Five minutes. Yeah, we're going to make it, actually. Um, whoops, wrong way. So just in the past two months, the Biden administration has blocked three mines. On the campaign trail, he says, we're going to renew mining in the United States. We're going to start producing 
rare earth minerals here. Every mine that comes up, but not you. But not you. The Natural Resources Committee uh, held a hearing on this. Uh, and uh, um, let's see if I can read it here. So the State Department just last month withdrew uh, for 20 years uh, uh, 225,000 acres of a mine. I say, oh, you can go for it on the rest of the acreage. Well, it's not profitable if I can't use all the acreage for the mine. So the mine's not going forward. It's being challenged, but uh, this is what um, uh, Bruce Westerman said about that. We cannot have a future of renewable energy without minerals, period. Not to mention the necessity to our defense systems, satellites, cell phones, virtually every other technology. While Democrats play political ping pong with the American industries, China and Russia are laughing all the way to the bank. So we don't like the Chinese and the Congo and what they're doing. We'll replace it with our minerals, except we won't allow any mines to be built. Uh, the administration also blocked the mine in Bristol Bay. Um, This is uh, some of our allies, what they had to say about that. So the facts on the ground, the, the Biden administration can talk a good game about we don't like slave labor, we don't like child labor, we're going to produce stuff here. But the facts on the ground is they're not producing stuff here. They're blocking it at every turn. And yet they're requiring more and more of the materials to do their green energy push. I, uh, I got a slide just, just at the end, and I didn't want to... Uh, have to throw a third version to Jim to, to post, but so um, the laughingly called uh, um, Inflation Reduction Act that passed last year, which was really a, a Green Energy Act, uh, it contained, Biden bragged about these provisions. He said, this is about jobs for the U.S. So we're going to produce all these technologies, including 500,000 electric vehicle charging stations across the U.S. by date certain. And the, and the beauty of it is they have to produce, they have to be made from materials made in the United States, built by laborers in the United States. We're not just going to, we're not going to go back into the Chinese, not us. Uh, just two weeks ago, the Biden administration quietly in, in, the, in the back rooms waived that electric vehicle provision because they said, well, it turns out we're not going to get our, uh, our chargers built and installed fast enough, and so we're waiving the labor and materials provisions. <laughs> I said that was going to happen when they passed the Inflation Reduction Act. I said, you're not going to get the electric vehicles you say we're going to have to have in the time you say we're going to have to have it if you don't use uh, Chinese materials because we can't get a single mine built, much less enough mines to provide all the materials and the labor. So uh, this is where they, uh, they, had, they actually announced, we're giving $700 million to a, a lithium mine here in the US. Um, and then the Department of Interior withdrew the critical acreage necessary to mine the lithium. So we're going to throw a lot of money at this mine that's now not going to be constructed. Publicly, we, we brag about how much we're giving to lithium. Privately, we're blocking the lithium production. So I, I, I guess I'll end it with this, yeah. There's no environmental or economic justification for the Biden administration's green energy agenda. It's not necessary to fight climate change. And as the benefits and costs fall in the real world, it's morally abhorrent. Even if you get all these things built and, it, and they provide, they deliver all the benefits that they say they're going to provide, including the climate prevention benefits, right? Even if the best case scenario, we're still offshoring the cost to people, uh, you know, to child labor and to, to slave laborers and to the environmental destruction in all these other countries that don't have our standards for mines. We can mine in the U.S. And when we do, it's, it, it's often not pretty. I've been to mines in, in Montana. They're not beautiful. But they have to be reclaimed. Do you think the Chinese are going around reclaiming things after the destruction is wrought? Uh, we shouldn't offshore our pollution and encourage expanded 
morally objectionable labor conditions to satisfy gr uh, Western green virtue signaling. Thank you very much. Well, thank you also for being here. And uh, I'm Cal Beisner, the president of the Cornwall Alliance for the Stewardship of Creation. And it's a real privilege for me to be able to speak to you here today. I'm going to make my remarks uh, very simple. I'm not going to go into a lot of technology and, and details and whatnot. Won't throw a bunch of different f uh, figures at you. I, I do have a few uh, graphs to show you, but they're pretty simple graphs because my points are pretty simple. Uh, I want to just start, though, by giving you just a bit of my own personal background. When I was a toddler, my father accepted a position with the U.S. State Department that moved us to Calcutta, India, where, among his other functions, he was uh, partly in charge of, of uh, managing the, the receipt and distribution of of shipments of grain from the U.S. to India in the mid-1950s uh, to uh, attempt to, uh, to, to prevent or to, to end famines that were happening all across India. Uh, a decade later, because of the Green Revolution, India became a net, a net grain exporter, and it has been such ever since. Thank God for that. But as a little toddler, when I lived there, uh, because of an illness that my mother suffered for about six months, every day I would be uh, farmed out to an Indian family to spend the day. My ayah, or nurse, would take my hand early in the morning and walk me down out of our apartment uh, building into the courtyard where I would see a beautiful, beautiful green tree I was a toddler. I thought it was enormous. I suppose it was probably good-sized, but it might not have been all that big. And through it, I could see the beginning of sunrise and the beautiful sky. And then we walked out of the apartment complex and down the street a number of blocks to the home where I stayed. And all along the way, I stepped over the bodies of people who had died overnight of disease and starvation. That beautiful green tree and the horrors of all of those bodies are picture memories that have stayed with me ever since. And when in my uh, middle school years, by God's grace, I was led to faith in Jesus Christ, who said that the Spirit of the Lord God was upon him to, uh, because he had anointed him to, to preach good news to the poor, and as I realized that the scripture also celebrates the beauties of God's creation and teaches us that we as human beings have a responsibility to take good care of that, to enhance its fruitfulness and its beauty and its safety to the glory of God and to the benefit of our neighbors. Eventually, as God had led me into work in economics and then especially developmental and environmental economics, I realized that that background in my very early childhood had given me some personal motivation, personal drive to address those two issues together. Uh, that led to my writing a number of different books in the field and eventually to the founding of the Cornwall Alliance for the Stewardship of Creation. Cornwall Alliance is a network, a fairly loose-knit network, of just under 70 different uh, evangelical Christian scholars. About a third are natural scientists, uh, physicists, chemists, uh, atmospheric scientists, geologists, biologists, and so on, uh, including some of the world's top climate scientists like uh, Dr. Roy Spencer and Dr. David Legates, who after his retirement from uh, teaching climatology for many years at the University of Delaware uh, last year became our director of research and development. And of course, he is spoken here and for Heartland's conferences many times. Um, about a third of our scholars are economists. Most of them specialize in either developmental economics or environmental economics. How, do, how can we apply the, 
the insights of good economics to addressing the problems of both environmental stewardship and economic development. And then the other third of our scholars are theologians, philosophers, ethicists, and ministry leaders uh, trying to, uh, to integrate the insights of the economists and the scientists into uh, an understanding of the kinds of policies particularly that lift the poor out of poverty and at the same time that care much for the earth. Um, I'm going to have just one really main point for this talk. And I might as well state it right up front. We'll get to it again in a little bit. But I want you to have this in mind. It's one that I think environmentalists desperately need to understand. Climate alarmists, climate activists desperately need to understand this. Poverty is a far greater risk than anything related to climate and weather. If you have income equivalent to, say, the bottom tenth of Americans, you can have a healthy, long life anywhere from the Arctic Circle to the Sahara Desert to the Brazilian rainforest. If you're living on the equivalent of $2 a day, you can't have a healthy, long life in the best tropical paradise. With a decent income, you can build residential and business and commercial and industrial structure that can protect you from hurricanes, tornadoes, uh, floods, droughts, and so on. If you're living on the equivalent of $2 a day, you can't do that. And this is why I so appreciate Alex Epstein's uh, reminder that it is through the wealth generated by the use of abundant, affordable, reliable, scalable, dispatchable energy from fossil fuels that we have been able in the developed world, the West, to, uh, to protect ourselves from such things. And we've even been able to extend some of that protection elsewhere so that over the last hundred years, average annual human mortality rate due to extreme weather events has fallen by more than 98%. And I think that's a wonderful thing because I celebrate human life made in the image of God. So there's the basic point, the main point of my talk. Poverty is a far greater risk than anything related to climate. And it follows from that, that if you have to sacrifice the conquest of poverty to achieve whatever your climate goals might be, you're doing the wrong thing. You're making a trade-off that has far more harms than benefits. All right. Um, my starting point is explicitly and overtly Christian. Uh, I know that there are many Christians involved in the Heartland Institute and other organizations, and, and we don't always, all of us, wear this on our sleeves. I think I want to do that. I begin with this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Now I ask you, if it was very good, should we expect that it is fragile, delicate, prone to being knocked into catastrophic conditions by relatively minor perturbations? Or should we expect that it would be robust, resilient, self-correcting? Would a good and wise architect design a building so that if someone leaned against one wall, its structural feedbacks would so magnify the stress of his weight that the building would collapse? I don't think so. Is it reasonable to think that God designed the climate system to be fragile, dominated by positive feedbacks that magnify any perturbation, leading to a runaway feedback loop with catastrophic results? I don't think so. 
Is it unreasonable to think God designed the climate system to be dominated by negative feedbacks that minimize stress from an external force, making it robust, resilient, and self-correcting? I don't think so. Uh, these climate feedbacks are analogous to a thermostat, cooling the planet when it begins to warm and warming it when it begins to cool. I think that's pretty well supported by some of the research by Dr. Lindzen and Dr. Uh, Spencer on cloud formation and how it responds to changes in temperature at the surface of the Earth. There is evidence that the Earth has warmed and cooled cyclically throughout its history, and that evidence is consistent with this view. And of course, uh, Fred Singer and Dennis Avery's unstoppable global warming every 1,500 years uh, provides much of that evidence. I also think that natural resources are gifts from God, and they're not to be refused. Uh, quick aside here, by the way, I actually probably shouldn't have put that natural resources. I should have put that raw materials Raw materials don't become resources until human beings figure out ways to use them uh, productively and to, to the service of human well-being. Uh, before we figured out how to use oil first as an energy source and then for a variety of other uses, wherever it bubbled up out of the ground, it was just kind of a, a, a nuisance uh, getting in the way. But I think that the scriptures teach us that resources or raw materials are put by, there by God for our use. In Job 28, we read, Surely there is a mine for silver and a place where they refine gold. Iron is taken from the dust and copper is smelted from rock. Man puts an end to darkness and to the farthest limit he searches out the rock and gloom and deep shadow. He sinks a shaft far from habitation, forgotten by the foot. They hang and swing to and fro from, the men, from men. The earth from it comes food and underneath it is turned up as a fire. Its rocks are the source of sapphires and its dust contains gold. Again, in Deuteronomy we read, You shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God to walk in his ways and to fear him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks, of water, of fountains and springs, flowing forth in valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of oil, olive oil and honey, a land where you will eat food without scarcity, in which you will not lack anything, a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you can dig copper and eventually lots of other minerals. When you have eaten and are satisfied, you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has given you. And it is sad to me that so much of the environmental movement, instead of blessing the Lord their God for the good minerals that he's given us out of the earth, instead curses the use of those minerals as if somehow they were a problem. But is all that he made really good? What about fossil fuel, uh, fuels or fossil fuels? Are we fools for using fossil fuels? And of course we know the worldwide protest against these things. Is all that he made really good? Well, I really appreciated again Alex Epstein's insistence that we look at benefits and side effects and we weigh the two against each other. Now, he focused primarily on the, uh, uh, the fertilization effect of added CO2 in the atmosphere. But I think when we, when we talk about the so-called so social cost of carbon, we need to remember it's not just CO2 added to the atmosphere. It's everything else we get from fossil fuels, from all that energy that we, that we generate and use. There is a near perfect correlation between fossil fuel use and life expectancy. There is a near perfect correlation between prosperity and carbon fuel use. They go hand in hand. And if you want to figure out roughly where we would be in terms of GDP per capita, uh, if we were to achieve various different goals in the reduction of carbon use, just go backward on that timeline and see where we would be. 
Life expectancy and CO2 emissions per capita go hand in hand. Conquering climate risks with energy from fossil fuels, I would argue, is a very good thing to do, precisely because poverty is a far greater risk than anything related to climate. My friend Dr. John Christie uh, was a missionary educator in Kenya for years in the 1970s. He observed firsthand the typical system of obtaining energy there. He also observed, by the way, that the lack of electricity uh, meant for uh, his students that they couldn't study at night. What? You think I would, I would burn some of our, our fuel for cooking our food in order to read my book and write my paper? I would never do that. He described the primitive energy system this way. The sources are wood and animal dung. The procurement method is gathering and carrying on the backs of women and children. The labor time is six to eight hours per day for the average sub-Saharan African woman. The use is cooking and heating on open fires. The resulting pollution is smoke causing asthma and other respiratory diseases, and the benefits hardly outweigh the costs. The modern energy system, the sources are fossil fuels, nuclear and hydro, hydro. the procurement method is industrial drilling, refining and transport and transmission lines. Labor is a few minutes per person per day for all of the energy that we use. The use, uses are heating, cooking, cooling, refrigeration, transportation, communication, medical technology, industry, commerce, recreation, everything that we do requires energy. The resulting pollution is minimal by comparison and the benefits far outweigh the costs. Back to theology and ethics, Jesus said the spirit of the Lord was upon him because he had anointed him to preach good news to the poor. When Paul, uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, in, in Job, he, Job boasts that he always took care of the poor. And Jesus says, uh, I, I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did it to me. The demand that the poor in developing countries forgo the use of abundant, reliable, affordable, scalable, dispatchable energy from fossil fuels, the source of 85% of all the world's energy, in favor of more expensive, less reliable, less abundant, less scalable, and non-dispatchable energy from wind, solar, and other renewables, means slowing, stopping, or reversing the conquest of poverty. It means trapping billions in poverty and forcing hundreds of millions back into it. But poverty is a far greater threat than anything related to climate or weather. With income, I've already discussed that, I'm going to skip over it. This is why I am convinced that the intent to, to stop the use of fossil fuels is fundamentally anti-human and fundamentally anti-Judeo-Christian, anti the biblical worldview and ethic. Thank you very much. Excellent presentations all, thank you very much. Thank you all. We now have time for questions and answers. And Cameron Schulte of the Heartland Institute is our room monitor and he'll bring a microphone around. I'll recognize you first. And then Cameron will take, every, take it on from there. Um, so please do wait for me to recognize you before you speak. Uh, Cameron will bring you the microphone. So identify yourself and ask a question directed to one or more of our panelists. If you have a follow-up question in mind, go ahead and do it if, if it's really short and sweet. But otherwise, keep it in mind, get back in the queue and let the next person ask a question so everybody gets first before anybody gets seconds. So we start here, the uh, man in the red. Hi, I'm Ron Birdie from the free state of Florida. My first question is for Vijay. Is there a role in India for nuclear? And, and the second question is for Sterling. I, my understanding is that the reason that Americans don't manufacture 
uh, rare earths anymore, don't refine them, is because it's inherently a really dirty process. And we imposed uh, environmental regulations, reasonably, and then China used a mercantilist trick, cut their prices, and basically drove American companies out of business. So what are the prospects for regaining market share if that continues to be the case? Uh, yes, uh, India is big on nuclear, and they are very ambitious. Uh, it's just that we don't have the same capital uh, like US or France to build them very quickly. But uh, we are building uh, a lot of nuclear plants. I cannot uh, remember the count exactly. Uh, but uh, my state in India has the biggest uh, current nuclear plant in India. And I'm so fortunate, we are so fortunate to have that because as I explained to you in my presentation, we lived in uh, hours of power blackout every day and it used to be brutal. Uh, given that there's nuclear and uh, more coal, we are now having a stable supply of electricity. Um, some of our biggest suppliers of uh, nuclear fuel and technology, um, Russia, Canada, but Russia has been a big supporter of uh, getting nuclear technology built in our country. Uh, so the country doesn't have anything against nuclear, it's just that the pace is quite slow, in my opinion. And uh, the more we use it, it's better. And I'm all for nuclear energy. Um, yeah, you can hear me. So I I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to disagree with you f with one of the premise of your question. Um, to start with, concerning rare earth mining in the US, we didn't ever mine rare earths directly. We produced rare earths as a byproduct of other mining. So uh, copper mine produces a lot of, uh, any mining produces a lot of, uh, you know, what some people might think of as waste material, but all that material contains something. And so we were producing some rare earths as a byproduct of copper mining through the processing, it would also produce these other minerals that we had uses for. But we've shut, off, we've shut down most of the mining in the US. It's not just rare earth mining, it's, it's copper mining, it's, you know, we're shutting down coal mining, it's gold mining, it's I any kind of uh, uh, mining is becoming, has become more and more difficult and many of the old mines became unprofitable because there was competition from abroad and because we were ever tightening environmental regulations. You may think that's a good thing or a bad thing, but you should recognize the consequences of that are we become more and more reliant on other people for essential uh, materials. Now, the second part of your question concerning China and mercantilism, they're not mercantilists. They're, they're not there uh, manipulating prices. They're actively geopolitically manipulating the use of these materials. Look, rare earths go into our very defense industries. I'm willing to say, I'm not an economist, I'm not pro, efficiency is not my God. Lowest cost is not my God. I'm for protecting America. You know, if it costs me more to produce these things here under cleaner conditions, I say we should be spending more. Americans should just have to pay more for, that, for their materials than the rest of the world. We shouldn't be getting them from China because China holds us beholden. A few years ago, uh, probably 2003, Three, a few years ago, a decade now, uh, it tells you how old I'm getting. Um, uh, China and Japan had a spat. Uh, China sent a fishing vessel into Japan's uh, territorial waters, and Japan's Navy seized it. And China says, give us back our fishing vessel. And Japan said, it's not a fishing vessel, it's a spy ship. Look at the electronics on this thing. They're, they're not out there catching... Uh, you know, uh, tuna. <laughs> they're, they're spying on us. This is this is a navy ship. So no, no, it's not a navy ship. We just have really high tech uh, fishing equipment that doesn't require nets. Uh, it's like uh, you know, it is uh, is unbelievable. It's untenable. But Japan says no, we're not going to do that. So what did China do? At at great cost to China, they're, they're, it wasn't about profit for them. It's about control, power, two different things. Everyone thinks, oh, if you've got money, you've got power. No. Politics is power. Uh, uh, you can haul Bill Gates before Congress, right? If he doesn't show up, you can, you can, you can do nasty things to him. Uh, in China, what they did was, okay, 
you will release this vessel or else. And then they didn't give them time for the or else. They showed them or else. What they did is they cut off their rare earth materials for all the electronics that are made in Japan. <laughs> they, think about all the companies that, that, that have, you know, uh, uh, South Korea has some too, but uh, Samsung, Sony, Sharp, you know, pick your electronics. Suddenly they don't have the materials for the batteries and for the uh, chips that they use. And within two weeks, Japan had turned over that, that fishing vessel because their production of, of the products that they sell overseas was cut in half. China took a hit. And then China said to the world, not just to Japan, you know, we're going to have to cut back on our uh, provision of rare earths to you guys uh, because we're going to focus more on domestic production of things, and you'll just have to buy the finished good, goods from us. Now, that's mercantilism, I agree. Uh, how do we get around that? Well, we, we, we're going to pay more if we're, if, if we're going to do it. We're going to have to mine here. We're going to end up, it's not as polluting here as it is elsewhere, but let's be clear, mining is dirty. We'll be producing some pollution. We'll have to clean it up. Labor conditions will be better here, but there'll be risk because mining is a risky endeavor. Uh, but better that than us telling the world we're holier than thou because we're green and what we're doing is ignore, ignore the environmental destruction and poverty in inducing that we're doing across the world. You know, it's, it's, the, it's the Wizard of Oz. Ignore the man behind the curtain. We're greener than thou. Don't look over here from where we're getting all our stuff that makes us greener than thou. Sterling, if we mine here, doesn't that push the prices of these things down globally, and what, what's going to happen it, it, then? Yeah, in, in the long term, in the short term, you know, the mining, mining's, mining's not cheap, right? And our, our labor conditions, our labor laws, our wages are going to be much higher. The health, health things are much higher. But just bringing new materials onto the market. That could be true elsewhere, too. Look, uh, Australia has materials. Other countries have materials, but the Greens have largely locked up you know, it's, we're not the only ones that have green, you know, environmental groups that are blocking mining. And you know where they're not blocking mining now? So we were in Afghanistan for how many years? 20 years, and we weren't producing any rare earth materials from there and, you know, giving their government revenue. Uh, we leave, and within two weeks, China's signing agreements with Afghanistan to produce rare earths, going directly to them. Uh, Geopolitically, it's madness. May I make one related point? This is about as good an illustration as you can get of the fact that uh, so much of the green message is really not about protecting the earth. Because if we mine here in North America, that mining will be done under very stringent environmental protection regulations. As they mine in, in China, Africa, most of, most of South America, it's done under, <laughs> done under little or no regulation to protect the environment. So if it were really about protecting the earth, you wouldn't see this. That suggests that there's another motive behind it. And I just want to make one last point. So I talked to you about the EV chargers, right? All of these EV chargers are now going to come from China. Let's say we get into a spat with China. Will they have a kill switch that China can... can remotely detonate so no one can charge their vehicle anywhere? Am I a conspiracy theorist for believing that's a possibility? Well, maybe. But do you really put it beyond China to do something like that? Ask the Japanese if they ever thought China would cut off their rare earths over a fishing vessel. Next question. Cameron, pick somebody. Uh, Bill Lindquist, I'm a geologist from the mining industry. I'm afraid, Sterling, I have to correct you on a couple of things. Um, the U.S. has or has had a direct rare earth operating mine here called Mountain Pass yeah, Mountain. in California. It operated for 30 or 40 years. I'm not sure it's still going. Um, also, on your conflict minerals charts, 
I have to take issue with just a couple of things. A great proportion of the world's copper is mined and refined in Chile, Peru, the United States, Canada, and Australia. So to classify copper as a conflict mineral is not quite right. And it's the same with lead and zinc, and also with nickel. Large proportion of the world's nickel is mined and refined in Canada and Australia. So I'll just leave those thoughts with you. The, the, the Mountain Pass mine was actually producing other things than rare earths. They reopened it just to do rare earths, and it has not been profitable, and it, went, it reopened and then went under again, and it may have restarted it. I don't know, but uh, <laughs> the conditions that it had to operate under were, uh, what I mean is the regulatory conditions it had to operate under made it untenable. Um, hi, I'm from Canada, and we've, uh, the Chinese are actively trying to uh, do all kinds of things. Um, it was recently revealed that uh, they were funding candidates for the Liberal Party, the Liberal government to defeat the Conservative Party. Um, uh, it, it's also, so we have done some stuff. There, there are police stations, Chinese police stations in, in Canada. Um, there are... Uh, there are all kinds of things trying to subvert the Canadian state. Um, they had bought many of our lithium mines um, uh, until recently. Uh, the government, w under extreme pressure from the Conservative Party and other people in Canada, um, has stopped that and has uh, made the Chinese companies divest. But, I mean, I'm sure they're doing the same thing in the U.S. as they are in Canada, so watch out. Any comments? Yeah, a Korea 100%, watch out. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Burnett, my question's for you. Uh, I know Heartland is active in the legislative front as I read your website that you guys are sending newsletters out to a lot of our legislators. Um, this kind of information you presented today is egregious no matter what party you belong to. To, to see child and slave labor um, is abhorrent and hard to defend. So my question is, Is uh, are you seeing any progress, uh, hopeful progress, or what kind of trends are you seeing on the legislative front in Congress? And we know the Biden administration is kind of closed off, but if Congress can pressure them to stop this trade, you know, pr these egregious trade practices, there could be some hope. Are you seeing any progress on that front legislatively in Congress? Thank you. Uh, well, let's be clear. I think we should stop it for national security reasons. I think it's just not, you know, in our, in America's best interest to be reliant upon it, not just China, any foreign country for critical minerals and materials that keep our uh, our jet fighters usable and our missile, missiles able to stay on track if we have to use them. God, God forbid we ever have to, but uh, if we do, I want them to be working. Um, we have had legislation. I, you know, I don't know how much progress will be made in the next two years under split Congress with Biden, but remember Biden signed the Uyghur Act. Trump imposed restrictions on China. Um, but what you can't get around is this. There's the window dressing. We stop a thousand uh, solar panels from coming in out of two million, right? We, well, we showed great, great resolve. Uh, we, we, we tell labor groups, it's all going to be built here, and then we waive the provisions. Right, we have the Uyghur Act. It was passed. That's the law. But it's got loopholes that you can drive uh, a Chinese made 18 wheeler through. So um, I, I don't know how much progress we'll make at the federal level for the next two years. Whether we make progress after that will maybe depend upon the administration. But I'm afraid we won't make real progress as long as we believe we need to have a green energy transition. We could end this tomorrow if we said, you know what, net zero is bunk and dangerous. We're not going to do it. 
you know, uh, 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 Trump made us to some extent energy independent. And if we go back to traditional fuels, recognizing that they have their environmental impacts as well, it's a, it's a, it's a balancing act, it's a trade-off. Uh, if we go back to those, we can, and then get some mining for the other materials that we need here, you know, we don't have to have wind turbines that, that, that have huge magnets that need cobalt from uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. We don't have to have that. And so I'm saying, it does, I don't know any administration, even under Trump, they were building wind turbines. Even under Trump, they were putting in solar panels. They just wanted them built here. Just weren't, weren't them built here. Um, as long as we have this green energy uh, demand that we must have this. We have states that impose uh, green energy mandates, renewable portfolio standards, where you ha a certain percentage of your energy has to come from green energy. We're going to be dependent upon slave and child labor. Thank you kindly. What a great presentation. Uh, Kerry Brown from St. Petersburg, attorney and smart carbon reduction. Dr. Uh, Beisner, briefly talk to you. Most of the people in this crowd, white hair. Most of the people in <laughs> churches, white hair. That's why it was so refreshing at lunch yesterday to talk to this young lady, uh, I, I believe on her own dime, intellectually curious, came down here. And it was just, but she's the exception. She's the exception. Christian Union has uh, Christian student groups at each Ivy League school, yes. Stanford and Michigan. They just hired a director of environmental Christianity or something. I have not found out where he is coming from. Does your Cornwall, do you have a speaker's bureau? Number one. Two, can people like me join it and <laughs> talk to students? And three, would you talk or one of your disciples, like maybe Dr. Happer, is he involved with you? Talk to He's a good friend. He's not part of the network, but yes, he's a very good friend. And yeah. Would someone talk to this new director if he is searching for uh, guidance uh, at Princeton. Princeton's where this headquarter, Christian Union. Uh, thank you for what Princeton, you're Princeton, New Jersey? Or Princeton, Princeton, New Jersey, right. Okay, yeah. Uh, yes, we provide speakers. Uh, we actually, you know, if you come to our website, there is a place where you can request a speaker. We have a fairly standard uh, conference, just four lectures, uh, two by Dr. David Legates, two by me, that kind of gives a, a comprehensive introduction to the whole matter, and we can take that to any church, school, college, con con conference, anywhere. Uh, we can do that. Um, and I would be delighted to speak with this uh, new director uh, of, of the Student Union on environmental issues. Uh, we certainly have a lot of literature. Uh, come to our online store, cornwallalliance.org slash shop. And uh, we have a fair amount of it on tables out here. Uh, we're one of the co-sponsors of this conference, and so we have a, uh, exhibit tables with a good bit of literature there. Uh, all of it is available for a suggested donation that can be anywhere from uh, zero to, you know, a million dollars. That would be nice. Uh, <laughs> so we can do that. It's just a matter of your, uh, your communicating with us, our communicating with you. We can, I'm sure, provide what you're looking for with the variety of different scholars we have involved. If David or I cannot do specifically what you're looking for, we almost certainly can find somebody among our, our network who can. Next question. Should be on hi. My name is Steve Schatz, I'm from Philadelphia, and thanks to all the panelists for three killer presentations. And as a result of this, I think uh, green energy should be renamed greed energy. <laughs> and um, uh, my question is specifically for VJ and your, your bu beautiful coal-produced electricity in India. How much of the coal comes domestically produced, and uh, from what countries do you import the rest of it? I think uh, we are able to produce more than 80% of coal that we need. And uh, every year the government is optimistic that they will manage to reduce the import, but every year the imports are increasing. 
and in turn the government is actually asking the mi uh, the mine sorry the plants to import uh, coal through their own networks find out where to import it from so uh, one of the key goals that government has set is for the domestic coal mines to produce all the coal needs in the country but uh, from what i've seen uh, it, it simply is not possible so i think we are importing uh, coal from all over the place like uh, south africa uh, indonesia uh, australia and a funny incident happened when there was a standoff between australia and china a couple of years ago the australian ships carrying the coal were stranded off the coast of china uh, so yeah so and india bought those coal at a cheaper rate and uh, just diver diverging from uh, coal uh, india is also buying a lot of russian oil and selling uh, oil derivatives to us so us has been buying from russia indirectly through india so uh, yeah i mean there it's a quest um, that the government has been doing interesting things one of them is to reduce environmental curbs surrounding the production of coal uh, I, i i don't know how to put it whether it's good or bad uh, but they just want the mines to produce more coal and they removed all the red tapes surrounding that and one of the uh, innovative processes is the auction of coal mines for private entities to purchase and operate the mines and that has been pretty successful as well so they are going all guns out in ensuring a uh, uh, a massive supply of both domestic and imported coal sterling and kel could you address the difference between a place like india doing mining and so forth for their own use and the implications of the west um asking for extraction in other countries uh, so what what's going on in china and the congo and so forth well um I don't begrudge China or India or anybody for uh developing. You know, I I think it's it's wrong for us in the West to tell them that they can't have what we have. Um they certainly do it under con different conditions, but, but I think uh, there are things that bother me, and one of the things that bother me the most is hypocrisy. And uh when we say that we are green and then we're offshoring our pollution from mining uh, under conditions that we know that's not a mystery uh that we know are awful and then we say oh but you know our 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 EVs are clean well clean in what sense uh There was a Dilbert there was a a Dilbert cartoon. I don't know if anyone reads Dilbert besides me. But there was a Dilbert cartoon a few years ago uh where Dilbert announces to his his pet and as far as I can tell master Dogbert um he says I'm going to buy an electric vehicle because I don't want to support the oil industry. I'll help put them out of business. And Dogbert says, "Well, oil is a, you know, an internationally traded commodity your your impact will be nothing they'll just sell the oil elsewhere and he says well i he he says it's a fungible commodity and dilbert says well but i want to make a statement and he says yes and your statement would be you don't understand what fungible means <laughs> uh you know in in environmental economics one of the key concepts is what's called the environmental transition and that is that as societies move from uh subsistence agriculture into early, early industrialization uh pollution of what we traditionally call pollutants you know, various water pollutants chemicals uh air pollutants chemicals that are directly harmful uh to human beings pollution tends to rise in those early stages but at the very same time life expectancy rises Uh, because the benefits of the polluting activity far outweigh the harms of the pollution itself and then as societies reach a variety of different levels and they change over time as technologies improve uh they they move these levels move downward and downward as societies reach a variety of different levels of economic development 
uh, they begin to address the pollution issues as well. Because now, since they're no longer worried about putting food on the table, clothes on the back, and a roof over the head, uh, and they have those, and they have some air conditioning or heating, they have good transportation and good medical care, et cetera, they start saying, you know, I don't like the way that smog burns my eyes and, and makes me cough. I'm willing to pay a little extra from our car to have a catalytic converter on it to get rid of smog. And similarly with all the other different pollutants. So the demographic transition, or the, or the, I'm sorry, the, uh, the <laughs> environmental transition, similar to the demographic transition, is a very important concept in environmental economics. Now, when we ask about mining in the U.S. versus mining in, say, Peru or in China or in India and so on, we say, okay, we'll have much higher environmental standards here than they would there. Well, yes, that's true. But that's because those countries are earlier along the curve of this environmental transition than we are. And frankly, they are going to benefit more from the direct effects of the mining than they're going to be harmed by the indirect uh, externalities of that mining. They're going to follow essentially the same pattern we did, except that they'll go through it more quickly because they get to use technologies that have already been developed rather than having to develop them as they go. So one of the things that that means is that we in the West have to be really uh, will, willing to, to put up with this reality in developing countries. You know, back in the early 90s, you remember when so many people were up in arms over uh, Nike and Adidas and various other companies using sweatshop labor in Southeast Asia, and we needed to stop all this. This is exploitative. It's terrible. It's awful. And so those companies pulled out of doing that. And guess what happened? Thousands and thousands of, of mostly women and, and young children lost their jobs in those so-called sweatshops. And guess what industry picked them up? Prostitution and pornography. Because those sweatshops were the best alternative they had. We need to keep that in mind, even even regarding child labor. You know, parents in Congo, uh, Congo probably love their children just as parents here in America do. And as much as possible, they would probably prefer that they not be working in those mines. But they're going to let it happen only insofar as they think that there's no better alternative. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I actually think that most of that child labor is not free, not liberty labor. It is, it is uh, driven by warlords and the like who couldn't care less about the actual benefit of the children. But we need to be very careful that we do not prevent other countries from going through the transition that we went through. It's the same thing as, as in uh, the use of fossil fuels to bring prosperity here. And now we're telling the developing world, you can't do that? That is hypocritical and it's oppressive. I, 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 I want to say two things about that. Um, first off, if you want to look that up, it's called the environmental Kuznets curve. It was developed by a gentleman in Kuznets. And uh, it shows that once, a, once a, a country reaches a certain level of per capita income, the spending on environmental goods goes way up. And in fact, it reaches a point where we might be spending $2 for environmental goods for every dollar rise in income when you, you reach a certain level. It, 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 it's sharp decline. The second thing I want to uh, say uh, about what Cal said is that I've often heard it said, you're right. You had to do it that way, and y'all got through it. So, but we don't have to have these poor countries go through that, because we can just provide them with the green technologies that we've developed, and they can skip all that dirty development. I, I hear it said all the time, uh, and uh, the problem with that is the green, yes, it's let them eat cake. The green technologies are more expensive. They don't work as well. Uh, Alex Epstein went through the beauties of fossil fuels. Say what you will about them. They're compact, they're reliable. People in, in sub-Saharan Africa, in small villages, don't need a hospital that only works if the weather conditions are right. 
They don't need a hospital that they can only go into labor during the daytime when the sun is shining and their battery is not compromised. Uh, no, they need that, the same kind of hospital that we've got. It's 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and that's provided by reliable energy. In no hospital I know of, no hospital I know of in the United States relies solely on green energy, and every hospital I know of has backup diesel generators for when the power goes down. So um, to say that they should get by with clean energy, even if clean energy doesn't provide the kind of um, welfare-enhancing benefits that fossil fuels do in a very short time period is morally objectionable. Thank you all for attending this panel. The next panel start at 1045. Thank you to our terrific speakers. Uh, let me welcome you all here. My name is Craig Rucker. I serve as the president of the uh, Committee for a Constructive Tomorrow. And it's my great pleasure to be able to be your host for this discussion today on advancing reliable energy. We have with us today three rock stars of sort. We have Kevin Diarotna, Carr Ingram, and Jason Hayes. And these people are going to uh, enlighten us as to their perspectives, as to how we can advance uh, uh, an agenda. I mean, it's one thing when you look at it to be critical of what the left is doing. There's a lot to be critical there of. Uh, we know what their program is. Uh, they're telling us that the future is bright if we move to a renewable, a Green New Deal, solar and wind future. Uh, of course, they, they leave out a lot of the details. And uh, we've, we've discussed a number of them. Uh, we've discussed how they're unreliable. We've discussed that um, many of the materials that are used to make these products come from parts of the world where uh, the environmental standards aren't good, the human rights standards aren't good, slave labor, child labor is often used. Uh, the environmental impacts of putting uh, these uh, wind turbines off the coast of uh, the east coast of the U.S. and its impact on whales, for example, or in eagles out in Wyoming. But we can't just be about criticizing. We also have to be about advancing. You can't replace something with nothing. And so these gentlemen are going to take a look at that and uh, give us some insight as to how we can press forward with what is a better approach to advancing reliable energy. Um, our first speaker today is... Uh, a, okay, that's not us. Uh, our first speaker today is Kevin Diarotna. Uh, this guy is absolutely amazing. I've had the privilege to be on panels with him in the past. He uh, grew up in Princeton, New Jersey, and did his undergraduate work at the University of California, Berkeley, majoring in applied mathematics with a specialty in mathematical physics. Those are the subjects I, I basically always stunk at, but. Uh, we got a bright guy here who can tell us all about that. He also holds two master's degrees from the University of Maryland in 2014. He completed his PhD in mathematical statistics at the University of Maryland. He's a prolific scholar. He's been published in numerous papers, both at the Heritage Foundation, where he currently is employed, as well in the peer-reviewed literature in statistics, economics, law, and public policy journals. His work has been referenced by the, both the Obama and the Trump administrations, as well as major media outlets, including the Wall Street Journal, the National Review, National Public Radio, and of course, Fox News, among many, many others. So it's my great pleasure to bring up to the podium, Kevin Diarotna. Thank you, Craig. Uh, thank you, uh, Jim Lakeley, James Taylor, the Heartland Institute for putting this terrific conference together. Um, I'm going to talk about advancing reliable energy uh, and a cost-benefit analysis of the concept. And this is intended to serve in parallel to the talk I gave yesterday, where I discussed a cost-benefit analysis of carbon-based regulation. Um, I don't know how many of you were there at my talk yesterday, but at the end of this talk, I'm going to juxtapose the two policies. So let me first talk about energy in and of itself. Energy is literally the basis of anything and everything we do, including enabling this very conference to operate. Um, energy is fundamentally important to society, and it is important to have cheap, reliable, and affordable energy. 
So hydraulic fracking is one opportunity to access affordable and reliable energy. So what have we heard about fracking over the years? We've heard that fracking is dangerous. We've heard that our energy supply is scarce. And we've heard that fracking will accelerate climate change. So regarding safety, there have been sadly some many highly politicized questions regarding the topic. And um, here's one example. A colleague sent this to me a few, uh, few months ago. This was making the rounds on NBER. This is titled, The Impact of Oil and Gas Extraction on Infant Health. And we're not going to spend the talk critiquing this research, um, but I'm happy to talk about it afterwards. I've taught uh, statistics at the undergraduate levels, and I could tell you, just by looking at this paper within 10 minutes, if a student cannot find out what's wrong with the modeling here, they should not pass the course. It is that serious. And sadly, though, not only does this research appear online, it actually makes it beyond the peer-reviewed process. Now, regarding deregulation in energy policy, what policy suggestions have been made? Well, here is a map uh, taken from the Institute for Energy Researchers, uh, Researchers um, North American Energy Inventory. And this is a heat map of how much oil and gas we have here in the States. The green areas are oil production, the red areas are gas production. Uh, they estimated that we have over 1.3 trillion barrels of oil and over 2.2 quadrillion cubic feet of natural gas in the North American area. And the bottom line is you don't really know how much you have until you drill. For example, in 1980, I think the estimate was around 30 billion barrels, and we uncovered nearly three times that much over the coming decades. So a key question is, what would be the economic impact? Again, we're going to do a cost-benefit analysis of accessing these vast shale oil and gas resources. What exactly would the benefits look like? I did an analogous presentation yesterday on the regulation front. So at the Heritage, Energy, at the Heritage Foundation Center for Data Analysis, we have the Heritage Energy Model. This is a clone of the Department of Energy's National Energy Modeling System. This is not some model we made in-house that the left would like to accuse us of making to cook the books. This is the government model. And we juxtapose their annual energy outlook, which is their baseline scenario, against their high resource case, a scenario that they deem to be realistic in terms of having greater access to oil and gas. And we computed the difference, the delta between the two scenarios, running these simulations independently in-house. So what did we get here? What happens economically? Like I said, this is the Heritage Energy Model, clone of the, the government's national energy modeling system, and they have a nice macroeconomic module that provides these types of economic results, including employment. Overall employment increases significantly. And the reason is very simple. You have taken the fundamental building block of society, energy, and made it more affordable by increasing the supply and providing cheaper and more reliable energy. Overall employment increases significantly. Over the next two decades, you see an average employment increase of over 1.1 million jobs. How about family income? That also increases significantly. Over the next two decades, you see average family income of over $39,000 for a family of four um, compiled for these families, which is more than enough to pay for several sem semesters of community college. So putting together the pieces economically, taking advantage of our vast shale oil and gas supply, we found that by 2040, you would see an average employment gain of nearly 1.1 million jobs, an increase in well over $39,000 for a family of four, an up to 5% reduction in household electricity expenditures, and an aggregate $3.4 trillion increase in GDP. This is in stark contrast to the carbon-based regulation that I presented yesterday, the economic impact. And again, at the end of the talk, I'm going to compare the two. So who benefits from all this? In the short term, there's employment asso directly associated with the extraction, great employment opportunities for engineers, mathematicians, data scientists, people directly associated with the extraction. But also, locally speaking, restaurants, laundromats, 
hotels, motels, and so forth. There's tremendous opportunity there. But in the long run, we've made the fundamental building block of society, energy, less expensive. And as a result, everybody prospers. But how about the climate impact? As I said in my slide earlier in the talk, there are people out there who claim that fracking will accelerate climate change. Well, you start to wonder where this alarmism comes from. And this is a plot put together by our friend Dr. John Christie of the University of Alabama Huntsville, where he juxtaposed IPCC temperature forecasts versus actual satellite and weather balloon data. The red curve is the average of 102 IPCC simulations, and the blue and green curves are actual weather balloon and satellite data. And what he attempted to do was reconstruct the actual data using the models to see how accurate they were. And you could see the gross overprediction here. So you could see that a lot of this alarmism, this doom and gloom, is you know the planet clearly has been warming, but the question is, to what degree? Pun intended. And you could see that there is a significant disparity here in the modeling. At any rate, we have at the Heritage Foundation Center for Data Analysis another climate model, the model for the assessment of greenhouse gas-induced climate change, magic with two Cs. We assume commonly accepted projections by the IPCC regarding CO2 emissions going forward, and we vary climate sensitivity according to the previously conceived one and a half to four and a half degree sensitivity range. I believe the upper bound suggested by the IPCC now is five degrees Celsius. I also ran that scenario, and that also doesn't really yield much of a difference. But we, what we did was we took the baseline CO2 emissions trajectory, and we increased CO2 emissions in accordance with what the Heritage Energy Model said is the output in terms of increased CO2 emissions from the proposed policy. And we begun that increase immediately, starting now. What happens to the climate when you increase CO2 emissions due to advanced access to shale oil and gas? Here you go. A variety of pairs of curves here under different climate sensitivities. The gray curve is the current trajectory that we are on. The blue curve is a scenario of increasing CO2 emissions as a result of expanding our shale oil and gas supply. And you can see that even under a four and a half degree Celsius uh, climate sensitivity assumption, which is again how sensitive the planet is to global warming, to, uh, excuse me, to carbon dioxide emissions, you can see that you have less than 0.1 degree Celsius temperature mitigation by the end of the century. Measly. So from a public policy perspective, we suggest that lawmakers open access to federal waters and lands and allow states to regulate fracking and enable states themselves to manage energy development. State and local officials have a much better sense of their environment than a Washington bureaucrat who may be thousands of miles away. So now let's get to the part of the talk that I was alluding to earlier, a tale of two policies. How does this compare to carbon-based regulation, the, the exact opposite policy that many officials in Washington want right now? Well, from an employment perspective, I presented the, this slide on the, the, the image on the left yesterday, the chart on the left. The Biden administration's regulatory agenda would result in a loss of 1.2 million jobs on average over the next two decades. This policy, on the other hand, will result in a gain of 1.1 million jobs. So you could see the difference. How about family income? Re-entry into the Paris Agreement under the president's agenda would result in a loss of income of over $87,000 for a family of four over the next two decades. On the other hand, increasing our vast shale oil and gas supply and the associated access would result in an increase in over $39,000 for a family of four. And this is the government's own model. Temperature impact. Completely eliminating CO2 emissions from fossil fuels completely would result in less than 0.2 degrees Celsius temperature mitigation by the end of the century. On the other hand, allowing access to our vast shale oil and gas resources would result in a temperature increase, but only of 0.1 degrees Celsius temperature increase by the end of the century. So what does this tell us? 
accessing our vast shale oil and gas supply would result in more jobs, more income, and a healthier economy. Carbon-based regulations, on the other hand, would sadly do the opposite. But neither policy would meaningfully impact the climate in any way. Thank you. Happy to take any questions. What we're going to do is hold those questions, and we'll have them all at the end, if that's OK. Um, all right. Well, thank you, Kevin, as always. Very insightful. And of course, one of the big policies that we want to advance is fracking and fossil fuel energy. And uh, obviously, the benefits far outweigh the costs. And it is one of the ways we could go to advance reliable energy. Our next speaker, Car Ingram, is a native of the Texas Panhandle. I love Amarillo. He's a magna cum laude BBA economics graduate of West Texas A&M University in Canyon, Texas. Uh, he's uh, an economist, the owner and president of Ingham Econ LLC, an economic analysis and research firm specializing in statewide, regional, and metro area economics and oil and gas energy economics. Since 2003, he has served as the consulting petroleum economist for the Texas Alliance of Energy Producers, and in November 2019 was named executive vice president of that same alliance. So, uh, Carr, come up and take it away. Thank you, Craig. Good morning, everyone. Good morning to my fellow panelists. Good morning to, uh, uh, to all of you. Apologize for being the only guy on the platform without a tie today. I sort of knew it might turn out that way, but, you know, it's Saturday. And um, I thought the pink might uh, square that up. And really all I wanted to do was look only modestly better than Ben Zyker did yesterday. And I think I managed to uh, pull that off. So I, I am an economist. Uh, uh, under no set of circumstances would I not be considered an oil and gas economist. It's what I do for a living. I work for and with a group um, that has as its members a group of people that are in the business of producing crude oil and natural gas every day. This is in the great state of Texas where we do that bigger and better than anyone else on the planet. Um, and our influence and uh, scope and that activity has grown spectacularly over just the last uh, 10 or 15 years or so. So we'll talk about some of that. Regardless of what kind of economics I do, um, I'm mostly just an economist. So even though I'm an oil and gas economist, what I am principally is a free market economist. And I am an unabashed, unapologetic free market economist with virtually no exceptions. This applies to um, to energy and oil and gas. It applies to all uh, sectors of economic activity. It applies to trade. It applies to labor economics and the minimum wage. Again, uh, there's very uh, little wiggle room um, in this uh, for me. And I'm happy to argue that point with anybody who wants to. As the great Dr. Walter Williams used to say, at this stage of the game, I'm uninsultable, really, when it comes to that sort of thing. So always happy to have that um, always happy to have that discussion. And because I hold this view, I certainly do firmly believe that markets are the key, the one and only key to abundant, affordable, and reliable energy. And in fact, that's how we manage to achieve abundant and affordable, reliable energy here in the United States and increasingly assisting in accomplishing this in other areas around the world. So take a look at these statements. I'm going to stand around here so I, well, no, I'm not either. We are vulnerable. We know we have to find another way to power the planet. How long we have is a question. It's time to get serious. That first question, who said this and when, well, okay, that's a needle in a haystack, you know, under the best of circumstances, you might not guess that. What were they talking about when they said this? What would be your first suspicion in terms of what they were talking about when they said this? Climate change, of course, except that you would be wrong about this. This is not so long ago. This is March of 2006. I was sitting in my office watching this ridiculous piece of documentary 
put out by CNN and this guy Frank says no. There are very few programs that I watch on television where my remote control does not survive that event. One is the Dallas Cowboys football game and one was this thing right here. So this had nothing to do with climate change. This had to do with a looming oil crisis, the crisis of which was we're about to run out of this stuff. And what are we going to do when we do? This centers around this theory of peak oil, um, and I'm talking about peak supply, not peak demand, which gets more attention than peak supply does these days. Based on this notion of growing global demand, yes, we certainly have that. We want to have that, exac exacerbated more by more rapid rates of development in um, high population countries around the world, declining production in the US and globally, rising prices and potentially uh, supply shocks that might cripple um, the US economy, possibly the global economy and bring our um, uh, ability to access energy to a standstill. Peak oil was a cottage industry in the 2000s. There were all manner of books and articles and um, other such things put out about uh, peak oil. This notion that um, oil production had declined here in the U.S., had peaked and begun to decline in the U.S. and elsewhere around the world and was going to do so and from now until kingdom come. That being the case, uh, we would then have an inability to meet this rising demand and this, um, uh, uh, this disparity between demand and the supply uh, implied to meet that demand would continue to push prices higher and higher. I mean, if you were around and paying attention to things then, you would have seen these forecasts for $500 uh, a, a barrel or better crude oil prices even by the end of 2010 or so gasoline prices potentially in the 12, 15, $20 a gallon range. Wars and rumors of wars. I mean, this documentary had all manner of apoc apocalyptic imagery in it about just that. The fundamental point and the most disarming point and the most frustrating point and the thing that made me throw my remote at the television was this notion that Markins can do nothing to fix this crisis, to address this crisis because higher prices in this case uh, will not, cannot result in rising production to meet this demand. Why? Because the geology simply would not permit it. There's nothing you can do. I mean, the, we're in a, the middle of a decades-long decline curve, and this is irreversible. Well, I myself did not know that um, uh, to be true or not true at the time. In fact, I probably believed it at the time. In fact, I don't really know anybody that didn't believe it at the time, including most geologists and others. They knew it was there, but it was economically um, not recoverable. And so this was the sentiment on which this kind of crazy theory was based. They sort of forget that high prices have kind of two direct concurrent functions, not just one. One is to incentivize additional supply. The other is to curb demand and try to bring those two things into line with one another. In fact, of course, it's much more complicated than that. The effects of pricing and the market pricing mechanisms in our uh, economy. Um, uh, but since prices and markets cannot stimulate additional supply, drastic measures have to be implemented to ration out what's left and kind of help bridge this gap between uh, that point in time and when these new energy solutions present themselves, the disconnect there obviously being that absent market pricing mechanisms and the working of the marketplace, these new energy solutions are not going to present themselves. Uh, which means what? That the denial of economic freedom and liberty is essential to save humanity and the U.S. in particular from this looming crisis. And these books uh, and these authors, policymakers, all manner of other people had all manner of crazy notions about what we needed to do. Everybody needs to start working from home. There will be very little travel from one place to the other. We have to start growing stuff close to where we live so it doesn't have to be transported across uh, the country. On and on and on, as if these things could even be implemented by government fiat and force over a five to 10 to 15 year period of time. So, but this is what these folks were talking about. And so this was sort of based on this right here. That's US crude oil production history uh, dating back to when we started producing crude oil in the US. 
And we peak in about 1970, and between 1970 and 2008, we had fully 50% decline in crude oil production in the United States. And so, yes, if you're looking at this curve right here, and again, this was produced in 2006 before we had the worst of this and before prices got as high as they did in 2008. But this is what this peak oil notion and the, the idea that we needed to address this in a policy sense uh, came from. Um, and so, in addition to this declining production, you also have rising prices, and this began to take hold in about 2002. Prices rise, and they rise, and they rise. And 2005, 2006, you start to see all of this kind of stuff popping up, and you start to hear economists talking about how rising energy prices are going to crater the U.S. economy, how inflationary this is, and on and on and on. And this is going to bring a recession about. Well, we had a recession in 2008 called the Great Recession. This was not caused by rising energy prices. And in fact, energy prices were tanked by, um, by the demand declines. It came along with the Great Recession. And so that's what that price decline there at the end is. So these are just nominal posted West Texas Intermediate crude oil prices rising and rising and rising, averaging about 130 bucks a barrel plus by mid-2008 before falling off in response to the Great uh, Recession, and crude oil production continuing to fall. And by the way, I mean, you can get these global numbers as well, but I do this in the United States because it's in the United States where this matters. It's where we live and work and consume energy and produce energy, and we do this in an economy that's vastly different than most other crude oil producing countries on the planet, which is to say a market economy unlike a centrally controlled um, economy, particularly with regard to crude oil production. Again, virtually every other major crude oil producing country on the planet does this in a different way um, than we do. <clears throat> U.S. crude oil production had this decline curve done what it was supposed to, and that was to continue from now till kingdom come, we would have had a production trend in the United States that looked quite a lot like that red arrow right there. But in fact, that's not at all what we had. Most of you know this by now. Crude oil production began to go north in 2008, did so spectacularly. Um, wish I had a pointer, but that kind of halfway up, that little dip down there was a nasty bloodbath of an industry downturn in 2015 and 2016, uh, sort of proudly caused by us. Um, most of our members want to blame this on OPEC, and I, I have no love for OPEC or anybody who wants to collude to uh, control markets and prices. But we slapped OPEC around pretty good in this little run-up in, um, in crude oil production in the United States. And frankly, it was growth in U.S. production that kind of overwhelmed um, global supply relative to demand and push prices downward. So that was, again, a nasty bloodbath of a downturn. But then off we go again until COVID comes along um, and we have not yet fully recovered uh, that uh, lost COVID production and we're trying to crawl our way back to that uh, as we speak. But what's unexpected, clearly what was unexpected at the time was this extraordinary, spectacular increase in U.S. domestic crude oil uh, production. Uh, so we go from about 5 million barrels a day, um, you know, roughly around that 2008 time frame, to uh, right at 13 million barrels a day in the latter part of 2019. Production then peaked and began to fall off just a little bit, and then come COVID in April, May of 2020, uh, fell off spectacularly and again trying to come back now. This was, of course, the U.S. shale revolution, the U.S. energy renaissance, whatever you want to call it. And this was brought about by these things that Kevin mentioned, this fracking, this fracking word, the new F word in America for whatever set of reasons. Um, uh, but this is horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing. These are the advancing technologies that made this shale revolution uh, possible. So this was first applied to natural gas production in Texas in a place called the Barnett Shale. Uh, and we cracked that open in terms of natural gas supplies in the earlier part of the decade. And then this began to take hold in a new production region called the Eagleford. Uh, most of us uh, think that's two words. I mean, it looks like two words, Eagleford, but we in Texas just call it Eagleford. Uh, so we cracked this up. There was scarcely a barrel of oil produced in the Eagleford before 2008, and it just exploded onto the scene along with the Bakken. And meanwhile, the Permian's just sitting over here percolating a little bit. It's 
um, it's revving up for what's about to come next, and then the Permian really flexes its muscle uh, in terms of applying these production techniques to uh, crude oil. This is a uniquely American uh, thing that happened, the shale revolution, the deployment, uh, the development and deployment of these production techniques that allowed these production increases to occur. And they were, by the way, the full result, just fully the result of a freely functioning market with the unfettered movement of prices driving the things that happened along the way. These crude oil prices that increased rapidly from 2002 to 2008, in fact, crude oil and gasoline prices both set new records during that period of time. Consumers and the politicians who represent them were blaming oil companies. They do this every minute of every day for every ill that's out there but blaming oil companies for profiteering on the backs of working Americans. You've heard all this before. In fact, these crude oil price increases were setting the stage um, for what came several years later, and that is these extraordinary increases in crude oil production that then began to mit mitigate prices to consumers. Um, which means what? It means that markets are always at work on our behalf, whether we know this at the time or not. So again, this explosion of U.S. domestic crude oil production was utterly unforeseen, and yet we have been the great beneficiary of this. Well, it's the great state of Texas. I mean, um, national crude oil production increased by about 2.75 times um, from 2008 to late 2019. Texas crude oil production quintupled over that, more than quintupled over that period of time from around a million barrels a day to about 5.4 million barrels a day in March of 2020. Then we had the COVID uh, fall off. That last little downward spike to the right is winter storm Uri in the month of February 2021 from which we recovered. But again, we're still trying to claw our way back statewide Texas to pre-COVID levels of production and that March 2020 record. We are gonna set a new crude oil production annual record in the United States in 2023. We won't get back to daily uh, production records until late 2024, believe it or not. But, and in Texas, we will set a new annual production record in 2023 as well. Permian Basin though, my goodness, look at what's happening here. Um, extraordinary growth in production. This is, of course, what's driving Texas growth in crude oil production. Uh, so we have this increase all the way up until uh, the COVID declines of 2020, um, and then kind of recovery, then this drop off in February 2021 the, uh, uh, for the winter storm. The Permian was hit hard by that storm. But then, boom, off we go. The Permian uh, producing, uh, by the way, the Permian crossed over into Mexico, most of you know. So this is total Permian Basin uh, producing actually more than the state of Texas does as a whole uh, right now um, and producing at record levels and climbing. I, I tend to sort of get nat give natural gas a little bit of short shrift in these things, although I don't intend to because it's so extraordinarily important in what we do in the U.S., particularly in terms of power generation, food production, other such things. We have, um, we, we've been at record levels for U.S. natural gas production for some time. We're back at them now. COVID losses have been recovered. Um, and in Texas, we are producing at record levels um, as well. Here's a strange phenomenon, just so you're aware of it. Gas sort of comes in two forms, not two physical forms, but from uh, kind of two, um, two elements of production. You can drill a natural gas well and produce natural gas. You can drill a crude oil well and produce a lot of natural gas. So we call this associated gas, and it's accidental, it's unintentional. In the state of Texas, 40% of all Texas natural gas production is accidental. It comes off of wells that were drilled to produce crude oil. In the Permian, that number is 60% plus. I mean, it's just extraordinary. This is the reason we're awash in that stuff and natural gas prices are low is because we're not producing to a market. We're drilling into a crude oil market and saturating the thing with, uh, with natural gas. <clears throat> so what did this shale revolution do? It transformed the, the United States. It's uh, kind of dying, what was thought to be a dying petroleum industry, a slow death over the coming few decades to the world's largest producing country, surpassing Russia 
and Saudi Arabia, where we sit still today. Imports plummet. This is what policymakers told us they always desired, right? Greater volumes of our domestic energy needs actually produced domestically, so we don't have to access them overseas, and we're not subject to all the things that come along with that. So our American consumers over this period of time were or have been shielded from geopolitical and other shocks to crude oil supplies, American manufacturing reshored to supply exploding domestic E&P activity, all the things that Kevin talked about, about economy-wide benefits in terms of employment and household income and all of these things. And then, of course, in this period of time, U.S. producers managed to accomplish what policymakers said they always wanted a long-term, abundant, affordable supply of energy literally for decades to come. Well, I do this little piece of work for the Alliance called the Texas Petro Index, and this is really just a business cycle analysis of the upstream or exploration production segment of the oil and gas industry in Texas. So to me, a cycle, a business cycle, is a period of growth followed by a peak and then a period of decline. With a trough, that'd be one cycle. So I see one, two, three, four, five, now a six cycle in the making. Man, if you were gonna ride a roller coaster, you couldn't get much more of a thrill than one that looked quite a lot like that. And so this is what the industry goes through. And on, on occasion, it's what it takes the Texas economy through, and certainly the regional economies where that industry is, is prevalent. What's noticeable, though, is even though we've had record amounts of crude oil and natural gas production, um, we're, 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 uh, this petrol index, I mean, this, and this is real, it's inflation adjusted and all of these things. Um, that petrol index is nowhere near uh, its one-time peak. Um, these are nominal prices for crude oil. These are real prices for crude oil. I mean, if you just take prior prices and restate them in today dollar terms, that June 2008 price becomes about 180 bucks a barrel rather than 130 bucks a barrel. And so that's what the real impact of that was at the time. The rig count, again, nowhere close to where it has been in 2014 and then, uh, pardon me, 2008 and then 2014 leading into the downturn of 2015. And you can see COVID and all of this. Upstream employment, same thing. We peak out in terms of direct upstream employment, exploration, production of oil, uh, oil and gas employment in Texas and 2014, we're nowhere there. This now probably never will be again. What does this mean? I mean, how are we doing this? Record volumes of production for crude oil and natural gas without record rig counts, without record employment, without record prices, without record drilling permits, without record everything else. There's extraordinary increases in productivity. That's what. This is just a silly little calculation that I do every month, and I take the number of employees and divide it into the production volume to get, at least in theory, the number of barrels that one direct upstream employee can uh, produce. That number went from something under 200 bucks a barrel uh, in the 2009-ish time frame up to uh, 900 plus bucks a barrel. And then these drop off in COVID uh, has kind of affected this. There's reason to believe that productivity may fall off uh, because we've kind of gotten the stuff that's easy to get now, but we've been saying such things for years. I'd kind of like to see what the future holds and what technology brings us and what markets bring us. So this is Texas share of global production, pardon me, U.S. production along with the Permian. The Permian, again, actually uh, uh, has overtaken the state of Texas when you include the New Mexico portion of the Permian in terms of its share of U.S. energy production. So this shale revolution before and after. First of all, before the shale revolution. Oil and gas, and crude oil in particular, will be increasingly unable to meet our growing and domestic, um, growing uh, domestic and global demand. We're running out of the stuff, and we're not going to be able to grow production in the future to meet that growing demand. As a result, prices will rise. These companies will reap um, ever insane uh, uh, greater profits while consumers suffer and energy becomes increasingly unavailable and unaffordable. Markets, of course, will not solve this problem. Government has to step in and save the day by interrupting natural market outcomes. After the shale revolution, where we did, I say we, I've never produced a barrel or an MCF of anything in my life, but people that do, 
This is what they did. Rising production and consumption of petroleum products, both crude oil and natural gas, are pushing atmospheric levels of CO2 ever higher, and methane as well. The very future of the planet is imperiled as a result, and again, markets will not solve this problem. Governments have to step in and save the day by, um, uh, by interrupting these natural market outcomes. I'm gonna hustle on through these because I got like two minutes left. If you're uh, a non-economist, you've probably heard this term, this thing, externalities. It's sort of a widely accepted economic concept, and it just means things that, um, that happen in the production or consumption process that are not priced into the marketplace. So the textbook example of this, if you went to economic school for a day and a half, is pollution. And so this is now, of course, um, uh, climate change is an externality of crude oil, uh, fossil fuel consumption and production. Um, and these negative consequences to, to society are not captured in the price of petroleum products. And so we've got to make these things more expensive to make that happen, carbon tax, what have you. And of course, a negative externality causing activity has to be regulated heavily and perhaps even eliminated. So uh, as uh, we've had some discussion about this, uh, the positive externalities are most often ignored. Um, they certainly want to ignore them at the policy level, um, the social cost of carbon calculations, we heard something about this yesterday. And so these externalities are the use of a widely accepted concept in economics as a platform for all manner of economic mischief. Well, here's the problem with that. If the market does not set the price and drive production and consumption, who does? Who does? Flawed human beings and political and regulatory institutions, that's who. We've seen a few economists quoted in this conference. This is my favorite. The great Friedrich um, Hayek, the curious task of economics is to demonstrate to men how little they know about what they imagine they can design. Hayek pointed to this thing called the knowledge problem. The knowledge problem being that you don't have it. You don't have it, you can't have it. No person can have it, no small group of people can have it. Our economy is too complex and intricate. There are things happening out there that you don't know about and never will. The beauty of market capitalism and our freely functioning price system. Economic decision-making power is broadly diffused across the economy and its economic actors. Producers and consumers, households and businesses, the danger of centrally planned economies and socialism, that economic decision-making power is yanked out of your hands and concentrated in the power in the hands of an elite few. The best case scenario, well-intentioned planners are going to get it wrong every time because they have the knowledge problem. The worst case scenario, which we're, I think, witnessing now, or at least we're on our way to it, this loss of economic freedom and individual liberty, heavy-handed management of the economy leading to government's involvement in your everyday economic life. And this is tyranny, plain and simple, cloaked in some sort of false nobility about saving the planet. I'm pretty sure I was the first person I, to call the Green New Deal the Green Raw Deal. I think Jason Isaac, if he were in here, could attest to this. Um, I think the climate change agenda is also uncomfortably aligned with an anti-American, anti-capitalist sentiment. The path forward, at least in my mind, and again, try to argue this point with me, I'm happy to have this discussion. All of those things right there. Again, I'm running out of time here. <clears throat> energy transition, I hate that term now because all it means now is a forced energy transition, not a market-driven transition. Net zero, I don't even know what that means, but it just means weird behavior by firms in an attempt to reach this bizarre metric. All of the above, I hate that term. I don't mind all of the above energy, but the way we mean all of the above is we have to heavily subsidize and incentivize renewables and let uh, fossil fuels kind of fill in the gap until they have to go away. The energy transition, only markets, only markets, only markets. Economics is increasingly, particularly upper level academic economics these days, numbers, econometrics, and data. We have to have a philosophical return to this. Adam Smith himself was a philosopher, not an economist to begin with. What kind of an economy, what kind of country and economy do you want to live in and work in, capitalistic or socialistic? And do you trust capitalism and markets and the price system to solve our problems for you, or do you not? And if you don't, do you trust that guy over there to do it? I do not. Advancing reliable energy, that's the name of this panel. Reliable energy is thermal. 
period, conversion of energy in its raw useless form to a useful form, crude oil, natural gas, coal, and nuclear. Let markets work, period. Cars climate policy do nothing, do absolutely nothing. Get out of the way. These are dangerous concepts for the U.S. economy and its energy mix. So we've had quotes from Friedman, we've had quotes from Hayek, we've had quotes from Thomas Sowell. Here's a quote from Carr. The foundational laws and principles of economics and physics, threw that one in for Dr. Happer, are not altered or suspended simply because we're talking about a subject about which you happen to feel strongly about. I'm just afraid that's not the case. These things continue to do what they do, whether you like it or not. Thank you so much for your time and attention. <laughs> Thank you, Carr. That was outstanding, as uh, was Kevin's. I um, think we're seeing a theme here as we're advancing reliable energy. Our first spoke, uh, it's going to be based a lot on fossil fuels, and uh, it has to be free market in orientation. Those are the principles or well, how we need to advance free market and, uh, you know, sound energy policy. I'll tell you, I, I, I think that peak oil thing, I remember that vividly, uh, is still alive and well at the UN. I just came back from the uh, COP, uh, I think it was 27, yeah, in Egypt, and they're still afraid of it. And uh, if you saw, uh, what's his name, Planet of the Humans by, uh, right. um, what's his name, the uh, Michael Moore, right. uh, much of the theme of that movie is we're unfortunately relying on fossil fuels that are not only causing climate change, but we're going to run out of them. And of course, uh, our answer to that is that free markets, when the price goes up, we'll find the solution to get us out of that. Well, our next uh, commentator, I guess you came from Texas, Car Amarillo. This guy, I, I'm, you're a Canadian, right? Dual citizen. Dual citizen. Okay. All right. We'll let you up on stage then. Um, Jason uh, Hayes. Now, he holds a Master's of Environmental Science degree from the University of Calgary and a Bachelor of Science in Natural Resource Conservation from the University of British Columbia and a Technical Diploma in Renewable Resource Management from Selkirk College. He has focused on an energy and environmental policy for three decades, actually worked as a backcountry ranger and forester in British Columbia. That's impressive. And uh, he co-authored research on national parks policy and grizzly bear management for Canada's Fraser Institute. Today, he's the director of environmental policy at the Mackinac Center for Public Policy Research in Midland, Michigan, where he tackles issues such as electricity regulation, energy policy, forest and wildlife management, and environmental policy at both the federal, well, at all, the federal, state, and local level. So Jason, take it away. All right, thank you, Craig, and thank you to everyone in the audience and to Jim and James for inviting me to speak. And the, the tech diploma part I did just in case the idea of thinking big thoughts didn't work out. I knew how to like lay a road and stuff like that, go out and run the chainsaw. So where Kevin and Carr looked more at um, oil and gas production in that, I'm going to look more at the utility industry and how it impacts us. And so I'll focus on this idea of seven principles of sound energy policy, which is a publication that I put together for the Mackinac Center, and how can we use these seven principles to advance energy reliability. Our first principle is that energy is an essential aspect of human flourishing. You would have heard this if you heard Alex speak last night. And the idea with that is that abundant, affordable, reliable energy has a direct link to your quality of life. If you have access to abundant, affordable, reliable electricity, you tend to live a much better life. You tend to be economically prosperous. And while I'm sure people in this room understand it, a lot of the time when I use this slide, people kind of like, mm, what do you mean? having abundant, affordable, reliable electricity actually helps improve your environmental health. So the previous speakers, uh, Sterling was talking about the environmental Kuznets curve. Wealthy people tend to take care of their environment because they're not worried about going hand to mouth. If you're worried about what your kid is gonna eat tonight, or if they can eat tonight, 
or if they're going to freeze to death, you're not as concerned about preserving the tree outside in your backyard. You're more likely to cut it down. So when you have abundant, affordable, reliable energy, all three of those tend to be met. Now, there's some confusion about how energy gets used. This fellow doesn't understand that even public transit uses oil, whether it's using it to power the buses or to make the plastics in the seat or whatever, that confusion tends to, to reign. So one way to make it a little bit more simple for people is to look at the Korean Peninsula. No more obvious disparate impacts between having open free market access to abundant, affordable, reliable energy and then on the other side, limiting that access. So if you look, when the sun goes down over the Korean Peninsula, Pyongyang, the capital city, is pretty much the only place in the country that has lights on. Compare that to South Korea, one of the most technologically and advanced countries on the planet, one of the most wealthy countries on the planet. So we know that energy is essential, and if we continue this idea of what is it like to live in North Korea, around the planet, people in developing nations, about, we've heard this again yesterday, over a billion people lack access to electricity at all. They don't have it. About three billion people rely on solid biomass, plant material, firewood, or dried dung to heat their homes and cook their food. As again, Alex noted last night, those three billion people across the planet use about as much electricity every day as an average American refrigerator. So, in North America, in Europe, we have access to this abundant, reliable, affordable electricity. But what we're doing with our decarbonization and our net zero push is we're tending to close down the sources that give us that abundant, reliable, affordable electricity. And as a result, what we're seeing is that reliability is going down while prices are going up. And Jim Robb, the CEO of the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, explained this in a, an interview last year where he said the disorderly retirement of generation facilities is happening too quickly. And so what we're doing is the the utility industry should be focused on three primary things. One is affordability, uh, another is reliability, and the third one is environmental impact. That's what you should be focusing on. But we, he said, we tend to get in trouble when we overemphasize one of those things. We're overemphasizing environmental impact. And the problem with that is when we leave off affordability and reliability, we tend to start experiencing these blackouts. And the world is becoming so much more uh, reliant on electricity that even a few moments, pardon me, without electricity is a real problem for people. And that leads us to this next principle, which is that all sources of energy have an environmental impact because we're told by people like Jim Robb and the big utility CEOs that we're focusing on environmental issues, right? We wanna lower environmental impact. So in Michigan, Consumers Energy is making that claim. They're focused on helping the environment. So they're putting in place these new programs. They're building solar and wind and they're doing a thing like, it's called the Summer Peak Rate Program where because of our reliance on wind and solar more and more, we're starting to see that we can't trust the system the same way we used to. So what they did was they said they want to get people to reduce energy use from 2 to 7 p.m. on weekdays from June 1st to September 30th. So during Michigan's peak uh, demand times, so for those of us that live in Michigan, what that means is during those times, 2 to 7 p.m., June through September, we pay 150% the electricity rate. To make it simple, if our electricity rate had been 10 cents, during summer peak rate, we pay 15 cents. So that's the, the plan, but remember, we're doing it to protect the environment. DTE, one of our other big utilities, is doing the same thing. They just are implementing their summer peak rate program, which puts electricity during the peak program at over 22 cents a kilowatt hour. So we're paying California rates for our peak programs in the state of Michigan. But remember, we're doing it to protect the environment. 
Okay, so Siddharth Kara just published this book, Cobalt Red, which takes a look at some of the issues associated with protecting the environment using renewable energy and battery backups, going to EVs and that sort of thing. And what actually is happening is while we get to live comfortable green lives, healthy lives in North America, we're offshoring the environmental impacts of those choices to people in places like the Congo. We have four to seven, 10 year old kids going down into the mines to mine cobalt so that we can build utility scale um, battery backup for our wind and solar. But remember, we're doing it to protect the environment when we should be remembering that all forms of energy have an impact. Same sort of thing happening in China in the region around Batao, China. If you Google that, you'll get these pictures. China's environmental regulations are much less strict than North America's. So China also refines over 60, 70% of the world's supply of rare earth minerals. The thing about it being refined in China is because they're environmental regulations, they're allowed to literally dump the toxic waste from refineries onto the ground, create uh, human caused lakes that you can see from the, the space, just basically a toxic boiling mass of muck that used to be farmland, but we're doing it to protect the environment, right? Okay, same sort of thing. It's not only environmental impacts. The Chinese solar industry produces 45% of the world polysilicon from one region, the Xinjiang region in China. Even the New York Times recognizes that the Chinese government in its plan to implement what they're called work training programs for over two, almost three million Uyghurs and Kazakhs in this Xinjiang region. They literally are enslaving the people. It's called forced labor, more euphemistically, and forcing them, training them to create solar panels and solar uh, arrays that, that we buy and then uh, develop and put up in, in America. And so where we're putting those solar arrays is in places like California, where companies have been given free reign to literally go in and, and cut down and shred five to 600 year old Joshua trees and, and yucca plants. So these areas that are being considered threatened and endangered uh, they're actually going in and getting approvals to cut and just shred them to build solar panels. So the work of people like Michael Schellenberger have discussed this. We're building these solar panels. Not only are we cutting down 600-year-old Joshua trees, we're building solar panels that at the end of their life cycle produce 300 times more waste than we would have produced if we had just used nuclear. We're not done. There's more coming from wind turbines. People say, okay, well, if we can't use solar, how about we use wind? Okay, well, there's huge impacts, literally millions of birds, avian species, especially large raptors and bootios, are being literally hacked to death uh, by these large wind turbines. Department of Justice went after ESI Solar last year and they, it's a wholly owned subsidiary of Next Era Energy. They found, and ESI acknowledged, that their wind program had killed at least 150 bald and golden eagles over the past decade. 136 of those deaths affirmatively determined to be attributable to the eagle being struck by a wind turbine blade. So if you even went under an eagle nest and picked up a feather, you would face felony charges. Time in jail, tens of thousands in fines, but the wind industry gets what's called a permit to take. If there's any hunters out there, every time you buy a hunting license, you get a permit to take. The wind industry is allowed to do the same. And when we're finished cutting up the eagles and not only eagles, also bats and myota species and insects and all that sort of thing, then what do we do with the wind turbine blades? We landfill them, right? Because 
the economics of wind does not yet allow us to recycle them. Technology doesn't either, but there's no money to be made in wind if we have to actually pay to recycle the wind turbine blades, so we bury them. That picture is of a few hundred wind turbine blades being buried in a Wyoming landfill. We've been building thousands of these wind turbines every year since 2005 and even before that. And then has already been discussed several times. I see Dave and the Dave Stevenson in the audience. He's, he's dealing with this. If you want to actually find out about the damage being done by offshore wind to endangered right whale species and, and that sort of thing, we're doing the same thing. So the folks at Doomberg wrote an article recently on their substack, There She Blows. They correctly noted that when it comes to the so-called green energy transition, there is no solutions, there's only trade-offs. So when we're considering this, protecting the environment, are we actually protecting the environment or are we making a bad trade here? That takes us to the next aspect, the next principle, and we gotta remember this because the trade that we're making involves a huge scale. So in energy production, scale is king. Just in the US, there's 310 million of us using more electricity. Like, I mean, again, the people that live, the three billion people around the planet use as much electricity as one of our refrigerators. So how much more are we using? Scale in this issue is huge. So I take a picture of the Palisades nuclear plant, which is near Holland, Michigan. It was shut down last year. So we closed a nuclear plant, which is zero emission technology technology, right? If we were going to replace that plant with wind turbines in Michigan, we would need to rebuild Michigan's entire wind fleet just to provide the capacity that that one plant provides. Not the service, remind you, because the wind doesn't blow 24-7, whereas a nuclear plant does run 24-7 for 18 months before it needs to be refueled. So just the capacity we would need to replace our entire or rebuild our entire wind system. And if we're looking at solar, this is just one proposed solar uh, development in the state of Michigan, which is in southeast of, uh, of Detroit. They were gonna put in several hundred thousand solar arrays, and it was gonna cover 1,200 to 1,600 hectare, or hectares, that's my Canadian showing through, 1,600 acres uh, of some of the state's most productive farmland. And so when I show this picture to other audiences, I say, but so what? It's not like we use that to grow our food or anything, right? <laughs> Takes me to the next point. We're replacing our reliable, affordable systems with unreliable, expensive systems. But for energy to be effective, it has to be reliable. Again, I show you the picture of the Palisades plant. That one plant before it was shut down, in 2021, it produced more electricity than all of Michigan's wind and solar put together. One nuclear plant. Which is why I wrote this article for the Wall Street Journal explaining why blackouts are coming to the state. When you rely on wind and solar, you come up against situations like this, which euphemistically have been called in Europe, wind droughts. This is a, a load graph for the Bonneville Power Administration in the state of Washington. So from October 3 to October 10 last year, wind production is the green line. And people may think, well, you know, that's one time, right? Nope. 2019, October 30 to November 6. It's a feature of the system, not a flaw. When you rely on wind and solar, you will go dark. This is what's happening over and over again in California. It's becoming habitual. But when I say that sort of thing, oftentimes people go, yeah, but so what? It's a first world problem, right? You guys didn't get to charge your iPhone Okay, you didn't get that real thick, sexy foam on your cappuccino. This is a first world problem, right? Wrong. For some people, it's a matter of life and death. So a fellow named Robert Martis, 
lived in California, was uh, oxygen dependent, had copti and emphysema. When PG&E shut off the power in 2019 to his house, he did not have time to get to his battery backup oxygen generator, literally suffocated. It's not a first world problem, it's life and death. Same thing happened in Texas, that I described in uh, an article in USA Today. Little Christian Pinedas, 11-year-old kid, died of hypothermia in his home, sleeping in bed beside his four-year-old brother. It's not just a first world problem, it's life and death. We get the same warnings again. I come back to NERC and I talk about NERC is constantly producing their summer resource adequacy assessment, their energy risk analysis. They do for winter as well. They said that the mid-continent independent system operator, which is Michigan's located in there, it's the red strip that runs right down the middle of the country. We face a capacity shortfall in its north and central areas. We're at high risk of energy emergencies during peak summer conditions. So we've been working on making this transition and changing things for years. We've been trying to do this for a while. It takes time to turn around a big ship like this. Like I said, 300 million people using a lot of electricity. It's not easy to do. Some of these plants, you know, 60, 80 year life cycles, just getting the permits for a new uh, transmission line can take five, seven, ten years just to get the permits before you even set a shovel in the ground. So despite all our work, despite our efforts to date, wind and solar still only make up four and a half percent of our total primary energy consumption in 2021. That'll make a, a big difference here when I talk about subsidies. Looking ahead, our utilities in Michigan are making fantastically optimistic assumptions that they, over the next 20 years, can get rid of natural gas, coal, and nuclear, and go primarily to renewables. 63% is what consumers' energy is suggesting that by 2040 they're going to make it. Fantastically optimistic, but yet it's still 20 years out. These things take time. DTE is making the same sort of predictions. They're going to go from 45% coal to no coal, 62% renewables in 20 years. Again, fantastically optimistic, but it's still going to take 20 years. And the issue that comes up when we start talking about this again is what are we replacing it with? Because the systems that we're trying to replace it with are not the affordable ones. We're shutting down the affordable reliable and going to expensive and unreliable. So Michael Schellenberger explained this in Forbes a couple years ago and said it's the unreliable nature of wind and solar that makes their energy more expensive. And we're seeing these things start to hit in Michigan. So Michigan electricity rates, 17.5 cents per kilowatt hour. We're 37% higher than Ohio immediately to the south. 28% higher than the national average. But yet, our Public Service Commission just keeps approving rates and uh, rate increases. And when they're focused on switching, transitioning the system instead of maintaining it, this is what happens. Um, just this past week, we had the ice storm come through. 700,000 homes in Michigan lost power. Compare that to Illinois, where they are paying attention to maintaining their lines. 12,000 customer outages. Wisconsin, Indiana, and Ohio together had less than 3,000 outages. Minnesota, which had as much or more snow than Michigan did, had a total of nine outages. That was the map showing the outages in southern Michigan. So this is what we're dealing with. Our final principle is that energy subsidies harm more than they help. When you subsidize the production of these types of energy, you get them built in the wrong areas, incentives matter, right? So we have two economists, they could tell me, Econ 101, incentives matter, right? Yeah, so really, although I can make arguments against it, if you want to build wind, it makes sense to build it in the areas that have purple, red, and blue. Michigan does not, but yet we're building it there. Same thing with solar, if you're gonna build solar, 
Does not make sense to build it in Michigan, but that's what we're doing. It has the fourth worst horizontal solar irradiance levels in the country in the lower 48, but we're building it. Jason Isaac will recognize this if he's still here. Um, from 2010 to 2019, solar and wind got $70 billion of federal help. So 4.5% of our electricity supply or our energy supply gets more than 90% in terms of federal aid. And so when I give this presentation, one of the funny things, the responses to it was this comment from the audience when I gave the presentation, I was depressing. Okay, I don't want you to get depressed, I'm not Greta, I don't want you to panic. I want you to not get overwhelmed. I want you to keep up the pressure, everybody in this room to the people that are watching online, keep providing policymakers, the media and the public with the balancing information that they need to make good decisions. I quoted this uh, on the first night in one of the questions. James Schlesinger, who was the Secretary of Energy in 1977, said this, when speaking of energy for the United States, we have only two modes, complacency and panic. We're still living in complacent times because of the in infrastructure, the investment that was done from 1940 through to about 2000. We're just now starting to see the impacts of closing down the reliable, affordable stuff and going to the unreliable, expensive. So we're getting close to the panic part. But the work that we're doing is having an impact. Across the country, people are pushing back and saying, look, we do not want this stuff anymore. We know it doesn't work. We know it's too expensive. We know it impacts on our view shed and all of the reasons that they give. There's a big backlash. We need you out there to keep that up. Our work should promote policies that stop subsidizing all forms of energy and then retain existing plants for their full life cycle. Push for that. Then build natural gas and legalize nuclear. It's basically impossible right now to build coal, but at least gas and nuclear can provide the reliable, affordable energy that we all need. Continue the research on small modular reactors and fusion. Those are decades off, but it's possible to do. And for those that want to download Seven Principles, get your phone out fast before Craig shuts me off. That's the QR code to download that. So thank you. Well, thank you, Jason. That was good. Even, as a, even for a Canadian, that was well done. Uh, this is the part of the um, session where we're going to open it up for questions from the audience, and uh, I think Ben has a question right away. Is that right? <laughs> so anyway, um, we have a guy with a microphone. I'll tell you what we'll do real quick, and David Stevenson. Um, okay, there we go. Ben, why don't you lead us off? Yeah, thank you. Um, just to, can I hold this? All right, very good. Uh, just a very quick observation, one for Kev and one for Carr. Uh, Kevin, I, I would urge you to make a slight revision of your slides and de-emphasize the employment argument. Um, employment is a cost, not a benefit of uh, the exploitation of national wealth represented by uh, increased access to fossil fuels. Uh, the wage effect is something that's really much more important than you had that and yeah. family income, uh, but employment is like saying that if we use more high-quality steel, we're better off. No, we're not. Well, I think the, the point is to juxtapose it against the carbon-based regulation, and that policy destroyed employment significantly. So the point is to have an apples-to-apples comparison. It destroys compared. national wealth, which Correct. destroys incomes. I, I, I really would de -emphasize. With respect to uh, CAR, um, the insulation argument, uh, I think, is probably not correct. Um, the argument if we produce more oil here, we will be insulated from the effect of supply disruptions overseas, uh, abstracting from exchange rate effects and transportation costs and all that. It's a world market, there's one world market price, and nations that import all of their oil face the same prices and changes as nations that import none of their oil. And I think that the insulation argument is something you really ought not to emphasize. In your, in your talk, and that's it, thank you. 
Yeah. Thanks, Ben. Um, yeah, I, I took note of a couple of occurrences, I think, from a non-economist consumer standpoint that would, um, they might have a greater sense that they were more insulated from this somehow or other. Um, I forget the first one. It happened in, uh, I think, the early part of 2014. I'll have to go back and see what that was. And the other one was, you're not wrong about this. It's really the the global increase in crude oil production volumes. But to the extent that the United States had a great lot to do with this, and the extent, and the, the U.S. certainly did, uh, in terms of uh, being the chief offender and raising global crude oil production volumes over that period of time, 2010 to 2014 and then beyond. Um, the, 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 the other was this attack on the Saudi production facilities that sidelined about 5% of the world's uh, crude oil output um, uh, several years back that was just a sniffle of a market event. Uh, and the 2014 event, again, I'll have to go back and remind myself as to what that was was the same thing. I was expecting something much worse than that in terms of price impacts. And so that's all I'm referring to. Yes, uh, crude oil production and pricing is set globally, not domestically. So I, I get the point. Um, uh, but because of increases globally that were driven by increases in the United States led by Texas, uh, consumers most certainly were shielded from some of these shock sorts of events. So that uh, maybe to clarify that, that that's kind of where I was coming from on that. All right, we have another question up here. Yeah. Uh, Hal Mattis, uh, Durham, North Carolina. Uh, all three speakers were great. I really appreciated everything you had to say, but the question that I have is for uh, Kerr. Um, you very specifically say unfettered free markets, but what we're finding out now that the CCP and Gates have bought up huge swaths of farmland, that is a free market at work. What do we need to do about that? Well, so two observations there. What I typically get from the oil guys, I mean, our members and others, is that, well, you know, the Saudis don't engage in market sorts of activity. All of our trading partners, none of them engage in uh, market activity. Um, I, uh, if, let's say I own a piece of land uh, somewhere and uh, Bill Gates comes and offers me some ridiculous amount of money for this land. Better yet, let's say you own a big swath of land somewhere and Bill Gates comes and throws a big uh, chunk of money at you for this swath of land. Are you going to say no to this? Are you? I'm not likely to. So, so I don't know uh, under what sort of so, set of circumstances do I have the right to tell you that you can't engage in a transaction to sell a piece of property that you own for vastly more than it's worth um, because the worth of something is what you agree to sell it for and what he agrees to buy it for. So again, I don't know that I would deny you this opportunity. In terms of the Chinese, we have a member, I won't say their name, they're a great member um, they, it was, it's run by some guys that sort of spun off from Conoco Phillips. Man, these guys know how to produce crude oil and natural gas in Texas. This is a Chinese owned firm. Um, and, um, and in terms of them buying up land around, I don't know too much about that. So, uh, economists like to act like they're experts on things that they're not. And I'm going to try to avoid that, um, um, that practice today. So I don't know anything about, I don't know much about Chinese buying up farmland. Uh, what I do know um, is that <clears throat> whatever, let's say, this Chinese-owned company does in terms of producing crude oil and natural gas in the state of Texas, they're producing it largely for the benefit of American consumers. Um, and whatever nefarious things they may have uh, in mind as a Chinese government, it's not just oil and gas. I mean, this is sort of across the board. I am an unfettered free trader, and the reason is... Uh, listen, I assure you, you bought something that was made in China yesterday, last week, you may today. Um, you bought it for less than you would otherwise be able to buy it for. Um, and, um, uh, and so we are 
always have been, will continue to be the beneficiaries of free trade in ways that we don't know about. Uh, can you imagine an economy where, um, where we and our population and our GDP, the size of our economy, compared to China and their population, the size of their economy, somehow we're supposed to match up dollar for dollar what we buy from them and what they sell to us. Does that make any sense? It doesn't make any sense at all. Should we do this for Sri Lanka? No. I mean, how, how does this work? So this balance of trade notion is a silly one. Adam Smith said so himself. Uh, and again, um, I, there's no wiggle room for me on this. And the reason is I don't think I have any right at all to tell you what transaction you should engage in, nor do you have any right to tell me. I mean that very kindly, by the way. I appreciate the question. All right. Well, uh, I think David Stevenson had a, quite his hand up quicker. But just to address your question, I think the state of Florida does disseminate or discern between foreign interests and American interests in terms of who should buy up lands but, and uh, has taken action. Uh, to try and address the Chinese, for example, which has national security implications uh, from buying up land. And uh, I'm Margaret Byfield, American Stewards for Liberty. She was back there a little bit ago. I guess she jetted out as working very diligently to try and protect U.S. property rights. Uh, so I do think this is an in-house debate, as is often the case, between those who are more libertarian-oriented versus conservative-oriented as to how you handle foreign powers in particular. It's a different issue with Bill Gates. He's an American citizen, I think. All right. Yes, Jason, <clears throat> got one for you, sir. Having partnered with you on uh, your utility, uh, utilities in Michigan, I know a little bit background. What I noticed in their multi-year plans was that uh, they were always very, very uh, let's do this, you have a five-year plan. In this five-year period, we're gonna close the coal plants early and we would like to have the electric customers pay us for that. Right. Uh, but building all the solar is out just beyond the five year timeline. And as each new plan comes in every couple of years, the solar continues to get pushed out. So one question is how serious are, the, are, are your utilities really about building these solar structures? And secondly, uh, your commissioner is appointed by the governor. So would you like to comment on the importance of elections? <laughs> well, uh, the elections part, I mean, people can and should get involved in the gubernatorial elections first. So those elections uh, do have an impact. But, yeah, I could see uh, some value. I know in Arizona, for example, elects their uh, ACC, the Corporation Commission commissioners. So... That's, that's one thing that I've looked at uh, advocating for possibly in Michigan. We'll see if there's enough other projects in front of it that this may be a difficult one to do. But the five-year plans, how soon will solar get developed? You're correct. They do set most of the solar out, but the utilities are planning, the two that I spoke of, are planning to build something like 13 to 15 gigawatts of solar in Michigan. Um, and in 2025, Consumers is planning to shut down its last coal plant. So those changes that Jim Robb, the CEO of NERC, talked about, they're happening today. So their interim plan is to go out and buy existing natural gas plants. They tried to get that in their integrated resource plan, their long-term plan. Some of that was refused, but they were gonna buy plants out of PJM and then basically just on paper switch them over and say that that made us good. So if you understand how generation works, it didn't build a new plant. It just took it from one piece of paper or one line item to another. So all it did is it took some generation from PJM. And interestingly today, if you've been paying attention, PJM is saying that they're facing critical shortfalls here coming up in the very near future. So it's just, it's shuffling deck chairs on the, the sinking, the deck of the Titanic as, as things go down, but um, that was their plan. And yes, right now they're pushing the solar out to the future, but at the same time, that's, that's the bulk of it. They are building solar right now and trying to buy up land and lease land and that sort of thing. So it is starting, but the big impacts, like Jim Robb said and you said, the, the big closures of reliable baseload plants are happening today. 
All right, we have another question over here. Hello, I'm Ken Peterson from Washington State. And uh, Washington State and Oregon State seem to have the same sort of depressing thing that you uh, mentioned, Jason. And, and there's a lot of energy and uh, effort that your organization and similar organizations in the Northwest have done without much uh, results, positive results that I can see. And what I'm wondering is from a strategic point of view, maybe what we need is to have Michigan, I'll say Michigan, <laughs> instead of Oregon or Washington, be the sacrificial lamb and you know just become, okay, this is what happens when you do it and stop fighting against it and just let it happen and then we get the lesson that can be used in the whole country. Right, I get the sentiment, um, but uh, I don't know if you saw the slides that I had. <clears throat> People like Robert Martis and Christian Pinedas are what happens when you do that. But uh, I can point you again, Jason Isaac is sitting right over there. He can talk about, we already have the example, Texas, February 2021, Austin just a couple weeks ago. Uh, the whole northeast side of the country during the Christmas break, when the cold weather hit and they were doing blackouts, I think it was Duke and TVA were, were calling for, for uh, conservation measures. The entire state of California every summer is an example. The entire European continent right now, <laughs> you couldn't pick a better example than the country of Germany. We have this happening constantly. So those examples already exist. But again, I get the sentiment, but I personally have trouble with just making that argument that somebody like Christian Pineda as well, I guess, you know, casualty of war. No, we shouldn't allow that kind of thing to happen. Uh, we have time for one more question. Uh, is that how many more minutes do we have left? One, one minute? Okay. We'll take one more and make your answer brief if you can, and uh, we'll have this gentleman ask his question. Uh, Toby Mack, EIA. -E um, this may not be the right place to ask the question, but I will. Um, for a long time, we've used a process known as enhanced oil recovery using CO2 going down into uh, played out conventional wells. Um, do you know what the state of technology is for using EOR in shale, uh, particularly in the Permian? Uh, because, um, you know, that, that could substantially increase uh, the recoverable supply uh, in not only the Permian, but in places like the Bakken and another shale. Sure, shale. we've had EOR techniques in place like that, both in terms of CO2, water flood, you name it, uh, in terms of kind of uh, raising production from kind of tired or uh, conventional fields. But yes, this is something that's playing out in the Permian as we speak. And as a matter of fact, there are some companies that are primarily Permian operators that are pushing a bill at the legislature now uh, in terms of um, making uh, uh, CO2 and other such things, um, and in fact, even sort of extending this to refracking um, as enhanced oil recovery um, and some tax benefit that comes along with that. Uh, We'll, we'll see what we think about that, and me as an economist, I think our association is for it because it probably helps our member companies, but it also raises crude oil production as well. But there are people who know more about this technology than I do, but I know full well that this is something that's in, in terms of unconventional production, which is becoming conventional, right? I mean, it's the, it's the norm in terms of crude oil production now, uh, something that's playing out in shale fields as well. All right, this is going to have to conclude our uh, talk here today, our session, but of course these gentlemen will be up here if you have additional comments, questions, and that, and be available to answer questions. Uh, why don't we give them a quick round of applause? And our session is officially closed. Uh, thank you very much for sticking with us. We're in the uh, home stretch, almost there, everybody, so... Round of applause for all your uh, 
uh, stamina through this uh, weekend. But anyway, we're going to get started here on panel 7B, why net zero is impossible, the continuing need and value of fossil fuels. So we had a little change to the arrangement of the uh, program, the order today. Uh, but that's right. So uh, our first panelist uh, is going to speak today is uh, Mr. Wolfgang Mueller. Uh, Wolfgang's got a flight to catch uh, fairly soon. So as soon as he's uh, done speaking, he's going to dip out and full tilt boogie to the airport. So uh, he won't be around for Q&A, but uh, we'll still have all the rest of for it. But anyway, so Wolfgang Mueller is the General Secretary of the European Institute for Climate and Energy, Germany's leading think tank for climate and energy policies. And previously, he worked for the Friedrich Naumann Foundation in Germany and abroad as country representative in Zimbabwe and project director of the economic project in Southern Africa. And he is here to explain from Germany's perspective how Europe's green energy mania has been a disaster. So everybody, please, a round of applause for Wolfgang Mueller. Thanks, Tim. And um, yeah, so I always try when I come here to say, OK, what is a positive message I can deliver from Europe? So OK, let's, let's start. I don't want to go ahead of myself. So, so what are we? Who are we? Who I am? So, what you see there is an example of how actually the existence of climate skeptic think tanks is creating another industry in academia. Here, what you see is a report with the title, A Stronghold of Climate Change Denialism in Germany, Case Study of the Output and Press Representation of the Think Tank, IKE. That's my think tank. Okay. And hey, listen, I mean, it's the only thing I really have to quote and uh, it, where, it appell, uh, where it makes sense to read it. So the author, one of the author, uh, Mr. Moreno, not Morano, okay, Mr. Moreno, and carefully reading, climate change denialist think tanks have played a major role in climate obstructionism in the United States. And we are beginning to learn that there are also certain European think tanks acting in line with their U.S. counterparts. In the case of Germany, also the most relevant think tanks are aligned with the scientific consensus. One denialist stronghold is represented by the Europäische Institut für Klima und Energie, EIKE, our think tank. So it's just like, yeah, who are we? Thanks. And, um, and as I said, it's a whole industry now. I mean, you can buy fiction literature or other books about us. The, the first on the left, I translated the title, like the, the green thing, the struggle of the right against the ecological turnaround. And the green thing, it's climate racism. I mean, to be honest, up to this day, I fail to understand what climate racism is. Okay, I might get, have got an idea just before the other uh, lunch session. Another one in the middle is a novel. I mean, like, Okay, I don't want to go deep into this. So the point is none of these people who wrote these books ever talked to us, ever spoke with us or asked anything, no information. I mean, it's an utter uh, example of self-referencing. So basically, you, you write something on the internet, then you copy and paste it, and anyway, they have, you can imagine the rest. So, so the, the left and the green, they have a particular idea who we are, what we do, and uh, for example, like this, you know, me flying here with my Exxon-sponsored Learjet. I can't remember which model it is because it changes it almost every day. And uh, no, on a serious note, so what do we really do? It's an honor for me to be here at the Heartland Climate Conference because everybody who went 2008 at the, the first Manhattan Climate Conference of the Heartland Institute, it was like, beyond mind-boggling, was an overkill of academia, of scientific yeah, expertise. And uh, we, we were, at that time, our institute was just one year old. We started 2007, also realizing, OK, it's, it doesn't make sense that all, all these experts and whatever so-called skeptics work on their own, so we formalized, let's say, critical thinking, uh, collected it. And so 2008 was, for us, the example and the role model, this is how you have to deal with the issue, get the experts together. 
And, and you can see on the, on the pictures, we had Fred Singer in Germany, and I mean, many, almost half of the panelists here we already had speaking at one of our conferences, also 15 on, uh, so far, and, uh, and two of them even in partnership with the Hartlett Institute. And what else do we do apart from conferences? Because the conference alone don't change the world. We also co-finance co um, um, research. The one, what you just see here in the geophysical research letters, is one uh, paper from last year with Professor Henrik Svensmark about supernovae rates and burial of organic matter. The interesting thing is, this is a, a professor, he, together with uh, Henrik Svensmark, they basically follow the how, what drives the climate, what role does uh, the, the clouds play. And he was cut off from funding from his university and from the institute, from the Danish Space Research Institute. I mean, and we had particular, uh, Professor Svensmark and Nir Shaviv, we have them regularly speaking at our conference, so we basically, we pitch to the audience, I mean, isn't there, and, and not anybody who wants to help and so over the years you know we collected some some money i mean it's not not loads we still talk about germany not the united states and so we helped him to finish this research to publish it and um, among this and the agency is last year the tax authorities in germany because we had since 2012 charitable status like 501c3 equivalent, and they stripped us of it because they could not see that we were working in any way scientifically. I mean, do I have to say anything more? Of course, for most of it, it does not really come as a surprise, but it didn't, it, it didn't make things easier. Anyway, so on the other side, on a positive note, I mean, I don't want to always just be the doomsday talker here, and uh, you see YouTube, the thumbnail of our latest product, the World Climate News, a very modest title, I realize. And uh, you see our spokesperson and outreach room for media, Maya, is actually here with us, and she doesn't have to dash to the jet, the excellent jet in a few minutes, like me, and uh, she can answer many things later. So anyway, she also has my card so for, for contact. Anyway, let's go ahead. So we talk about not me and us and how great we are, but net zero. I mean, the ETC. I mean, we in Germany, we even don't even call it net zero, we just call it climate neutrality. And uh, the European Union, that's a very interesting thing, the European Union had regarding energy in the past, and to this day, no real say. That's, that's funny, it's like, kind of like counterintuitive. So like, the European Union, the, the Brussels, they don't have uh, authority to regulate what's going on in the energy supply in the various member countries. However, through so-called environmental standards, they are coming in. And um, the best, we all know, even you had it here, the ban of the incandescent light bulb, or one thing that really made it around the globe because it was, it's almost a mockery of, uh, I mean, regulating the power of your vacuum cleaners. I mean, okay, if that's the way how you save the world, okay, be it. <laughs> anyway, so, Obviously, the green idea is nothing new. Everybody is old enough to know that this is uh, around for a while. See, almost in sync, I mean, of course, thanks to the Paris Agreement, you know, one said, okay, we have to go for this famous 2050 aim, net zero, to use that term. And I mean, I like you know, how the, the EU has it, okay, no net emissions of greenhouse gases by 2050, economic growth decoupled from resource use, and then my most favorite thing is, no person and no place left behind. Good. But I mean, Germany wouldn't be Germany if we wouldn't have said, no, we want to be even better. You see, on the bottom line, Germany wants to reach net zero already by 2045. <laughs> it's almost like at school. No, no, I'm even better. So anyway, same intellectual level. OK. So and, I, I mean, somebody said it so nicely. It's an, it's an insult to our intelligence what's going on for years. And I mean, sorry, and, and I, I'm just adding now, bringing some examples of this. So in Germany, we had, a, and I, <laughs> it sounds like a joke, we had an ethics commission who was consisting of very, very important people, but 
without a series, with one, without one person who is knowledgeable in energy. Neither in gen energy generation or distribution or whatsoever. And these people then, they did, okay, we, we actually, we know it's easy, just we get rid of nuclear by 2022. Okay, they have a priest and other social scientists and anyway. Same like with the, uh, because the phasing out nuclear actually was decided before we even then all got the idea to phase out coal by 2038. I spoke with a person who attended these sessions and said not a single person raised the question where the power is supposed to come from after 2038. Not a single person. I mean, I always thought I knew what insanity might mean, but this is it on steroids. Anyway, and just to give you an idea, in the past, you know, in the, let's say, I don't want to say the good old past, but I, in a less idiotic time, nuclear consisted just a bit over 20% of our power generation. And now in two, <laughs> now, okay, you try to get rid of it. I mean, the idiocy there again is, they were supposed to switch off by law in December last year. But for some reason, in the last few weeks, they realized, you know, it was not yet Christmas, maybe, maybe we should extend it to April. But, but then it's over. But then it's over. Then there's no, no, no extension anymore. Almost if they would do a favor to anybody. So, let's go ahead. Of course, you can go 100% solar. It is possible. I mean, the best example here, it's a masterpiece of international, I'm really, I'm not making fun now, it's a masterpiece of international collaboration of state-of-the-art technology, constantly improved, 100% reliable. It's the ISS, the International Space Station. And they have power, and they can rely on it. They live on it, they depend on it, they would die otherwise. But there is one difference. The people who live there, they don't get a bill from the utilities. <laughs> it doesn't matter how much it costs for them. It's built in, as we like to say. Anyway, go ahead. So, I can uh, almost actually, um, Christopher Moncton already mentioned the famous uh, McKinsey and Partners study, which actually tried an, I would say, calculation estimate. Of course, these are r very rough figures. So one has to, you need almost a spoon of salt, I would say. I mean, you can't really say 9.2 trillion, but it, it's, it gives us an idea. To cut it short, in order to reach net zero, one has to spend, until 2050, about half of all the corporate profits so basically imagine every company we know, we look at and then the market, just take half of what they made. So you would, you, if you live on dividends or whatever, you, would have, you will get half in the future. Anyway, it's just for the greater good, so don't worry. And um, so these figures, okay, 31 million people in Europe already are not properly able to afford energy for heating, lighting, and it's a tricky with this figure because uh, Western Europe being a very a, a collection of welfare states. I, know, I mean, look, I don't mean it in a negative sense because, I mean, many people are really hit hard with super high energy bills. You know, if you live, if, if in, if you live in home, you know, with low insulation standards and so on, I mean, you really have to pay an arm and a leg. And especially suddenly when prices go up, you really don't know how to pay. And, so in a country like Germany, you basically go to the welfare institutions and you usually get helped out. But it's not the case in all the other countries. So, but I want to point out some on the bottom one. Yeah? Companies shift their investments outside of Europe. This chemical company, BSF, BASF, originally from Germany, hometown Ludwigshafen, it's in, in, in the southwest of Germany, the major taxpayer there, well, they're already, they're already here in the United States. It's nothing new. They're international, a global player. They just decided that the next investment of $10 billion will take place in China. Okay? So, irrespective of the country, but it won't take place at home for the obvious reason 
you don't want to pay. And I want to show you something, a technical thing, and I don't want to bore you actually more with technical, but this is actually interesting because people say, wait a minute, but why, why is the price so, so going so, so, so much higher? I said, okay, it's fairly simple. But I mean, the f married order effect. Some people never heard about it. For other people, it's just a household thing. The prices for electricity on the spot market are determined by the last power plant that comes to the grid. Meaning, so in the old days, if you ignore now the green renewables there in the left corner, where you had nuclear plants and coal-fired plants, whether lignite or hard coal, it doesn't matter, they were running 24 hours. We had the base load, the famous base load. And then, of course, during the day, when you need at the peaks, you had more, and then we had some bubble, bubble, extra pump storage. One. But point now, I just want to make. And then, in peak moments, the last and the most expensive power plants come into the on the grid. But for, the rule is they determine then the price of electricity on the market. So, and then picture this: the moment you take out nuclear, the whole thing moves to the left. And you take out coal, it moves further to the left. It says, okay, after renewables, immediately we have to go for gas. So in the ideal world, of course, we have constant power, we have light, the sun shines 24 hours, so we don't actually need these other evil base load out of nuclear and coal. But in the case, like here, where are the different ones? Let's go up for the show. I'll come back to this, don't worry. Here. This looks a bit uh, confusing, but it's actually very, very simple. The brown field is the consumption. You see, it's, it's August 2021. August 2021, what you see is from the 1st to the 31st of August 2021. The brown is the consumption of electricity. So it's basically what you really need in the grid. And it's usually in Germany between 40 and 65 gigawatt. Or 60,000 megawatts, anyway. And of course, in a functional economy, like in the Western world, this is what is usually available. We don't bother, we just plug our stuff in, switch them, it's a power is supposed to be there. And what you see now in the other colors is the yellow, the solar contribution. You have the spikes, because the sun, as we know, peaks during noon, usually. And the blue is wind, wind generation, which is beyond erratic. And now picture this. So you see the brown spikes to the top. And for some reason, the blue and the yellow doesn't manage really to reach the top. And especially now you see these little things at night when there is no sun, and there are even enough days where there is no wind either. So where do you get the power from? Okay. And the interesting thing now is now you go to the really top bottom, sorry, to the top line, the 120 on the left, 120,000, meaning 120 uh, gigawatt. This is actually the installed capacity. Installed capacity of power generation. It's, let's say, if you, if you just read the boilerplates from the wind farms and the solar farms. And then, you know what the reply of our experts is to the issue that we don't have enough power at night and on the day when we don't have wind, guess what? We just need more wind. We just need more wind power, more wind farms. Okay, so let's assume, let's, let's be really a little bit generous with the future and say, let's just triple the whole thing. Let's just triple wind and... How much time do we have? Okay, oh, that's not much. Okay, so what's next? I go further. So this is actually how it looks like. We have three times the wind farms, three times the solar fields. Bottom line is, we still don't have enough power. And this particular moment, we still need something else. And it, in solar capacity now, we are over 350 gigawatt or 350,000 megawatts. I mean, do you need more? This is utter insanity. Because the rest of the power, now we, we, we want to get rid of coal. Of course, nuclear, we will probably really get rid in April this year. The only solution there is, of course, gas. 
And I mean, thanks to our American friends who do these vicious, use vicious technology like fracking, there is enough gas on the market, so we can buy that. And, um, and just brief, briefly go back. The, uh, just to give you an idea, what you see here in scale, and in the middle, in the center, is the Brandenburg Gate. Anybody who was in Berlin, you know what the Brandenburg Gate is, and that is not such a small thing. And these other, it's in, in real comparison, the size, the, 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 the ratio of the wind, the wind, wind turbines. Around. On the left, you know, it's a dome from Cologne. It's a massive building. So these are the things we, we want to have 20,000 more of them. Anybody who knows Germany, it's not really such a big country. So it's so much space. Anyway, but it's, that's just to give you an idea what the future is supposed to look like. Don't want to go too much. But here, another thing, it's like we crowd out our agriculture. If you, when you're a farmer, you make now up to up to 10 times more money than you just lease your land to one of the solar farms. But the tricky thing is you have to really make sure how you sign it, the contract, because otherwise you're stuck with, a, with it for the next 20 years. Anyway, I don't, this is the rest you can imagine. You see how on the, from the left we just moved installing solar and wind capacity more and more and more without actually having a significant thing. Let's just rush a bit further because otherwise I will take time from the others. Yeah, the storage. People say, okay, well, it's not a problem. We just have to store the excess capacity, uh, excess electricity. And um, yeah, sure. And of course, you, that's, what, that's the solution. And the typical thing is pumped storage. This is what uh, nothing uncommon. You know, it's lakes, usually artificially designed, at least well, in Europe. Okay. But if you would use the entire, from Germany, Austria, up to the north, we would build up to Norway any possi possible lake for pump storage. Okay, we would get enough water to bring us one day water, so, uh, power. And um, okay, but then again, that yeah, yeah, we can use hydrogen and so on. But just I want to jump this because people say, oh, what hydrogen is really great, great, great. Yes, okay. I know even a guy who has a hydrogen car and said, do you know how hydrogen is produced? 95% of the hydrogen is coming from methane. So you take out the carbon, then you have your hydrogen. 95% basically of the rest is, anyway. And um, just go further. This is how we know how to go through the winter. We hope for a mild winter. We hope for lots of sun, sunshine and wind. We import LNG, we import coal, we import oil, and even electricity from abroad. And of course, there is a famous load shedding where we just switch industries off, but we already do for the last few years, you know, without, sometimes without notice. You have an aluminum smelter, so the, oops, the lights goes off. I'm not kidding. Okay, so thank you. Subscribe to our channel, where Maya is our presenter for our World Climate News. And, uh, I hope to see you next time again. All right. Another round of applause for uh, Wolfgang Mueller. He's got to hit the road right now to his Uber. So we'll see him next year. And anyway, our second presenter is Mr. Rob Bradley. And Mr. Bradley is the CEO and founder of the Institute for Energy Research as well as a senior fellow at the American Institute for Economic Research and an energy and climate change fellow at the Institute of Economic Affairs in London. Uh, he has held honorary, honorary positions at the University of Houston and the University of Texas at Austin and works on energy policy with numerous free market organizations. An expert on the history and regulation of energy markets, he is the author of eight books and numerous articles and he blogs at masterresource.org. So please, another round of applause, Mr. Rob Bradley. Well, thank you very much to the Heartland Institute for inviting me. Thanks to all of y'all uh, for being here. It's a great turnout. There's a fairly high opportunity cost out there, but uh, it's uh, great to see such a full room. Uh, my challenge is to tell you something you don't already know. Um, uh, uh, I'm, sometimes I find out that I'm the master of the obvious, and uh, I need to improve on that. But what I'd like to do is to uh, look at the history of the electricity industry 
and its implications for today's policy debate. I think you'll find that the more you know about the history of the energy, the stronger our case uh, is. And I'd like to uh, begin with uh, some fundamentals here on, on what is free market energy policy? What is a classical liberal energy policy? I think the basis is private property rights, well-defined, legally protected, and it's a shame that the number one issue around the world today is climate change when it should be something else, and that is privatization of the subsoil. Mineral rights to either the landowners or the first finder of mineral deposits, including oil and gas, under the surface. This would uh, democratize wealth, get wealth to private individuals rather than the state, uh, and it would uh, have, you would have the proper incentives to develop oil and gas that you don't have in countries like England. Uh, voluntary exchange, economics 101 here, scarcity pricing, profit loss accounting. This applies in energy emergencies too. This applies in wartime planning. It also applies uh, during uh, hurricanes uh, in special events. Uh, where there's laws against so-called price gouging, and I think economists have done a good job explaining that. Uh, the rule of law, absolutely essential. In civil society, you don't hear much about that, but there's not only for-profit uh, entrepreneurship business, uh, and there's not only government, but there's a third huge force and that is civil society. And it's a shame today that so much of civil society is working against the free market uh, rather than filling in the gaps and dealing with real energy issues. So the free market, it's competition, but it's also cooperation. And uh, it's doing good things through civil society. And uh, on the question of cooperation, I would say that US antitrust law has done more to distort the oil, gas, and electricity industry in the U.S. history than any other single law. Now, that's a, a lecture in itself. Uh, what is the free market? Well, it's consumer sovereignty. Consumers get the best uh, goods and services. Taxpayers kept out of it. Taxpayers neutral. Government is neutral. Uh, let the best technologies win. And the other thing is it's really an entrepreneurial Disneyland, uh, if you will. And I'm going to introduce you to two gentlemen back in the 1880s who, on their own initiative, maybe you would call this civil society, but they proved the concept of solar and, as you'll see in a second, wind. Uh, Charles Fritz, with his own money, this wasn't a for-profit venture. Uh, he sort of uh, proved that uh, solar is incredibly inefficient. Um, <laughs> uh, but, um, <coughs> the, uh, the, the energy efficiency of these panels uh, uh, was uh, below 1%. Uh, but he proved the concept. Going to wind, uh, Charles Brush, one of the great names of the early U.S. electricity industry who founded or who um, uh, first discovered and applied arc lighting uh, a few years ahead of, uh, of Thomas Edison. Uh, on his own initiative, with his own money, he wired up his mansion um, uh, with batteries and it was uh, served by uh, a wind uh, mill, you see here. Um, uh, so, once again, proving the concept. Now, we always hear about natural monopoly. Here we are in the 1880s, and these lines are uh, not only electricity, there's probably more telephone, uh, telegraph, but uh, uh, it's pretty busy out there. And the idea of natural monopoly, it's a, a theory uh, without a real-world counterpart that I can find in the gas and electricity industry where you say, oh gosh, competition's over, we have one firm, and that one firm is exploiting uh, consumers uh, uh, with gas or electricity, 
And I would say, well, uh, look at franchise protection. But before public utility regulation, there never was a, a clean example of this, or at least one that, uh, uh, that I'm familiar with, and I don't have time to read everything. Uh, William Stanley Jevons in 1865 wrote a book that was the founding of mineral and energy economics. He has insights about the intermittency of wind and all the negatives uh, of each renewable that still apply today. Um, uh, 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 the concentration of windmill electricity, um, it's greatly Jevons. Now here in the U.S. it's not a coincidence that in the freest country of the world we had the most invention and the business applications uh, uh, that we did. Uh, free market incentives, uh, the idea of retained earnings, that you could keep all your money from a business. This allows uh, gentlemen to experiment with wind power, solar power, as we saw. And the political interference of the industry, it started on the local level, and the problems there led to state-level uh, public utility regulation, and uh, problems with state regulation led to federal. It's a cumulative regulatory uh, process that's, of course, still going on today. And the result is we have a very politically wounded industry uh, today. Uh, Samuel Insel, uh, some of you might not know of Samuel Insel, but he was a John D. Rockefeller of electricity. He solved the business, the very unique business model of electricity. Um, he um, uh, came over from England on a steamer, highly recommended, visited with Edison. The first night, they pulled an all-nighter, uh, uh, this 21-year-old wonder kind uh, uh, was able to arrange financing for Edison uh, with his contacts back in England. And within a couple of months, Samuel Insel had power of attorney from Thomas Edison and built up, let me see if I can go back. How do I go back? Uh, uh, Insel was the builder of the company that became uh, General Electric. And th this guy's in his, in his 20s, uh, just, just amazing. And Edison and Insel, they really understood the economies of scale, going from the very small dynamos that were in the basement of an office building, going to jumbo generators where you're, uh, you have electric lines that uh, serve city blocks. And um, uh, when Insel left Edison to move to Chicago to take over a very chaotic embryonic uh, industry, uh, one of the first things he did was to buy out all the, uh, uh, the uh, inefficient generators, the, um, uh, the dynamos, and replace them with the uh, uh, big uh, units. Tremendous economies of scale, uh, three megawatts to five megawatts to 20 to 30, and Insel was always pushing the, the General Electric engineers to make them bigger, and they said, we can't do it, we can't do it. And, and Insel said, well, I'll take the risk and do it. And they'd turn on these big machines, and Insel would be right there and it was, a, it was scary, uh, according to some people. Uh, Insel was buying all his uh, coal from uh, Peabody, um, uh, uh, two generations of the Peabody uh, family, uh, Jack Peabody, the son uh, on, the, on the bottom right, and uh, uh, his father. And back then, it was all coal or it was white coal, white coal being uh, hydroelectricity. So for economies of scale, you need to sell the stuff. You not only generate it. And uh, the advertising campaigns, the so-called gospel of consumption, which to me would be fine to 
return to today uh, for electricity, except for electric vehicles, just because they're uneconomic and government subsidized. But all the things they were doing, including making uh, uh, husbands feel bad about not getting the latest appliances for their wife so the wife would live longer. The Electric City uh, in Chicago, uh, just amazing uh, how um, Insul uh, took a luxury and turned it into a necessity for the masses. And there was a lot going on here. Um, and one of the riddles, one of the paradoxes of electricity was whenever you had higher peak demand, if you add a generator, then uh, you serve that peak demand, but guess what? You lose money. And uh, Ensel was traveling in England, and he found out that there was a, they used a meter. The lights were on at night, and the businesses were closed. And you go, how do you do this? And there was a meter, the right meter, that allowed, that um, could measure peak consumption and not only total consumption from which you get average consumption. So depending on peak demand, uh, there's two prices. You pay a demand charge, a fixed charge, and then you have a volumetric rate. And this was a huge breakthrough in economic calculation uh, in uh, accounting uh, that solved the problem. And what is really important here is that this was a solution for reliability, for firmness. And today, going to the centrally planned wholesale market that we have around the country with independent system uh, organizations and regional uh, system organizations, they're trying to figure out how to price reliability. And then that's a central planning problem this is a, uh, the, the pricing issue should be with individual companies that are owning their own assets, where through legal contracts or otherwise, the obligation to serve is paramount. And we've lost the obligation to serve more or less. We've gone to central planning where legislators and experts and regulators are trying to figure all this out for us. Ensel uh, and his generation did that. Uh, the other thing, Ensel, uh, he uh, started uh, combining electricity, entering the contracts with neighboring utilities to, uh, uh, to provide backup power for each other where they didn't have to have a lot of backup power uh, in each utility. Another economy is a scale that reduce costs, reduce rates, make electricity affordable. Uh, and Ensel was something else. Uh, he wrote about it, and uh, uh, I recommend an autobiography, Ensel by Force McDonald, which is a great book. Uh, Ensel also had batteries near the uh, 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 the turn of the century. Um, and Ensel knew if people get stuck on elevators, it could be a real problem. So this is free market application of storage. Uh, you know, this, all this stuff was figured out in an economic, and applied in an economic way uh, more than a century ago. So Ensel uh, came up with the uh, the whole concept of, of uh, uh, he figured out the business model for electricity and it was always uh, cut and try rates. He would lower, he lowered rates like 18 times uh, and he didn't need public utility regulators to tell him, oh, you need to uh, do this with your rates. He was always cutting them. But Ensel led the way for public utility regulation of, of electricity. And the problem was he was being hit, as a lot of other utilities, on two sides. One is local rate ordinances that were arbitrary, uh, corrupt governments, just saying you, you can only charge this. And on the other side, there was a threat of municipalization. So given these two threats, uh, those were the main reasons why the industry 
turn to public utility regulation on a statewide basis because they had constitutional protection uh, uh, for um, uh, rate base, uh, returns on rate base and cost recovery. I'm running behind. Should I continue? Okay. Major federal laws, and these are laws that we have to repeal uh, to get to a free market in electricity. Certainly the Federal Power Act of 1935, uh, regulating uh, uh, the wholesale market, uh, electricity transported in uh, over interstate lines. The Public Utility Holding Company Act of 1935, if it were not for this law today, to some extent, maybe a large extent, we would have uh, not only the oil majors, we would have electricity majors, and we would have natural gas majors, and we could have combination uh, gas and electricity majors. This would have, uh, what this would do is to coordinate business decisions where you don't have uh, uh, mal-coordination between gas and electricity, which was uh, one of the causes, one of the uh, contributing causes to the Great Texas uh, blackout of uh, two years ago. And Peter Hartley, our author, uh, who will be speaking tonight, has done a paper on this. Regulatory uh, Policy Act of 1978, giving preferences to renewables, the Energy Policy Act, the federal, uh, the production tax credit for wind that was uh, um, extended 14 times. You know, yeah, yeah, wind is gonna be competitive. Uh, it's a mess. So this is probably my major slide. The road to electricity serfdom, we're on it. The idea of, of F.A. Hayek, he warned against the great utopia at the time. Uh, they had a con concept of utopia. Today, we uh, have this concept, uh, the utopian climate. Uh, the process of intervention that increases uh, uh, year by year. And back in the 70s, it was a soft energy path of Amory Lovins no hard uh, uh, physical plants, no oil, gas, coal generation, no nuclear. And he said en uh, energy efficiency, it's a free, not only a free lunch, it's a lunch you're paid to eat. Uh, uh, the whole idea of uh, uh, megawatts and conservation. Now we have gone to a centrally planned wholesale market with the ISOs, RTOs, that have made it a lot easier for wind and solar to penetrate the grid. And guess what? Now that the grid is very unstable, we're turning to demand side management where the experts, the engineers, are coming up with all these models that will um, uh, control demand. And if you, if you have smart meters in your home, uh, get them out of there because the smart meter allows a utility to control your home and they're offering you money to put these things in, but it's, uh, it's very much a, a Pandora's box. Uh, and so all the problems on the supply side, now we're going to engineering on the demand side, uh, buyer beware. Uh, the, the Texas blackout, the interpretation of this has just been uh, terrible. The, all the official studies looked at the physical outages of the time, including gas infrastructure, coal, some nuclear, and they say, oh gee, uh, this is unreliable capacity. Well, no. Uh, it was a decade of malincentives, taking away all the incentives for uh, the baseload generation that caused this. Uh, one, uh, here's an exchange, I'm gonna go over this very clearly, but uh, Robert Borlick is an old time 
electricity planner. And when I started battling him on LinkedIn, uh, he was calling me all sorts of bad names. Uh, and at the bottom he says, unintended consequences of government intervention. Are you kidding me? What just happened is a direct consequence of insufficient government intervention. In other words, they should have had laws against ga uh, uh, prohibiting uh, gas infrastructure from uh, uh, not being weatherized. Always more government interventions, not market incentives. But he later on came to realize that you know negative pricing by wind and all uh, uh, totally distorted the system. But why haven't the University of Houston, uh, the University of Texas, even even Rice University, uh, the the Nehru, FERC? Why haven't all these studies looked at the real cause of the Texas crisis in terms of lower margins because of wind and solar forcing? Uh, they, it is politically incorrect to get to the real reasons, and this just shows you where academia is. So. I'm going to conclude with that, and let's get to the main speaker. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right, main speaker, uh, the hammer spot here. Uh, once again, hopefully you saw her yesterday. Uh, our last speaker is my colleague at Heartland, Linnea Lucan. She is a research fellow with the Arthur B. Robinson Center on Climate and Environmental Policy. Uh, she came to Heartland from the University of Wyoming in 2018, where she graduated with the, uh, in 2018 with a BS in Petroleum Engineering and a minor in Geology. And uh, before coming to Heartland, or she was actually an intern with Heartland, then left us and went out to the real world and uh, worked in the Gulf of Mexico on, uh, on some deep water drill ships as a logging geologist, and then she came back to us. So. Uh, She's here to uh, wrap it up for us today, so we'll give it up for Lene Lucan. Hi, thank you. So today, I'm gonna get into this kind of quick. So today I am talking about biofuels, and specifically I'm going to be discussing ethanol, biodiesel, and pelletized biomass fuel used for electricity generation. Um, I am not, talking about a, you know, vegetable oil powered survival apocalypse truck. I am not talking about ethanol for human consumption. Uh, and I am not going after your Traeger grill. <laughs> um, biomass sometimes can refer to biofuels like ethanol and biodiesel. Uh, but to keep it simple today, biomass is going to refer to the pelletized solid wood or waste products um, fuel and biofuels is going to refer to ethanol and biodiesel. So quick rundown on these. Ethanol is a simple alcohol that is made from corn, soybeans, other agricultural products. Biodiesel is usually made from some kind of a vegetable oil or palm oil, but in the United States, it's usually made from soybean oil. Both of these are blended into either gasoline or diesel in the United States and in other countries. Uh, the blends are different depending on where you live, but in the United States, you're usually not supposed to go above about 15% ethanol and gasoline. Other countries have 100% ethanol available at the pumps. That would be someplace like Brazil. And E85 is common um, in Europe and also in some performance motorsports. So why do we use these fuels in the first place? Um, to begin, the U.S. started looking for alternatives to gasoline after the 1973 oil embargo. Um, they needed another source to try to prevent the chaos that occurred with that. But since the United States can be pretty much oil independent now, it's not such a good reason anymore. Um, ethanol and biodiesel have a better cetane and octane rating um, than straight gasoline or diesel and this is gonna be a measure of the compressibility of the fuel before ignition. The main reason that these are blended in, in reality, is because they claim that it has some kind of a um, climate benefit or an environmental benefit, but as I'm gonna show you, it's not quite so simple as that. Uh, ethanol also stood 
as a alternative to a previous octane booster called um, meth methyl tert butyl ether, which was banned because of some groundwater concerns in several different states, and eventually it was banned pretty much everywhere. And then in 2005, Congress passed the Renewable Fuel Standard Program as part of the Energy Policy Act. And this, in the United States, as with many countries that have similar programs, requires the increasing use of biofuels as a percentage of your uh, vehicle fuel and also as your electricity production. So you can see on the chart here, it's really pretty interesting to see how quickly things change in terms of uh, the percentage of fuel ethanol and gasoline. Around 2002, that MBTE is banned and you can see the acceleration there and it really takes off around 2005. So let's see exactly why and what this stuff is doing in your gas tank. So specifically for biofuels, it's vital to note that they have a lower energy density than their oil-based counterparts. These numbers are going to vary from one fuel to the next, but in general, gasoline has a higher energy density at about 30 megajoules per liter, and diesel has up to 40. And these can change from fuel to fuel, but this is generally true. It takes one and a half times more fuel to drive the same distance on ethanol as it does with gasoline. The effect is that biofuel will result in sometimes noticeable reductions in fuel economy. And it'll have an impact on the carbon dioxide emissions too when you start factoring that in. Just wait, because uh, they do claim that you have significant carbon dioxide emission reductions from using ethanol, but that is not actually the case. There's also the potential for corrosion in parts of certain engines, especially in boats and small engines that are not built to handle ethanol fuels. Um, that would be like weed whackers and lawnmowers. This isn't as severe a problem as it used to be, um, but it still can cause some issues for rubber parts. And then for biodiesel, gelling is an interesting phenomena that if you drive a diesel vehicle, you get to potentially, but hopefully not often, experience. Um, Diesel will start to form ice crystals at a uh, pretty, pretty low temperature, so it's going to be around uh, 5 to minus 2 degrees Fahrenheit, which can clog up your lines. Biodiesel gels much more quickly. With a poor quality biodiesel, you can start having ice crystal formation at 60 degrees Fahrenheit. For most ones that they're going to use in, you know, and mix into your gas or into your diesel at the pump, it's more like 14 degrees Fahrenheit, but that's still significantly higher temperature than regular diesel. So that's why you have a blend change in northern states in the winter. Um, it's recommended that if you are traveling from south to north during a cold snap that you stop more frequently to fill up as you travel north so that you can gain the benefit of those fuel additives um, that are in greater quantities the further north you go. Uh, these are usually petroleum-based additives, <laughs> but they don't exactly talk about that. Um, this and the corrosion problem can also be an issue for pipelines, which is why the U.S. Department of Transportation advises that you do not ship all that much ethanol or biodiesel via pipeline. It can shorten their lifespan. Um, but maybe we don't really care about all that because we're worried about emissions, supposedly, uh, and this stuff is supposed to help us with that. But that's not quite the case. So when it comes to emissions data, at first glance, it does appear that you have some carbon dioxide savings with ethanol over gasoline. Gasoline emits about 3.3 kilograms of um, CO2 per kilogram of fuel burned, uh, and ethanol emits about 1.91. However, when you take into account the different energy output of the two fuels, ethanol emissions actually come out higher than gasoline. Uh, per energy output equivalent. Additionally, some studies by various organizations, including one by uh, researchers at the University of Michigan, found that burning biofuels isn't actually even carbon neutral. Um, the uptake of CO2 by planting and growing the feedstock is not nearly enough to overcome the emissions from producing and burning the fuel. 
Besides carbon dioxide, the EPA has even admitted that these fuels increase nitrogen oxides, particulate matter, ozone, and sulfur oxides in the areas that it is heavily used. Higher ethanol use has also been connected to higher asthma rates in places like Los Angeles and near ground ozone smog in Brazil. And on land, um, despite the fact that the corn that we grow for ethanol in the United States is not the same as the corn that you eat, it still has an impact on food prices. A University of Wisconsin-Madison study found that the renewable fuel standards and the associated farming incentives caused farmers to switch to more crops that you can use for ethanol or biodiesel production. And um, so corn prices overall ended up rising 30%, and overall crop prices rose 20% after the passage of those bills. In Brazil, environmental scientists are increasingly concerned about encroachment on wetlands for sugarcane production. Um, while sugarcane production might not necessarily be pushing into uh, the forests, um, they are displacing rangeland for uh, cattle, which are displacing some natural forest. And this is a picture of land being prepared, prepared for a palm oil plantation in Thailand. So to say that there isn't any deforestation going on with some of these biofuels is uh, not quite correct. Biomass. This is a fun one, especially if you are living in the United Kingdom. Uh, biomass pellets used for grid-scale electricity are also not super great, and they share a lot of the same issues as biofuels. Um, supposedly growing these tree plantations and then cutting them down and shipping them across the ocean and then burning them in a power plant is carbon neutral, uh, but I am skeptical. Uh, and a lot of environmentalists are becoming skeptical as well. As a major electricity provider, wood pellets are not particularly energy, energy efficient. Uh, they provide about 5% of our total primary energy use. The chart to the right here, oh, the chart to the right here uh, is going to show some of our biomass energy consumption since about 1950. And as you can see, um, the one that they like to talk about all the time is the use of waste, and that's actually flatlined for quite some time. Biofuels have increased pretty well, uh, and the wood bio pellet uh, has, for the United States, pretty much flatlined as well. Uh, good quality wood pellets with a very low moisture content only have about half the energy density as a equivalent volume of low quality house coal. A good quality anthracite has more than three times as much energy density. So with that low energy density, does it at least save us on some emissions? This is actually incredibly hotly debated right now. Uh, I think that so far the data is indicating that it is not the case that it saves on emissions. The EPA and the European Commission for a long time have not held biomass Fired, fired power plants to the same standards that they hold something like a coal-fired power plant. Um, so they don't track the carbon dioxide emissions because they, there is the assumption that it is net zero anyway. Um, CO2 uptake in reality is going to depend on the type of tree that you plant um, and also the underbrush that exists and how long those trees are left to grow. In the American South, where most biomass is grown, the tree species tend to be fast-growing pines. However, they're not always left all that long in the first place, so they're not able to reach their maximum carbon storage capacity anyway. Um, one study actually by the Environmental Research Letters found that replacing coal with wood bioenergy would actually increase immediate emissions and that governments are actually making a huge mistake with their accounting on this because they ignore the decades to centuries long increases before any meaningful sequestration can take place. If it's true, and I don't think it is, but if it is true that carbon dioxide emissions are causing rapid emergency levels of you know, climate change, then this is time that we just don't have. So why would we promote biomass? They also found that the production facilities that produce the pellets themselves and also power plants associated with them, um, similarly to ethanol and uh, biodiesel, produce a large amount of criteria pollutants that are overlooked because of the assumption that it's a green fuel. 
And this is a big heap of biomass outside of the Drax power station in the UK. You're not really supposed to leave it out in the humidity, so I'm not sure what they're doing there. Um, but this power plant has come under fire recently um, because the governments are beginning to become a little bit skeptical of the carbon dioxide emissions reporting from that station. Again, land use is a major issue here. Most of the feedstock in the United States comes from what the Energy Administration or Energy Information Administration uh, refers to as other residuals. And this is just stuff like leftover bark, logging leftovers, wood chips, post-consumer waste, extra sawboards that you don't need, that kind of thing. Um, wood from trees with defects that can't be used for anything else. The second largest comes from sawmill residuals, so sawdust. And then the third, though, is what's classified as roundwood or pulpwood. These are trees that are grown specifically for the production of biomass. These displace natural forest, which, as I explained earlier, has actually been shown to be a better carbon uh, sink than the plantation trees that they're replacing it with. Ecosystem disruption is made worse with this kind of tree farming. Um, and because of the EU's own renewable fuel standard goals, um, and the demand for biomass growing so rapidly because it's supposed to be carbon neutral, uh, it's led to deforestation rising 49% in Sweden, Finland, and across several Baltic nations. So I just spent a good amount of time being super mean to <laughs> biomass and biofuels. So are they utterly worthless? I would argue no. Um, as we have heard a couple times during this conference, it's important that we do a cost-benefit analysis. We look at what we value and how best to achieve that. Um, right off the bat, waste products like leftover sawmill residuals, um, scraps from timber harvesting, bad trees, municipal waste are, in my opinion, a pretty good thing to use for energy. Um, for instance, Japan gets a large amount of their electricity from burning garbage, actually. Um, it's reported that they burn about 50% of their plastic waste for electricity. Is this carbon neutral? Um, probably not, <laughs> but it makes sense because it fixes another environmental problem that a place as small as Japan that has as high of a consumption rate as Japan has, and that is waste piling up and potentially ending up in the oceans or in their natural reserves. Um, so this solves that problem for them. Um, and it makes sense to not be wasteful when you have a bunch of stuff sitting around that you could be using for electricity. We need the timber industry regardless. We need paper goods. We need wood. So it makes sense to use their leftover scraps as well. Um, I'm not overly worried about carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, but if you are, these energy sources are obviously not doing you any favors. Uh, if you're worried about stuff like deforestation or the degradation of wetlands, it's also not helping you out all that much. If you hate synthetic fertilizers, well, imagine how much synthetic fertilizer it takes to produce the amount of corn or soybeans or other agricultural products, products that we need to just produce ethanol or biodiesel without even including the elements that we still need left over for food production, right? So we're using up a ton of land and a ton of our fertilizers just for fuel, um, and those fertilizers are, are made with stuff that we could also be using for fuel. So in the end, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense economically or environmentally. As I mentioned at the beginning, Ethanol fuels are beloved in motorsports, um, though those aren't what I would call carbon neutral either. Uh, and some people get terrific use and joy out of converting their vehicles to run on cooking oil. Um, that's super cool, and I would never be against um, doing neat engineering product projects like that. But there's really no need to mandate this stuff, um, especially not in the name of being green or environmentally friendly. So. Um, this presentation that I have been giving, oh yeah, and these are a couple of articles um, that show that the biomass and biofuel is even slowly becoming a little bit unpopular on the green side. 
So I wrote a couple of papers on this subject, both for the uh, energy side and the environmental side, and they're available on Heartland's website. Um, I also did a video on this. They go into a little bit more detail than I thought I would have time for in this presentation, but I think we are good. Oh, I have a couple more minutes? Yeah. Okay, neat, so I can talk about, I have a minute. Um, I can talk about one of the uh, most fun facts about this. Um, let me see if I can go back to the slide that has it. If I don't waste all my time just trying to click through this thing. <laughs> so, uh, if I can find it. Okay, so one of the interesting facts is that the European Union is actually the largest combined producer of wood pellets. About 46% of them are produced over there. But the United Kingdom is by far the world's largest consumer of biomass fuel pellets. They use up 21% of all of the wood fuel pellets that are produced um, on their own from electricity production. And 75% of that supply comes from the United States. It doesn't even mostly come from Europe. So, I mean, do the math on that, <laughs> on that uh, transportation logistics there, and I'm, I'm extremely skeptical that it's carbon neutral. Additionally, it's funny when um, the British government is using all of this biomass fuel, saying that it's more environmentally friendly, and yet they're also trying to pass rules that restrict people's personal ability to use wood stoves in their own homes. So <laughs> I found that ironic and kind of fun uh, in a terrible uh, dystopian sort of way. So, but that's what I've got today. So thank you. All right, so we still have about 19 minutes for uh, Q&A, so look for Cameron, the uh, dapper individual back there with the uh, glasses and the microphone, and um, it's probably easier to get his attention than mine, because I'm sort of blinded by these lights that are right in my eyes, and I can't see past like the first like five rows here, so. Yeah, my name is Bob Kappelman. I'm an energy policy consultant. Um, one of my clients has the largest biomass <clears throat> to energy plant uh, in the United States. Um, I'm glad you made the distinction between pellet fuel and biomass waste fuel. Uh, biomass pellets, I haven't priced it, but it's sometimes as high as $16 per million BTU, whereas biomass waste we call slash from pine forest harvesting, latest price was like $3.50. Eight cents. So big distinction. Also, are you fam if you're familiar with life cycle uh, calculations for carbon neutral, I think you'll find that the slash is more than carbon neutral, whereas pellets are nowhere near carbon neutral. You might comment a little bit more on the difference. Um, one factoid that's interesting, uh, uh, the National Energy Laboratory calculated about in 2005, 2010, a billion tons of carbon neutral biomass was available out there. So, and uh, so comment, I appreciate comments, you know, on that because the distinction yeah. is super important. Right. Um, oh, it seems like this is not on, maybe. You're good. It's on? Okay. Um, so yeah, no, it, it, it makes sense, just you don't need necessarily to do a whole lot of math to figure out that um, the kind of residual products type of biofuel or biomass fuel is a totally different animal than um, using a roundwood or pulpwood source to create a biomass pellet. Um, because of course, especially if you're using these residuals from the timber industry, those Pines are getting used in, um, you know, creating homes or creating um, power poles or something. So that that carbon isn't going anywhere, right? So that makes sense. Um, yeah, no, I, I think the distinction is important. You're totally correct. Okay. Anybody else? Hi, thank you. Uh, my name's Brian Lindauer. I'm with the, I'm, well, not with anybody, but I uh, am in the nuclear power industry. 
And my first comment is for Linnea to make sure that you know that I do use ethanol free fuel in all of my critical engines. But uh, actually, I had a question for uh, the other gentleman whose name does not appear in the itinerary, so I can't uh, unfortunately call you by name. But um, obviously, we have uh, an issue with RTOs and ISOs and the governance. FERC trying to establish a market that in a, in a completely non-market situation. I was intrigued by your comments uh, from, uh, I think his name was Insole, a name hilariously similar to a, uh, uh, you know, a woke insult for young men who fail to find attractive uh, relationships. But um, the idea that you could have a market in the electricity world at the grid scale I mean, it seems like it should be able to be hap happening because electricity is the ultimate fungible resource. However, is it even hypothetically possible with the technologies that we have, setting aside regulations and the problems, is it a techni technically feasible thing to accomplish? Um, I understand, you know, electricity is different. You have to consume it the moment it is produced. You need control areas. Uh, and there's economies of scale and diseconomies of scale on control areas. But the free market approach, uh, which is uh, we have uh, a lot of history on and it didn't fail, uh, uh, companies uh, establish their control areas. Um, and companies would enter into agreements with their neighboring companies uh, for backup power, uh, uh, different uh, backup or complementary services. The problem is franchise protection, where you're giving a legal monopoly to one company. Uh, you, don't, uh, you don't need that. It's a special interest uh, intervention. Now, the problem is, is that we had prior intervention that I mentioned that necessitated companies to go to the public utility model. But uh, in that, uh, the brief answer is in the absence of uh, ISOs, RTOs, uh, private companies uh, would have uh, uh, control areas and without antitrust law, they can uh, enter into agreements uh, with their neighboring uh, utilities. And don't forget that we would have electricity majors uh, if it wasn't for government intervention. Anybody else? Yeah, if we can zigzag the questions, he's got to get his 10,000 steps in today, so I'm sure. Uh, a question for Linnea, or comment and a question. Um, I'm a Bill Lindquist is my name. I live in California. I'm a geologist. I'm a very keen birder. And I imagine a lot of people in this room also like birds. When you cut down native forests in the eastern US, you have a great variety of trees and shrubs, and they're usually teeming with birds. You replace that native forest with pine plantations. They're often as sterile as hell when it comes to wildlife, birds, and mammals. Does the Audubon Society, have they come out against all this biomass um, uh, dogma or are they, are they seduced by the green energy refrain? So I've seen some uh, publications, not specifically on Audubon, but some other eastern bird um, birding organizations that have said that it is um, more or less a uh, net negative for them in uh, bird conservation in that area. And I, I happen to live pretty much surrounded by a whole lot of um, pine plantations and stuff over, I live in South Carolina right now. There's a whole lot of them in Georgia and there's a whole lot across the Southeast. Um, and I mean, I wouldn't say that it's, I wouldn't say that a, a pine plantation is totally barren, but it's certainly not the same as a hardwood forest. Mm -hmm. uh, Chris, Mor Chris Morrison, um, I write for uh, the London uh, publication called The Daily Skeptic. 
Um, in the UK, we're very proud of um, uh, the Drax Power Station. It consumes uh, 800 million pounds of subsidies since it first started, and it's made the shareholders very rich. Um, and of course, as the speaker pointed out, uh, we have the powers that be are now stopping the ordinary people uh, who don't make a lot of money out of this stuff from actually burning wood. Um, go figure. Uh, the, well, I'd like to just ask if it, you, haven't, you didn't mention it, but none of this stuff happens without subsidy. So, so what sort of subsidies are being produced elsewhere in this uh, in this feeding chain? Right, I think it's, um, I, I'm not sure what the exact rules are called or, or what your um, equivalent to the renewable standards and mandates. So in the United States, each state has its own renewable portfolio. So, a, you know, California will say we want X percentage of our um, grid to be run on a biofuel or something by the year 2035 or whatever it happens to be. Um, I think that the same is across the European Union, uh, but I, I'm not aware of the exact mandates that you have over there. Um, I do know that there are, uh, like what Wolfgang was talking about in his talk on Germany's own you know, net zero goals with their renewables expansions, um, they, they have a similar renewable portfolio standard sort of um, framework as the United States, so I wouldn't be surprised at all if the UK has something similar that says, you know, we need X amount of our grid to be powered by biofuels by this date, um, but I couldn't tell you the exact name of the law. You, you brought up uh, subsidies, and it's interesting to look at the different electricity sources and ask yourself, uh, is this a government-created industry? Uh, with industrial wind turbines, uh, clearly the answer is yes. For off, uh, for on-grid solar, uh, the solar farms, I think the answer is yes. Uh, with biofuels, uh, I'm tempted to say it's yes, without any government subsidies. But there's another industry, uh, government created, government enabled uh, since the 1950s, and that's nuclear power. Uh, I think from a free market perspective, if you look at the history of nuclear, uh, you'll see that uh, mistakes were made at the very beginning. It's an industry that uh, was never uh, competitive just because it's too darn uh, as a way I put it, it's uh, the most complicated, expensive, way to boil water. It's the last thing, really the last thing you want to do. This is a lecture in itself, and uh, uh, so it's assertion, but uh, do keep that in mind. Hi, I'm Kevin Kilo. I'm with Cowboy State Daily. It's a Wyoming publication. I've interviewed Mr. Bradley before. Um, I was wondering, uh, one of the things we have in Wyoming is they switched uh, one of the refineries, if not two, over to biodiesel, all of which is uh, shipped to California. And of course, that just diminished uh, limited uh, refining capacity. I was wondering if you had, uh, you know, any thoughts on uh, what is happening with, you know, limited refining capacity going to biodiesel and then leaving that uh, un unavailable for uh, fossil fuel products. Right. And that's a huge problem, too, because we haven't built a new refinery since like the 1970s, I think. So to switch all of that over to something like, you know, it's going to be a soybean based biodiesel if it's in the United States, most likely. Um, it's incredibly dangerous because we already have a backup on the amount of production that you can reasonably handle from both the United States and Canada because Canada doesn't have the refinery capacity for their own fuel, so they send a lot of it to us at our Gulf Coast refineries um, to handle. And so the more you are... Um, subsidize the more biofuels that you subsidize and force the refineries 
to include in their blends, I think, I think the more you're going to have that backup problem. Okay, uh, Roger Carlson with uh, Saving the World Before Breakfast. And somebody once told me that uh, the shale revolution could only happen in America because we had uh, mineral rights in this country. Whereas in other countries, the king or commissar owned the mineral rights. So farmers would chase geosurvey crews out. Whereas in Texas, a uh, pickup truck is chasing after the survey crew asking what kind of royalty deal they could get. So leads to the question, I think you might have, Mr. Bradley, I think you mentioned it briefly. Could you expand on uh, property rights and in this country and how it might, they might be expanded to other countries? Uh, Texas got lucky. Uh, uh, when they were making the law, uh, they, they came out of a Spanish tradition that the sovereign owned all mineral rights, but uh, the political decision maker says, well, there's nothing under all that sand. Uh, we'll let uh, private, uh, uh, we'll let the uh, uh, surface owner have rights to the subsoil and uh, with mineral rights, uh, the landowner could then uh, 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 sell, sell them or lease them off uh, to create a market there. Uh, it's one of the more, most fortuitous things that's ever happened. Uh, I'm from Texas, and uh, it's probably the reason why I have a, a nice coat like this, um, uh, Tom James. Um, uh, uh, but the, the private wealth uh, uh, was huge, but the private wealth uh, translated into civil society and social wealth. And there's a, uh, an adage, it sounds strange, but in practice it's correct, that in socialist uh, countries, resources are owned by a very small elite the political class, uh, and in capitalist uh, countries, the mineral resources accrue to the benefit of all. I just wanted to say that um, on waste product, uh, most of the waste product from the garbage disposal units are already, is already being used in the United States. And I believe the first one was begun in, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. But waste management uh, has a, uh, use garbage to uh, methane process in almost every city in America. And I think the largest ones in Miami it's, it's very, very, very productive. Now this stuff is different because obviously it's waste. The fuel is zero. And uh, I've been to see a, co a few of these and they're, they're very, they're amazing. If you've ever, you have a chance to go to see one, you, sh you should because they're, they're just amazing. And they're using this. Our local garbage company in Pittsburgh uh, fires all of their trucks now. 100% on CNG, compressed natural gas. But of course, none of this makes any sense if you've got gas that's really cheap and clean and abundant, and we have the most in Pennsylvania. As you know, we have a 500-year supply for the whole United States, and it's the cleanest, and we can produce it cheaper than any place in the world. So all of this biomass stuff doesn't really make sense today except for the garbage, which is waste anyway, mm -hmm. and it cleans up the atmosphere. So I, I just wanted to say, uh, you know, in Europe, uh, I think they are doing it in Europe some places, and it makes sense a lot there to use it. Anyway, just my comment. <laughs> Thank you. All right, well, it's uh, actually 4 o'clock, so we're going to have to... Oh, Brian, you got a question? You're on the board, so you get to, you get to ask the questions. <laughs> I don't know why I'm asking the question here, but these are two people who probably would know the answer. Has anybody ever looked at the energy that uh, uh, Amazon, Google, Facebook, 
consume for cloud storage and turn climate greenness into a weapon against the left by attacking them specifically to use expensive green energy. I've yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, I think I have seen people comment it. Um, I've, I've seen the argument made. I haven't seen anyone crunch the numbers on it. But I have seen the other side of this debate use that argument against Bitcoin because of the processing power required. Um, yeah. So I've seen them complain about, you know, Bitcoin mining is destroying the planet through carbon dioxide emissions because of all the energy that it uses. But I haven't seen our side utilize it, you know, not in not in public outside of you know our um, kind of blogosphere and. Don't use uh, it No, 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 <laughs> no. All right. Well, yeah, that's going to have to do it. It's four o'clock. We got to wrap up for the uh, next panel. So thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Another. Round of applause for Rob Bradley, Lene Lucan, and for uh, Wolfgang Mueller, too, who uh, had to leave. And uh, we'll see you guys in the next panel in a couple minutes. Thanks a lot. All right. Thank you, everyone. We're going to get started. We have our two speakers here. This is, in case you don't know, panel 8B, Government Overreach or Tyranny. We're going to have Jeff Clark talking about how he reined in the EPA while he was with the Trump administration. And Jeff, uh, and then we're going to have Myron Ebel talk about decentralized totalitarianism. I love, love that expression. Uh, Jeff is the former President Trump selected in uh, EPA General, Assistant Attorney General of the Environment and Natural Resources Division of the U.S. Justice Department. He also was named uh, the Acting uh, Assistant Attorney General of the Department of uh, the DOJ Civil Division. And he is going to talk first, and then we're going to have Myron Ebel, so come on up. Uh, Jeff, appreciate it. Thank, thanks for joining us. All right, well, congratulations for uh, making this far through the conference. We're in panel 8B, so thanks for selecting the B option as well. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll give you, uh, you know, some interesting uh, things to, to chew on here. So just to kind of reintroduce myself, my name is Jeff Clark. I was uh, the only assistant attorney general who ran two of the seven litigating divisions in the Justice Department, and that was for a total of 1,400 lawyers under my uh, control at uh, the Justice Department. I was uh, nominated in 2017, but the Democrats knew that I was coming and they kept me waiting for confirmation for 14 months. So I didn't take office until the end of 2018, uh, but I stayed until six days before uh, President Biden was sworn in. Uh, you know, I had charge of all of the environmental cases through the Environment Division. Uh, and then in the Civil Division, which is actually larger than the Environment Division, I, you know, had a defense of all federal uh, programs other than ones in particularized areas like the environment, but I had that for another reason because I had the other division were tax or antitrust. Uh, for instance, I had control over all of the immigration litigation in the United States, also uh, had uh, control of the vaccine compensation program, so all of the people who applied for vaccine injuries, I had to approve their settlements. Uh, I worked on defending the census and the attempt to ensure that, uh, uh, you know, citizens, non-citizens, I should say, uh, illegal immigrants uh, should not really be counted uh, for purposes of our political system, uh, and uh, worked on building the border wall in particular because the Environment Division was in charge of uh, taking the land through eminent domain uh, to assemble that for, for the for the. Uh, building of the wall. So that's a that's a lot of uh, a lot of things. I looked through uh, the program. Obviously, we had two lunch speakers from Congress, but I think we're relatively light on uh, former executive branch officials. Uh, I you know I know that Dr. Happer and I think one other participant in the conference had served in in different advisory or kind of uh, informational roles inside the executive branch, but. Um, you know, the executive branch is where a lot of action happens. Uh, and, you know, I'm a, uh, a strong originalist, constitutionalist. I think that the uh, 
I don't know if this was causing that noise. Um, I something's beeping at me. Just censor me even as I stand at this podium. Uh, you know, their, their efforts are relentless. But as I was going to say about the Constitution, I mean, the framers clearly envisioned that the legislative branch would be the most important branch. It held the purse string, it passes all of the laws, uh, and laws are deliberately made difficult to pass, though, so that liberty is protected. The executive branch was designed to carry out uh, the laws, not to actually make them. Uh, making them less uh, dangerous. And the least dangerous branch was uh, the judiciary. Uh, I think at this point we really live in a very inverted system in which Congress has allowed itself to become the least important, least uh, threatening branch. Um, in Democrat administrations, the courts generally let them do what they want, making the, uh, the executive branch, the Article II branch, the most dangerous branch by far. That's an era we're living through now. Uh, but, you know, in a Republican administration, or at least an aggressive one like the Trump administration, the courts will block uh, as much as they possibly can. But there's so much authority that's been delegated to the executive uh, that it's hard for them, even if they're, they're kind of forced to play a zone defense and they can't actually stop everything. But that is not the system the framers uh, examined. And, and my experience is, I think, uh, we'll bear that out. Before I talk to you about uh, the title for my presentation, which is Meta, I'll explain that in a bit, I just wanted to give you a sense of how I've become uh, a personal target of the Democrats and a personal target of what I see as rising tyranny in the country. My boss is fond of, uh, who's, he's Russ Avot, the former uh, Director of Management and Budget uh, at uh, the White House. Um, at the Center for Renewing America. I invite you to check out our website. It's uh, renewingamerica.com. But he's fond of saying that it's 11.59 uh, p.m. in the country at this point, and I fully uh, agree with that, and I hope actually at the end of this talk you'll understand why that's true. Um, so let me tell you a personal story. It's June of last year. My family is visiting uh, Atlanta. So thankfully, I'm the only one home. There is massive banging downstairs at the door at that early time of the morning. So the only thing that could pop into my head was, I don't know, maybe a, a neighbor has an emergency. I grabbed the dress shirt I was wearing uh, with my suit the prior day. I, uh, you know, dashed down uh, without actually putting pants on because I thought, you know, I could just peek around, see what the issue is, and then go get dressed or ready as I needed to. What did I see when I opened the door uh, in late June? But uh, 20 agents decked out in uh, bulletproof vests, weapons, um, and uh, several detectives from the Fairfax County Police Department. Um, I would later figure out why they went along for the ride. So they said that they had uh, a search warrant to uh, take all the search for and take all of my electronic devices in the house and I'm electronics heavy so it took him quite a while uh, but I said you know they said you must come outside and I said I'm not wearing pants can I go upstairs and get some pants on before I come outside they said no absolutely not so they pulled me out of my house they stuck me in front of my own garage and uh, then I was uh, body cammed by the Fairfax County Police uh, uh, people who obviously have body cams, but uh, the uh, agents who came to my house were from the Department of Justice's Office of Inspector General. I don't believe they have body cam authority. So I think that's why they tacked in and tied in with the Fairfax County Police. So, uh, you know, once I, it was determined that I was not a safety threat, um, you know, and, and keep in mind that only, you know, five months, five and a half months earlier, I'd been in charge of 1,400 lawyers at the Justice Department. I'd been a, a uh, you know, a colleague of, of these people, and yet I'm being treated like this. So I go, I'm allowed eventually to go upstairs, put on pants, and then they proceed to shuttle me from room to room of my own house and then search it. They brought in something I'd never heard about called an electronic sniffing dog. Uh, Apparently, dogs can smell, they're trained to smell the glue, uh, this is what the agents told me anyway, uh, in, that are commonly used in electronics. Uh, I don't think the dogs found anything that the humans didn't find. Um, 
And uh, I immediately asked for a copy of the warrant, uh, and they were not gonna give it to me. Um, so then I gave them a lecture about the Fourth Amendment, and eventually the, uh, the, the warrant was produced to me. I still have not seen the affidavit supporting the warrant, so I don't know why uh, they were searching, but it became clear to me from you know the general uh, gist of things and what I could see barely evidenced in the warrant, that, that basically they were investigating whether, uh, in the words of the, uh, the New York Times, he was unassuming, basically, until he plotted to destroy our democracy. Um, so uh, because I touched the election and urged that the uh, 2020 presidential election be investigated, that's why I would target, was targeted for this. And it is very alarming because it brings us you know, uh, to the point of, of being uh, a banana republic where an incoming administration immediately goes after the outgoing administration's people or those who are deemed to be effective. So I have a much longer version of, of that talk, but you're here at the, uh, at the Heartland uh, Institute. Um, you wanna hear about, I think, uh, you know, some of the things in, uh, that I did in government and my analysis, but I, I wanted you to know that sort of basic story, which I think frames why the hour is late. Uh, and I'll give, give you with one human interest point about that before I go on, which is to say that uh, when my daughter, my youngest daughter, uh, who's 13, got back from being in Atlanta uh, after she kind of assured herself that I was okay and, you know, uh, she came to me in, in a private moment and she said, Dad, do you think the agents looked at my diary? And it was just, it, it's, it's heartbreaking to, uh, to imagine that. So, you know, I've been uh, targeted by kind of a multi-pronged attack. The inspector general, and this was what the warrant was, has an investigation. You know that there's a special counsel uh, Jack Smith, uh, who is looking at these issues, uh, as well as uh, the Trump Mar-a-Lago documents issues. Um, the January 6th committee made me one of their primary targets. Uh, and then, uh, you know, the, the bar of DC is attempting to take my license away uh, for reasons that are uh, very difficult to determine, despite the fact that I have a spotless record and I've been, you know, I'd served uh, two terms, the, the Trump term, and I did the whole Bush 43 term as well at an earlier time. I've never had any complaints against me and the like, but I crossed the, the tectonic forces of, uh, of questioning the election. All right, so um, I am uh, an appellate litigator, and I know that uh, you know, I'm talking to a lot of scientists and folks with technical expertise. Um, you know, I've, I've played a, that kind of doctor on TV at some points. I actually, in, in the Bush 43 administration first term, I was set to have a debate about climate change issues with Robert F. Kennedy Jr., um, but he backed out of that, so I count that as a, uh, as a win. Um, although he has, I think, become very uh, smart on all of the issues of tyranny that relate to COVID, which I will do uh, some talking about. But I'm used to appearing in front of panels of three appellate judges and you know, making arguments that are essentially in the theater of the mind, right? Um, judges, appellate judges don't like visual aids. Um, and uh, whenever anyone who's never done an oral argument in front of a court of appeals asks me for advice, you know, they almost invariably, especially if they're trial lawyers, they say, what visual aids can I bring? And I say, don't bring visual aids. It's inevitably a disaster. However, I know that the conference is very uh, slide heavy, so I decided to compromise and I brought this homely chart that I made earlier. Thank you, Mark. Um, so this is the subject of my talk, um, which is that everything that's going on, I think everything you've been hearing about the conference, and I was telling Mark that there's some overlaps between my uh, talk and his, they're all designed as instruments of meta-control, and that's what the climate issue is. It is an issue of controlling more than can be controlled by controlling some particular issue or sector alone. And you know, I think the energy issue, uh, which you know, the climate, uh, uh, you know, hoax and, and scare uh, episodes are all designed to do, is all about meta control. So I won't keep that up for the whole presentation, especially because it covers up uh, the placard here. But um, what is what is meta in the sense I'm using it? 
Um, the, the Webster's Dictionary defines it as situated behind or beyond later or more highly organized. So that's the sense in which I mean meta. I don't mean meta, the new name for Facebook. Um, I also found actually the first definition that pops up if you Google it uh, is essentially defining meta to equal woke. Um, they say that it's, uh, you know, to say that something is meta is to say that someone is self-referential. -re so it's essentially pointing to someone and saying like, hey, I understand everything at a higher level, therefore I am meta. But those are not the senses in which I mean it. I mean them as meta control uh, examples. So uh, climate and, and energy in particular, it is the ultimate commanding heights of the national economy. Lenin is famous for uh, having uh, seized in the Bolshevik Revolution, first, the commanding heights of the national economy. Uh, energy is really, I think, not only the United States, but the world's ultimate commanding heights. Um, when the Obama administration issued their endangerment finding, I gave a presentation because they were also doing Obamacare as well. Uh, through the Federalist Society, I gave a talk uh, about the endangerment finding at the National Press Club, and then I had a counterpart who gave a talk about the dangers of Obamacare, and uh, I, I made the point that basically, you know, the, the energy sector was being seized uh, in a fashion by this Obama endangerment finding, uh, and that that would make Lenin proud. And several members of the press approached me after I gave that talk, and they said, are you seriously saying that President Obama is acting like Lenin? And uh, I leaned in and I said, yes, absolutely. That's precisely what I'm saying. Please put that in your articles. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so uh, the, uh, now I'm just going to you know, go a little bit um, in into why it's such a meta control issue, right? So uh, one way it's a meta control issue is that in the 19, uh, early 1970s, the NEPA statute was passed, the National Environmental Policy Act. That statute essentially bolts on looking at environmental issues to every other single statute, even if the other statutes don't actually take account of environmental issues. So uh, it then becomes the world's biggest excuse to shut down infrastructure projects, to hold up rulemakings, uh, to just tie the, the federal government in knots at the whim of environmental groups. And one of the major things that uh, you know, they eventually uh, created under this statute was this concept of cumulative impacts. Because of course, right, if you have one uh, power plant, its emissions are not gonna have any impact on temperature, right? We saw all the calculations about how the aggregate of it really has no significant impact on temperature, even if you go out to 2100. So certainly if you look at one source, it's not gonna do it. So in order to make uh, climate change a significant environmental issue that triggers NEPA, they have to be able to aggregate together through cumulative impact analysis a whole bunch of emissions. And that's precisely what they've done. And that's precisely why in the first NEPA reform regulations in 50 years, uh, which I uh, spearheaded um, and then defended in the courts uh, you know, for President Trump, we cut off and ended cumulative impact analysis so that we could eliminate this you know, silly analysis of, of uh, of, of carbon uh, dioxide related emissions issues. Um, so there, there are a lot of uh, you know, other things I could say about the climate issue being meta, but here's my example which I've written about uh, in an uh, in article for the Liberty blog called Remaking Man by Choice and Decree. There's a professor of philosophy, and of course if it's a leftist professor of philosophy who wants to talk about climate change issues and has ideas and solutions, that's okay. It's only Alex Epstein who is a philosopher. He gets called on the carpet by Barbara Boxer because, well, he's not on that side. But there's this philosopher at uh, NYU, his name is Matthew Lau, and he actually called for genetically engineering human beings to be pygmies because then their energy footprint would be lower. So if you look up my Remaking Man by Energy and Decree article, you'll see how I have a good time with that. Um, yesterday in this room, I heard someone actually asking about the issue of whether they'd ever seen any climate data being cooked. 
I was surprised, actually, that the panel members didn't immediately uh, hop on that and say, yes, there's, there's evidence of that. There's the whole climate gate issue, which, you know, Myron is one of the, uh, the world's experts on and could go into more details than I, I did, but we used it in litigation against the EPA uh, endangerment finding. Um, and the University of East Anglia, right, they had one of the important data sets uh, for the world about temperature. And there's a famous, uh, you know, computer file that came out. It's called the Harry Readme file. And, you know, I remember just off the top of my head that in the Harry Readme file, Harry, the author, who was, you know, a uh, sophisticated computer guy, was saying, you know, it's just botch after botch after botch in this data set. And indeed, they're saying that they have data uh, for uh, temperature stations for particular time periods that hadn't even, the, 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 the station was established after the point in time where they say they had data from the station being taken. So they are absolutely uh, cooking the data and I'm sure, uh, I also remember that Pat Michaels had a whole example where he called for, for a data set they were supposed to have and they drug their feet for a long time and they finally said, oh we don't have it, it was destroyed because it was on floppy disk. Um, so there, there, are, there are many examples uh, like that. So uh, the last issue I want to mention about environmental issues, which climate change definitely plays into, uh, before I talk about other examples, is that uh, the environmental groups, because they help draft the major statutes like the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, uh, et cetera, um, they created this concept called citizen suits, which creates something that is constitutional anathema called a private attorney general. So, you know, the Sierra Club sues as a private attorney general, and if they win, they get their attorney's fees, and then they plow them back into filing more lawsuits against the federal government to stop uh, development projects and otherwise, uh, you know, halt the actions of the, of the federal government. Um, all right, so my second example is this whole ESG concept, which I know there have been several uh, panels that have talked about already. So this is control of the banks and lending, access to capital more broadly, uh, changes to how corporate management is done, uh, affecting all lines of business, right? We also know uh, through the World Economic Forum, et cetera, that they're working on doing things like ending cash and that this is ultimately aiming to something like the Chinese social credit score. And then, you know, what, what more meta control do you need to have than to control capital, to control how management of private corporations, ostensibly private corporations, go forward? And of course, if you can really control people at the level of, you know, denying them spending with a social credit score, you really have ultimate meta control. Um, you have the government actually uh, supporting this through uh, initiatives from the SEC, from the Office of the Comptroller of, uh, of the Currency. This is designed to essentially make uh, ESG a matter of law. Um, I worked in particular on uh, you know, the SEC approving some private exchange rulemakings that did things like require uh, a diversity of board members and so on. That, that rulemaking is a real hoot to read in terms of how they try to figure out how many intersectional uh, you know, trans women do you need to have on your board versus, you know, someone who's black. I mean, it just, it gets into a, an absurd, uh, ridiculous calculus. My third example of meta is COVID, the medical tyranny. The uh, use of the Supreme Court case, uh, you know, from uh, the early uh, 20th century called Jacobson, with the very problematic uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes, you know, who went around declaring that, I forget how many generations it was, you know, five generations of imbeciles is enough, and on that basis, you know, thought it was constitutional to have forced sterilization. Of course he's on board with uh, forced vaccination programs, and then trying to use, that was obviously the, the main legal plank used to, uh, to do the lockdowns. Um, Next, uh, well, I should also say, uh, well, let me, let me pause here and tell you one uh, story that will help vindicate uh, something that, that, uh, that Mark was saying. So I'll tell you a story about being on the inside of the Justice Department during this COVID uh, hysteria. So I was placed, because I guess I was a double assistant attorney general, on the COVID task force. Uh, and um, this was a remarkable body for the Justice Department. I went uh, to a meeting with uh, Attorney General Barr. We discussed when we could reopen the department. It came my turn to speak. I said, all of this is ridiculous. The department should be ordered reopened immediately. All of the career people should be summoned back to actually do work instead of working remotely where we have no idea whether they're actually working or not. 
Uh, and I, I was promptly removed from the COVID task force. <laughs> All right, so uh, I, I mentioned that I headed up the vaccine compensation program for a time, and believe me, I've seen the competing evidence we have for the government to defend the claims, and I've seen the claims presented by the plaintiffs. There are far more vaccine injuries than you can imagine, and many of the stories are heartbreaking because they involve you know, people who become uh, injured and damaged as, as uh, infants and their entire lives are wrecked, and then they need a recovery uh, for the rest of their lives. Um, Here's the next area, which is uh, Klaus Schwab's uh, tactic of fear, right? It just seems like there's a rolling set of emergencies at all times. There's the climate emergency. There is the COVID emergency. Now he tells us, you know, get ready. The cyber attack emergency will be, you know, the, the one that blows all the barn doors off. Um, and of course, because of how computerized our modern society is, if you can uh, uh, control that under some kind of emergency set of powers, it's another meta control device. We have food control uh, being lined up. We have you know, uh, Mr. Gates buying uh, all of the farmland. We have China buying up farmland, including farmland next to military installations. Uh, that's, like, that's a really good idea. Um, you know, that really calls to mind the history of communism. You know, we had Stalin in the 1930s creating an artificial famine in the Ukraine, of all places. Ukraine always seems to come uh, back around these days. The kulaks were uh, deliberately starved. Um, and, you know, it was, a, it was a social control device. It let Stalin uh, consolidate his power. He had both show trials for his political either opponents or sometimes cooperators just to create fear, and he had uh, the murder of the, of the kulaks. We have the meta issue of the media uh, being taken over by uh, concentration. We have uh, you know, clear uh, uh, billionaires on the left who are doing things like buying time. That's the Benioff. We have uh, Bezos buying the Washington Post. You know, democracy dies in darkness. Um, we have, you know, these constant TV programs from MSNBC and CN, uh, I'm sorry, and, and CNN. Um, they control the dominant narratives and, and stories, and that obviously, you know, conditions the thought of the people and how they uh, vote in elections. That's another very important meta choke point to control. We have the fact that the Biden administration wanted to go even farther than that before that blew up in their face. They wanted to establish Nina Jankowitz as the uh, misinformation, disinformation controller of all times. She would have to decide you know, what speech is accurate or not quite accurate enough that it needs to be supplemented, et cetera. And then we have you know, that working hand in glove, even back you know, through the, the deep state, so-called, uh, in the Trump administration with the revelations that came out about the, you know, that on Twitter is called the hashtag Twitter files revelations that uh, Musk has let come out, that the FBI, uh, the Department of Homeland Security, and other parts of the federal government were working directly to censor things like the Hunter Biden laptop story uh, and a host of other stories, including, of course, uh, you know, issues about uh, COVID uh, and the, the medical tyranny. Um, we have Mark Zuckerberg, the head of, of Meta, not, not the Meta I'm talking about, but Meta, the Facebook company, saying that uh, he, uh, you know, was contacted by the FBI and they said, you know, we think this uh, Hunter Biden laptop's going to be Russian disinformation. That narrative has been totally destroyed, but it didn't stop them, even though uh, there's a lot of evidence that that have significantly impacted and might have even just by itself, if there was nothing else, have swung the 2020 election. So that's, you know, controlling misinformation, disinformation, which I think they just, are, they have plans for, they just have shelled them for the time being, is another obviously great meta control device. We have the fact that the educational institutions have been taken over, and you heard Senator Johnson uh, speak at lunch about how, uh, you know, the left took over the universities beginning in the 1960s. I'll deviate there to tell you one quick story about uh, a law professor I had who actually, interestingly enough, was fond of having debates with me because he was a Marxist and I was a constitutional conservative, um, but at least he enjoyed the interchange. There are a lot of academics these days who, who don't. Um, but he was famously asked by the press at one point, um, you know, Professor Tushnet, why do you, uh, uh, you know, hold this critical legal uh, theory uh, critical legal studies, you know, why are you one of the founders of that? Why do you teach Marxism essentially to your law students? You can't possibly hope to make them Marxists. 
I'm not sure that that uh, you know the press person you know was very prescient about that. I think a lot of them have turned into full-on Marxists. But you know his answer was also enlightening, which is, well, I don't you know this is back in the 90s. I don't really expect to make them Marxists, but I do expect to create a lot more Democrat voters. Um, so uh, that that was one of my uh, foundational law professors. So you know they control thought per, uh, formation from the primary schools, secondary schools, and uh, colleges at this point. Um, you know they have critical race theory. Uh, you know they they create a kind of thought tapestry by controlling those institutions of learning. We have the institution of Hollywood, which is another uh, you know meta uh, control uh, device. Um, you know, you can't watch uh, a mainstream Hollywood, you know, movie at this point and not basically get a heavy dose of woke politics. Uh, you know, I, I have a joke with my, uh, with my kids. Um, it really comes from my dad. I watched a lot of movies with him, and he would basically predict the plots, you know, based on little data points that would come out along the way. So I've taken to calling myself, it's become an in-joke in the family, you know, I'm plot master, then I have... Plotmaster Jr., who's actually uh, in the audience with me. And, uh, you know, so, uh, but I've taught them to the point where they can actually start seeing the political propaganda that's built into all of the movies. Um, the criminal law is also being weaponized as an issue of meta control. Um, you know, my own personal story I'll give you as uh, evidence for that that I started with. Obviously, the parents at school board meetings who were targeted by there's, so there's seven litigating divisions of the Justice Department, right? I ran two. One of them is called the National Security Division. It was established in the wake of 9-11 in conjunction with the Patriot Act, right? To go after terrorists and other major threats to national security. Well, this administration, the current one, they weaponized the National Security Division and their counterparts at the FBI to go after parents who don't like critical race theory being taught, who, you know, the, there's a parent famously in uh, Loudoun County who was upset that his daughter was raped in a restroom by a uh, purported transgender uh, boy who was then transferred to another school where he raped a different girl. Um, the Attorney General of Virginia is looking at that now. I think federalism is an important way to push back on this uh, centralized power. Um, I used to sit in meetings, especially with the Deputy Attorney General, throughout my time from 2018 to 21, and I would constantly hear about the National Security Divisions working on domestic violent extremists. And, you know, I, I, sometimes I would ask and I would hear about all the domestic violent extremists who, that, you know, exist on the right, and I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what country you're living in. Like, this is, you know, this is a manufactured issue. You know, I would be... Uh, you know, kind of frowned on for raising those comments. But um, the, you know, I think that's what we saw in things like the Governor Whitmer kidnapping plot, where, you know, there are some, you know, bumbling folks, you know, from lower socioeconomic rungs of society who are kind of roped into a plot that really seems to have been designed by the FBI. Some of them got off, but um, others of them, uh, especially with the judge really ramming things through for the government, did manage to get convicted. We have all of the fake January 6th insurrection uh, uh, narratives. We have, you know, the suppression of the footage that I hope will soon come out uh, through Tucker Carlson and then more broadly. Um, we have just FBI, CIA, and other intelligence community uh, uh, proliferation, right? Um, you know, one of the things I studied in college uh, was, uh, you know, I double majored in economics and then Russian and Soviet history. I remember sitting in the Russian Revolution class around 1986 with Professor Pipes, who was the, uh, uh, the source of President Reagan's line of the evil empire. And I remember him, you know, describing the Russian intelligentsia and how they were an important part of the Bolshevik Revolution. One of the students asked, what is the what is the intelligentsia? And he said, well, the only thing I can think of to analogize it for you here in America is it's, you know, people, uh, uh, you know, in the upper reaches of Manhattan who regularly read the New York Review of Books. Um, <laughs> so, but, you know, they became, uh, they became important supporters of the, of the revolution. And I never thought we'd see anything like the Cheka or the KGB, but we're really seeing the development of a, of a weaponized uh, uh, 
you know, intelligence community state. You heard Representative Boebert today talk about the formation of the Weaponization Subcommittee, which my organization has been uh, really pressing for. Uh, that's a part of the Judiciary Committee. It's going to look at that. It's going to hold hearings uh, into how all those things have been weaponized. Uh, just this week, I wrote a piece about uh, executive order from President Biden 14,091, which uh, is a diversity, equity, and inclusion executive order. That, that executive order is going to establish across the federal, entire federal government, equality of outcome. You know, they're not even hiding it at this point, right? We're not talking about classic, you know, equality of opportunity, equal protection of the law. We're talking about equality of outcome. It's going to be run by Susan Rice, um, who is, you know, the most uh, ultimate uh, leftist partisan that you can imagine. And it essentially takes a page from the NEPA statute. The NEPA statute bolts environmental regulation onto all of the other statutes. At least it's a statute, though. Congress passed it. Um, this executive order is not passed by Congress, but it bolts diversity, equity, and inclusion analysis into every single federal government program, every single one. Um, and international treaties are another uh, meta-control mechanism, right? We're hearing about this WHO pandemic treaty. Uh, we know about the Paris Accords. You should also uh, look up a Supreme Court case uh, that Holmes also wrote called Missouri v. Holland, which basically, uh, you know, if you read it broadly anyway, allows treaties to overcome the limitations in the domestic constitution. Um, you know, that, there was a chance for that to be reversed, uh, you know, about a decade ago in a case that reached the Supreme Court called uh, Bond v. United States uh, that involved, a, you know, a chemical treaty. But that was, uh, you know, um, uh, blunted by uh, Chief Justice Roberts, who basically decided that uh, the statute didn't reach the criminal uh, uh, conducted issue. Justice Scalia bitterly dissented and said this was our chance to get rid of Missouri v. Holland, and we've blown it. Um, and of course, here I'm going to I'm going to say it: uh, the ultimate uh, meta issue is controlling our elections. Um, the Center for Tech and Civic Life, which is this leftist group that I think the prior year before the 2020 election got like a million dollars or maybe two million dollars, suddenly they got 400 million dollars uh, from Mark Zuckerberg, um, which have come to be known as either Zuckbucks or Zuckerbucks. Uh, Molly Hemingway writes about it in her book called Rigged. And they used it to penetrate into the battleground states, especially urban areas, blue areas. And it was a, you know, like a privately funded get out the vote effort and taking over the election apparatuses of the localities. It was particularly effective, but particularly violative of state law uh, uh, in, in Wisconsin, as one example. Um, the ultimate goal of the, uh, I think that it's been removed from the web after I started talking about it, uh, that uh, its um, founder, Tiana Epps Johnson, uh, the Center for Tech and Civic Life promotes, is she wants to have voting by text. And, <laughs> I would submit to you that at the point at which our republic has voting by text, which would be an entirely black box system where some computer folks told you who won and who lost national elections, the Repu there is no republic. I mean, the republic's already teetering on the brink, but if we have voting by text, it's, it's all over. So it is 1159 in America. You do need to, uh, to, to wake up. Um, and why don't I, I I'm going to take two more minutes, Mark. Um, then give me the hook before, before I turn it over to, uh, to uh, Myron. But I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about, because I probably, the, the, the biggest climate, uh, you know, the biggest climate hysteria warrior that you haven't heard of, all right? So I go back to uh, 2000 when in the DC circuit we won the American trucking case which established that the Clean Air Act was a violation of Congress's powers under the Non-Delegation Act. The Supreme Court uh, wound up reversing that. Then in the Bush administration, uh, I argued the Massachusetts versus EPA case which is the first case to decide that uh, CO2 can be regulated under the Clean Air Act. Um, I won, I returned to private practice. Then the Supreme Court took that case, uh, and uh, the Supreme Court proceeded to rule five to four and allow that regulation. That's really the source of, of all evil that ultimately blossomed in the uh, endangerment finding. I inserted a standing argument into that uh, case, and this shows you what a problem we have with the deep state. A whole slew of career lawyers uh, threatened to resign 
uh, if I put that standing argument in. Uh, I was asked by Dick Cheney to uh, argue this big coal mining case where coal mining was shut down in the entire state of West Virginia. Um, I, won, I was told I could not lose that case, and I, I didn't, I won. Uh, but then fast forward to uh, you know 2022, and I have his daughter Liz Cheney trying to hang me through the uh, January 6th committee. <laughs> I was plenty smart back in the uh, mid 2000s, but apparently somehow I became a threat to democracy after that. Uh, I challenged the endangerment finding that ultimately led to the UR case. I could tell you a longer story about that. There was a panel yesterday about uh, all. Oh, and it, it was Ben. Ben talking about all of the. Uh, Department of Energy Efficiency Regulations. Um, maybe I'll save that for a, a question and answer, but I have a, a good point, good story to give you there, uh, Ben. That was a very interesting panel, so kudos to you. Um, and then in the Trump administration, I told you I spearheaded the NEPA reform. I challenged California for a cap and trade treaty they have with Quebec. As I read the Constitution, the president controls foreign affairs, not California, but uh, hey. Um, and I also defeated the Climate Kids case, which was an attempt uh, to, uh, I argued that case personally, out in Oregon, out at the courthouse that Antifa attacked every night in the summer of rage in 2020. But I, you know, I argued the case and won that before then. Um, that was a takeover, attempted takeover by one judge in Oregon of about seven cabinet agencies. The environmentalists wanted them to be ordered to complete a plan that that one judge would then review and decide on, uh, you know, how we would go about reducing emissions, you know, across the, the whole federal government. So I'll stop there, uh, turn it over to Myron. I'll just say, look, what do I, what is meta control? Uh, meta control is essentially communism. It's essentially Marxism. And, you know, I'll, I'll, I think there are all kinds of uh, uh, things we can work on as solutions. I know you heard a lot of people who are optimistic. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I may be less optimistic, although I do think we need to fight. And I think one of the things we need to do is we need to uh, pray for a spiritual revival. And I think that begins with you and your own uh, personal heart. Um, and you need to pray for God's protection for the nation because it is under attack on every conceivable meta front. So thanks. Thank you, Jeff. Wow, that was incredible. You see how that, you see this militarization of your political enemies. It's happening FBI, it's happening in the pro-life community, it's happening January 6th, it's happening across the government where they get raided. Uh, interesting you mentioned RFK Jr. One thing to note is I'm trying to forge new alliances uh, with whether it's Naomi Wolf or Russell Brand, Jimmy Dore, but RFK Jr. has gone strangely silent on climate. In fact, he's gone a little bit the other way. If you get his Children's Defense Fund newsletters, he's actually now writing about the dangers of climate lockdowns, about the UN sustainability agenda. Uh, and, uh, and in 2014, we interviewed him and he said he wanted all climate deniers at The Hague with three square meals uh, and a cot with all the other war criminals. And what he did during COVID, standing up to the mask mandates, vaccine mandates, the lockdowns, Anthony Fauci, the CDC, the public health, I literally indemnify. I say all is forgiven, and especially he's really softened on the climate. There's no way he can support a climate agenda and be opposed to the COVID agenda. So I think he's faced with it. And if you look at his Children's Defense Fund, it's amazing stuff coming out of there. You'd think some of it was from the Heartland Institute, uh, some of this anti-UN uh, rhetoric now. So it's amazing. Uh, next up, we have Myron Ebel, the Competitive Enterprise Institute Center for Energy and Environment, former Trump transition team for the EPA. Uh, and Myron, I'm going to get this right, uh, your talk is interesting title. It's called Decentralized Totalitarianism. So I'm looking forward to hearing about that. Well, thank you, Mark. Let me get the mic. What do I have to do? Turn it on. There you go. There you go. It's on. Oh, you turned it on. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Mark. I, uh, you know, I, I didn't realize that Mark Murano would ever be to the left of me by making <laughs> common, common cause with uh, Bobby Kennedy Jr., <laughs> whom I've confronted a couple of times, and he's truly a nasty piece of work. Uh, he may be right on some issue, but... Well, anyway, it's a great pleasure to be here. I want to, it's been just great to see so many people and meet new allies that I've known about or haven't known about and, 
and, and get to catch up on things. Uh, and it's an honor to be here, and I want to thank Cartland for putting together this great conference and, and inviting me to speak. I've, I've attended virtually every conference uh, and spoken at virtually every conference except the ones that Heartland has held outside of the country. Uh, and I've tried to cover a lot of different topics over the years, try to find something that maybe was being ignored or that I had some special insight on. Uh, at the Las Vegas conference in 21, I actually spoke about uh, this threat of 30 by 30, which Margaret uh, Byfield did a much more expert job at this conference uh, uh, telling you about. Uh, and today I'm going to sort of reflect on the Heartland Conference going back to the first one in 2008. Dick, Dick Lindzen, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm picking up on a couple things that Dick Lindzen said right at the end of his talk uh, yesterday, but you know, he, he had a quote from something he wrote in 1992, which proved that he'd foreseen it all, and uh, uh, the political situation that we're in, and I think that's right. But I, I'm only go not going back to 92. I was doing federal lands and property rights issues back in those days. I'm going to just start with uh, 2008, the first Heartland Conference, March 234 uh, in New York City. And... Um, I couldn't find the videos on the Heartland website of those uh, talks. They've, they've disappeared. They may be on YouTube somewhere. I don't know where they are. But luckily, uh, Eric Pooley, a very high-powered uh, establishment media reporter and editor, wrote a book called The Climate War, uh, published in 2010. And the first couple of chapters go through the, the first Heartland conference, which he covered. And so I was reminded of some things. And Eric Pooley, uh, this book is a very heartwarming story because it's, it covers the defeat of the Waxman, Markey, Cap, and Trade Bill and the disaster of the Copenhagen uh, UN Climate Conference when Obama and Clinton flew in to try to save it from collapse and they all they could get out of it was a promise to create the Green Climate Fund. So it's a very heartwarming story and I, I encourage you to look at it. So, uh, so this is what I was reminded of. Here's what one of the speakers said. The environmental movement is based on a bias against human power over nature. What gives us power over nature? Energy. Therefore, they have been waging war on the use of energy ever since the first Earth Day, Lenin's birthday in 1970, April 22nd. Uh, citing the oft-repeated goal of a World War II-style mobilization of society, the speaker invited his audience to imagine a world war in which the purpose of the war was to have rationing coupons, rather than using rationing coupons to help defeat the enemy. That is what the modern environmental movement is. The purpose is the rationing coupons. That's the end goal. The science doesn't matter. The people who will profit from this are the people who will be running the rationing coupon system. This is all about centralizing political and economic power in the hands of an elite, the environmental elite. Uh, the speaker then went on to say, the other side has a huge megaphone, a thousand times bigger than ours. So, yeah, we've had the tar beaten out of us, but what's really on our side is reality. Reality cannot be manipulated by PR. Reality is on our side, and that's why we will win. But the other side can do a huge amount of eco economic damage in the meantime. In any war, everybody recognizes at some point that one side is going to lose and one side is going to win. But that doesn't mean you don't still lose millions of lives because the war has to be fought out. So there's going to be a lot of carnage here. Well, I, you know, I, I'd like to be as confident now in 2023 as the speaker at the first Heartland Conference was in 2008. Um, so, I said reality will defeat the, the, the green blob, the, the forces of darkness. And uh, that 
may still happen, but I'm a little less confident of that. To condense a long story of what's happened, the, the consequences of the last 25 to 30 years of anti-energy policies came to a, uh, ran into reality head on full speed when Russia invaded Ukraine. Uh, and Europe was completely unprepared because of the policies, the anti-energy policies that they had pursued. And so we should see an incredible and equal reaction. And we have not seen that. So Germany and Britain and the other countries are scrambling to assemble enough energy to keep the lights on, a reopening coal-fired power plants, not closing a nuclear plant, doing all these things. But they're not giving up on the agenda. They're not giving up on the agenda. So the revelation has not led to the reaction that I thought was going to happen. Let me just give one example of this. Despite the, the under kind of under the radar efforts to keep the lights on, uh, the former prime minister Boris Johnson flew to the uh, UN climate conference in Egypt in November. And he said, well, yeah, it's true, you know, we've got this crisis now uh, due to uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Uh, and, and all the, the, the policies that we pursued are, are not working out because of that. But, but don't give up on net zero. <laughs> no, we can't give up on net zero, he said. And especially you, country, you developing countries like Egypt, don't give up on net zero. So uh, how, how have they been able to maintain this fantasy uh, despite what's actually now happening in reality? And, and the speaker in 2008 said, well, you know, it, all this will run up against reality and we'll, we'll defeat the forces of darkness. Uh, what I want to say is, and I'm going to get to, uh, I'm going to describe with other words what Jeff has already talked about. And if we had talked about what we were going to talk about before the, we got here, then maybe uh, I might have. Overlap is good. Yeah, or maybe overlap is good. Um, so I, I, what I've come to think of is that, uh, and many people have said this before, the, you know, uh, the global warming is, or environmentalism is a religion, global warming is, a, is a, an apocalyptic movement or a mil millenarian uh, movement. Uh, but I think we need to sort of understand what a millenarian movement is uh, without just uh, calling it that. Because what it involves the movement from, and this uh, millenar the first millenarian thinker, or apocalyptic thinker, is in the book of Daniel, the Old Testament, uh, but it was, of course, adopted in, in the New Testament in the book of Revelation, or apocalypsis, the, 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 the revealing in Greek. Uh, but, uh, and, and by the way, it, was, it would have been much better if, uh, as Erasmus and Luther both uh, contended, if, if uh, Revelation had never been accepted as a, as a canonical book in the New Testament. But uh, that's water under the bridge now. Um, uh, a, a millenarian movement is the creation of uh, the belief that uh, the end time has come and an activist or a positive millenarian movement is one that thinks that the people involved, the saints who are ready to inhabit the kingdom of heaven that will be created on earth, that they can actually precipitate it against the forces of darkness. That is, they can overthrow reality. What has happened, I believe, is that the the, the forces of darkness who think of themselves as the, the 
king, the, 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 the saints of the new kingdom, but they're actually the forces of darkness because they want to turn out the lights. What they have done is they have successfully created an alternate reality. And uh, Jeff called it meta-control, and I'm going to call it decentralized totalitarianism. The, the, so, the Bolsheviks who overthrew the old order in Russia and created the Soviet Union uh, maintained themselves for 70-some years because they immediately took control of everything. The politics, the economy, the culture, the media, the public square. They took over everything. And then when people started to complain about it, as particularly the true believers, the old Bolsheviks who believed in the kingdom to come, the new, the new Soviet man, the new, the new uh, uh, society that would be created with the abolition of private property, uh, when, when people started to complain about it, the terror was used to, to keep them down. Now, the situation that the forces of darkness are working in are, is not, they're not able to, to seize control. I mean, we have institutions still that they haven't been able to overrun and take over. But what they have done is, is step by step have established totalitarian control over one aspect of our lives after another, or one aspect of society after another. So the first thing, the first simple thing, was the, the, to take over the science. Uh, and we could go through, the, I, I, I've got all, you know, 15 different steps, but let me just say the 97% consensus, right? So if you're, not, if you're not on board the consensus, you're, you're crazy or you're evil <coughs> or you're paid off by somebody or something. Uh, then they took over what are the impacts of climate change. First, it was just the basic science, right? Greenhouse effect. What is the greenhouse effect? How does it operate? How much warming will there be? And so on. Then they took over the impact. So it used to be, when this debate first started, that we had, uh, every time they threw up a potential impact, it was then swatted down by the facts. Polar bears, malaria, Ice caps, glaciers, storms, big storms, little storms, weird weather, droughts, floods. Every single one of these, uh, and Mark Morano has just done a great job of this, and I, I, I mention that because, uh, uh, you know, Jeff claimed that I was a great expert on climate gate, but Mark is, uh, in, in this, in this uh, conference, he is the expert on climate gate, I believe. Um, but. Every one of these, these claimed impacts was swatted down. So what, what has happened now? The intellectual establishment, the universities, the national institutions, the academy and so on, and the media have voluntarily worked together to suppress any of the facts that would upset this alternate reality. This is totalitarianism, but it's not centrally controlled. It's voluntarily self uh, uh, taken on, uh, and they are going to enforce it in a decentralized way. Every institution of society is going to take up its part without having Stalin and, and the, uh, the, the Politburo directing it all. Uh, so I think that's the situation that we're in, and um, I would like to say, uh, I would like to have a discussion with you about what we do about this, uh, and that's why I'm speaking informally from, from table and I have all this stuff, um, which I wasn't uh, energetic enough to put together in, in one, one uh, piece. Uh, the other thing that is keeping this up, keeping this going, keeping the alternate reality going in the face of real reality. And we need to think of something to call the alternate reality because it's not real, right? It's fantasy, it's non-reality. It's non uh, I would suggest just as a, a, a provisional title, we call it Laputa after 
the floating island in, in uh, the third book of Gulliver's Travels, which is uh, always considered the least uh, successful of the four books, but I think it's by far the, the most interesting. It's a satire on Newtonian science, uh, which of course maybe, a, maybe scientists don't think it's funny, but you know, uh, Laputa is a floating island and the, the elite who live in Laputa uh, control uh, the uh, Balnarabi, blah, 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 blah. I'll, I'll, I'll find it real, the, the ground, they control it by throwing rocks down from the floating island onto uh, the, uh, the poor people who live on the ground. And then they also, and I think this is appropriate for, for global warming, they, they destroy their crops by putting the, sh the shadow so that the sun can't shine on, on the ground. Uh, by uh, hovering over over the the crops, so uh, so I don't know what to call this alternate reality, but it is a non-reality. And so, what is to be done? The great question that Lenin asked in 1901 or two. Uh, I think, first of all, the other thing that's keeping this this uh, non-reality, this fantasy, uh, uh, millenarian. Uh, kingdom of the saints going is uh, the climate industrial complex. And there's, there's you know, uh, Senator Johnson and, and Representative Boebert talked a little bit about the so-called Inflation Reduction Act. But I think everybody needs to understand that, that, you know, the material support for this whole fantasy uh, has now been fully funded for the next 10 to 20 years. The Inflation Reduction Act, so-called Inflation Reduction Act, has hundreds of billions of dollars of potential subsidies for wind, solar, electric vehicles, and every type of commercially unviable energy that has ever been thought of. And some of them are gonna be, have subsidies that aren't even really on the drawing board yet. It's just somebody might think this up and if so, we'll hand up some money. So the climate industrial complex is now fully funded for a long time. And this is thanks to the Democrats. I don't think a single Republican voted for it. They passed the Senate with the uh, deciding vote of uh, Vice President Harris. This this is just unbelievable because what happens when you hand out so much taxpayer money to special interests, in this case green energy, what happens? Well, they want more money. I mean, you know, they've got this and now they want more. So I, I, was, I was stunned at the first day of the new Congress. I was up, up on the Hill and I was, in fact, uh, Representative Boebert was in the, in the chamber voting, but her staff was uh, in the office and I dropped by to say hello. And uh, I ran into a lobbyist that I used to know. He used to work for the, he's a lawyer lobbyist and he used to work for, uh, for the House, one of the House committees. And one of the things he said that uh, right away was, you just can't believe how much money is sloshing around on K Street. Well, why, you've just gotten hundreds of billions of dollars of subsidies. No, no, they want more, right? You know, there's, there's no way to, to ever sate this beast. So one of the things I would just throw out that we have to do, because uh, the, more, the more spacey stuff I've talked about, I'm not quite sure what we need to do, uh, is we, we need to really support a rescission package as part of the debt ceiling deal that will take back the money that has been authorized but not obligated for all of this green crap. Uh, and this, is, this could be a huge fight. Uh, and the second thing is, I think we need to point out uh, that faced with blackouts and higher gasoline prices and shortages, these are only going to increase. 
uh, I think we need to point out that the people behind this, these policies, these anti-energy policies, are deeply, deep, I don't want to call them evil, and I don't want to call them insane, although we, some of us may think both of those things. But they are deeply misguided if they don't understand, as Jeff said, that energy is the master resource. And as Rob Bradley has his blog, The Master Resource, which I encourage everyone to read. Uh, and that as we move into this, this period, as things get worse and worse, we can't let them get away from it the way they did in Australia when they had the huge blackout. And the environmentalists and, the, and the, uh, the, the politicos said, oh no, it isn't due to the fact that we closed all of our coal-fired power plants. It's due to the fact that the greedy natural gas people were exporting all the natural gas instead of standing to the natural gas. No, no, it's because they've misinvested tens of billions of dollars in, in windmills and solar panels. And if you, here's, uh, and I will stop soon, but I think we have a problem here because everybody always points out California. California is always ahead in these crazy policies that, that are, and they have, you know, higher energy costs, they, electric rates, higher gasoline prices, and so on. But in fact, the place that is the most likely to start having big blackouts, and maybe uh, you can talk about it, is, is Texas. Because Texas, under, under the influence of Ken Lay of Enron, Governor George W. Bush promoted and got signed into law a renewable electricity standard that has led now to 20-some years of colossal misinvestment, overinvestment in windmills, and underinvestment in natural gas turbines, which are needed because Cal Texas's population has been booming and they closed all their coal-fired power plants. So they are, they are likely to actually be ground zero, and maybe you could say, say if I'm wrong here, Carr, but uh, they are likely to be ground zero, and of course then the, the in environmentalists are gonna say, well, you, it's what you'd expect from a Republican state not being able to handle the green transition. So. Uh, I, we, we've got to figure out how to deal with this. I still think reality is on our side, but it isn't proving uh, against the, the fantasy of, of this mil millenarian movement. It isn't proving quite as effective as I thought it would be. And I'll stop there. All right, we got a lot of time for Q&A. Um, I'll start with the first question, I guess, more directed toward Myron. It, the Republicans right now, Kevin McCarthy, you can watch his videos, he'll say climate's a problem but, and Republicans believe in a solution. We want carbon capture, we want to plant, what is it, a trillion trees and of course we believe in all the above energy. What do you think is wrong with that approach and will that approach help fight <laughs> what you just laid out? <laughs> just briefly. Well, you know, I got to say, uh, uh, Representative Lauren Boebert and her 19 heroic colleagues in the yeah. House Freedom Caucus, they have actually provided, by forcing institutional reforms of the House to go back to the old way of doing things, they have actually provided the conditions that can allow Kevin McCarthy to succeed as Speaker, despite himself. Yeah. And what you just said is a good example of the despite himself. <laughs> the fact is, look, the, the great thing about this country is, in, in fighting this, is the Republican Party is the only major political party in the world that hasn't bought into the climate agenda, to the green, sure. to, the, to the forces of darkness, hasn't given in to the forces of darkness. You know, the, in Britain, at Westminster, they've created uh, a net zero scrutiny committee. They won't even call it an anti-net zero committee. It's just we want to look at it. Well, they've got 300 and some members in the Conservative Party in, in Westminster and 200 and some labor. They've only got 40 members of the net zero scrutiny committee, last I heard. And that's like 12, 15% of the Tory 
members. So in this country, it's just the opposite. The Republican Party is solid, and then we have people nibbling around the edges saying, well, we have to talk the talk because that's what young people are interested in, and that's what suburban voters are. That's, well, this is all Frank Luntz, right? The, uh, Kevin McCarthy lives in, in Frank Luntz's palatial <laughs> condo, and pays nominal rent, and Frank Luntz gives him the talking points for subverting the Republican Party into believing <laughs> this kind of stuff. Look, we, how can you possibly say to somebody who thinks that global warming is really a problem that, well, of course I agree with you, I just don't want to do anything serious about it. I just want, I just want you know, superficial stuff. No, these people want real suffering. They want real rationing. They want, you know, they want the rationing coupons and they won't know who's going to benefit from running the system of having the rationing coupons. So what he's doing is a complete disaster. And luckily, almost no Republicans have bought into it. And most of the ones who do uh, get defeated at the next election. Uh, Kevin McCarthy, uh, people should understand, he has the, the oil industry in California in his district in Kern County, but he also has more windmills, and this is maybe five years out of date, he has more windmills in his district than any other member of Congress. Wow. Okay, wow. Can I, All right, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, let me, Jeff. Well, I'll, I'll start as has been my, uh, it's not always my approach, but I'll, I'll just do it with another homely story. So shortly after I started in, uh, in 2018, I received a call from a company that was heavily invested in wind. I won't name them. I'll, I'll, let's just call them, you know, the, the cylindra or the wind cylindra of 2018. <laughs> they called me and they were very concerned because the career people were actually ramping up a serious Migratory Bird Treaty Act case against them because, of course, the wind turbines kill lots of birds, lots of migratory birds. And they, they were begging me, you know, please, please make this enforcement action go away. And, of course, I told them to pound sand because I'm not going to save them from the fact that they're engaged in a, uh, an energy boondoggle that hurts the American people. But, uh, you know, I have no doubt uh, that uh, this current administration, when they get that kind of call from well-heeled, uh, you know, wind, solar interests about, you know, uh, uh, how the environmental laws could actually skewer them, and they want that softened because, of course, they're all in the in the cause. Um, I'm sure that those calls are treated very differently. Um, I, I want to address something that Myron, you know, kind of brings around. He he talks about uh, millenarianism and kind of you know doomsday thinking, and and Steve Malloy. Uh, yesterday on his panel was actually saying that he hears, when he hears people talk about uh, climate change as a religion, he says, no, that's wrong. It's Animal Farm. Well, I, you know, it struck me that I think actually both uh, things are correct. In other words, uh, for the pigs, right, who become the four legs who go to two legs in Animal Farm, you know, namely the people who are running these meta systems, and I think it's a lot more centralized, so maybe I <coughs> disagree with, with Myron about that. Maybe Mark agrees with me more about that. I think they are using the Animal Farm model to ultimately profit themselves. But I think a lot of their foot soldiers, you know, I think of the soccer moms in America, et cetera, and, you know, the current products of our university system, the young people, I think that for them it is a religion, right? They have, they've not signed up to this because they think that they're going to become fabulously wealthy off of it. They're actually willing to put the hair shirts on, um, you know, and take the rationing coupons. But the pigs who actually run the system, I think they run it for communistic uh, purposes. So I think that, that's what explains the fact that there's a debate about whether this uh, environmental catastrophe thinking is religious or is it self-interested, but from dark forces. I think it's both. Uh, we can take some questions now. Is there a microphone here, or how are they going to do this? Bruce Rosenthal, yeah, there you one go. quick question. Uh, can you please discuss a little bit the reinstatement of the importance of the Tenth Amendment in the West Virginia power case and where we might go from there? Okay, who wants to take it? Yeah, oh, Jeff. yeah you. you. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you're, you're the lawyer. I'm the lawyer. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, so Bruce, thanks for that question. So the West Virginia case 
is uh, a very important case. Just a quick thumbnail if you're not familiar with it. Uh, the Obama administration adopted something it called the Clean Power Plan, which basically uh, was a, a way to get, you know, ultimately to net zero and control in a series of steps. The first step was basically to outlaw uh, coal-fired power plants so that you got natural gas fired plants and then ultimately to transition everything to renewables. It was a takeover really of the entire grid, an invasion of the whole regulatory sphere reserved for the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, even though Congress didn't give EPA that power. Uh, and uh, so that was stayed by the Supreme Court, thankfully, so it never went into effect. Um, and, and one of the reasons why it was stayed was because the Obama head uh, at the time, Gina McCarthy, said that, uh, oh, don't worry, like the fact that there are litigation challenges to this don't matter because the utilities have already changed their investment plans. And so, uh, you know, we, even if it gets reversed, it's going to be a Pyrrhic victory. We're already have achieved our goals. And, you know, uh, the story may be apocryphal, but I've heard from many, you know, sources who say that uh, that actually sent Chief Justice Roberts through the roof. And as a result of that, you know, majority of the Supreme Court voted to put a hold on the rule. So it never actually had the effect and the joke was on Gina McCarthy. So then fast forward to the Trump administration. The Trump administration adopted a much more uh, modest rule uh, of controls. I would like to have seen the stronger medicine, Bruce, of uh, the EPA reversing the endangerment finding and saying we're not going to do any rule in this area. I begged uh, Andrew Wheeler, the EPA administrator, to do that. He told me it would come in the second term. I said, we might not get a second term, uh, you know, so I'll leave you to your own judgment there about that. But we got the ACE rule, which was definitely a lot uh, better for the economy than the clean power plan. Uh, then uh, that was, case was argued in the D.C. Circuit at the end of the Trump administration. The day before uh, Joe Biden took the oath of office, the D.C. Circuit uh, struck down the ACE rule. Um, and so in that mess, enter uh, West Virginia, a coalition of states and industries who challenged the idea that, you know, things might revert back to the clean power plan uh, because the ACE rule uh, from the Trump administration had been blocked. And ultimately, the Supreme Court decided that uh, the Clean Power Plan was unlawful, and it decided it was unlawful because uh, it violated something the Supreme Court gave a name to for the first time, even though there are various predecessor cases called the Major Questions Doctrine. And the Major Questions Doctrine basically says if there are major, you know, very important questions of economic and political significance, that Congress has to speak clearly to give that authority to an agency before it can actually issue it. And there was no indication of such a clear statement in the Clean Air Act that anything as sweeping as the Clean Power Plan was something that Congress wanted. Ergo, that all collapsed. So now, Bruce, to you know, go to your question, the issue is, well, what happens from here? Um, I think that we have to avoid a, a Scylla and a Charybdis, right? We have to avoid uh, overusing the major questions doctrine such that the middle of the court scales back on it and we don't get its full promise in containing the administrative state. That's one danger, call that the Scylla. The Charybdis is uh, not using it at all for fear of you know, the fact that it might be scaled back. So we have to make judicious use of it. We have to look for situations where agencies are really claiming unprecedented powers that it's clear that they really should return to the democratic process of a newly invigorated Congress. Um, and that's a very, you know, case-by-case case, uh, thing that involves kind of sophisticated lawyering and thinking through and then processing how's that going to play to the nine justices on the court. Right. Next question. Uh, Rob Bradley. Uh, comment. During World War II, we had coupon rationing with gasoline yes. and other uh, necessities and uh, it was east of the uh, Mississippi and uh, with with gasoline rationing it was uh, it was very problematic if you can imagine um, uh, and they uh, they had a B C D guess who was a all government officials and school teachers, public school teachers. So that gives you just a feel for what could be uh, coming ahead. Now, it, it's going to be. I have a comment. Is that okay? 
Is it okay if I... Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll answer your comment with this observation, which is that in the Soviet Union, they had something called the nomenclatura, which is essentially uh, the fact that um, some people are more equal, that some animals are more equal than others from Animal Farm, right? So all of these systems create winners and losers. Most of us, are normal people, are losers, but the elites, uh, they become, they'll become the new U.S. nomenclatura. Uh, Steve Malloy. Uh, Jeff, I wanted to apologize for first dropping the ball on that question yesterday about does the government make up data. Uh, yes, they clearly do on, you know, thinking about it, all the NOAA temperature, global temperature data is made up because there, there simply isn't data from a, of a lot of the world. So that's made up. It wasn't climate, climate gate though, it was uh, something slightly different, but NOAA does, the government does make up data. But my question to you is what can we do to get courts to look at science again. You know, in the 1980s, uh, companies would challenge EPA on NACs, for example, and the courts would actually do a bit of a review of the science. But that doesn't happen anymore. And I'm concerned that, uh, you know, we've got litigation right now with EPA on particulate matter, uh, could very well make it to the Supreme Court, and they just don't really care to look at the details of the science. And so EPA can do whatever it wants, can lie, cheat, steal on the science, and, and it's unreviewable. So, you know, what can we do? So, so Steve, I think we need an amendment to the Administrative Procedure Act. So first, let me answer with a little bit of history. So in the D.C. Circuit, they had a wide-ranging debate between two judges, so the judges gave the name to the debate, the Bazelon leventhal debate. So Judge Bazelon essentially won, and his view is, look, you know, we're, we're just generalist judges. We can't process these complicated uh, things that the modern, you know, uh, scientific technocracy kind of presents to us. So, you know, we, we just have to defer to what the executive branch tells us. Um, I'd heard someone refer to that as Chevron. That's not actually Chevron. Chevron's about deferring to how statutes are construed by agencies. This is a kind of uber form of, of factual deference, that if an agency has technical or scientific expertise, we just turn off our brains and defer to them. Judge Leventhal said no. Judge Leventhal said, um, you know, what cases come to us come to us, and if a dispute turns on some kind of complicated issue of fact, well, this is what we get paid for. We have to roll our sleeves up, we have to figure it out, and we have to delve into the details to do that. That's just the nature of our job. And there was a, you know, a sense in which that, that could still win cases in the 1970s. One of my mentors at the large law firm that I worked at before I was canceled uh, as a result of the 2020 election and uh, the New York Times, et cetera, and the January 6th committee, uh, you know, told me you know, in the 70s and the 80s, he would regularly win cases based on factual issues. You know, he won a, a big case called corrosion proof fittings in the Fifth Circuit about asbestos issues. So that, it's just that the judges really have adopted the, the Bazelon view of the world. And so the only way to get them to abandon that because they're driving that, driving that out of the arbitrary and capricious standard, those you know, three words in the Administrative Procedure Act, is to amend the Administrative Procedure Act and to make the judges address the factual questions. And they do address complicated factual questions. Take patent cases, right? There, there are very complicated arguments about that, and the judges realize that they actually have to get in, roll up their sleeves, and figure it out. I think that's the solution. Okay, we have about five, less than five minutes, so let's keep them quick and short answers. We'll get as many as we can in. Hi, uh, Adam Woldavsky, New York City. Uh, climate ought to be a scientific and economic issue, but in this country it seems to split very clearly on left and right lines. Do you have a theory as to why that is? Myron, Meyer, you want to take that? <laughs> well, I have several theories, and I'm not sure if any of them are any good, so I'll throw <laughs> one out. Uh, look, the... the uh, why, I think we first have to figure out why every country in the world there's a uh, there's a consensus that climate is a, is a crisis that has to be addressed by massive government interference in in people's lives 
and, and the, the energy economy, the productive economy, and why in this country there it isn't. And uh, I don't know the answer to that, but I will just throw out that this, uh, and Ron Johnson and Lauren Boebert brought this out very clearly, uh, and I, f I think Ron Johnson said, in fact, that the left is concerned with power. Uh, he didn't finish that, but I think Lauren did. The right in this country is concerned primarily with freedom. And it doesn't matter what the science is, it doesn't take very hard to, it isn't very hard to figure out that the agenda that follows from the scientific claims of the climate alarmists is all about destroying freedom and establishing the power of, 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 of an urban bicoastal elite against, against uh, uh, the working class. And I think uh, one of the things that we're seeing, uh, and I think it's, the climate issue is one, of the, is one of the key drivers, is that we have a semi-educated managerial class that works for big corporations, works in quotation marks, and works for government, and, in quotation marks, and those people are now beholden to, to essentially this agenda of, of more government control, energy rationing. Uh, they, can't, they can't really question it. And we found out during the shutdown, you know, uh, who, the, who the essential people were. They weren't the people like me who went home and sat in front of a computer screen and, and worked. It was, you know, the truck drivers, the, the grocery store clerks, uh, you know, remember that meat packing plant where everybody caught COVID? And they first said, well, we'll have to close down the plant. And then they, then they said, oh, no, 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 actually, it doesn't matter whether you have COVID or not, you have to go back to work because, you know, we can't, we can't lose the production from that meat packing plant. And so the, uh, I, I'm trying to get back Adam, to your question, but you know, it is now in fact the case that in in like two three elections, the Republican Party has has switched from the party of uh, wealthy people and uh, suburban voters to the working class party. Uh, you know, Frank Buckley got this first right after the uh, 2016 election. He was, he's a, he's a law professor, but he was a speechwriter for Trump, and he wrote the Republican Workers' Party. Um, and so, uh, the, uh, in this country, I think the people who are really concerned with freedom get immediately, it doesn't matter what the science is, it's the agenda is anti-freedom because the, all the proposals for dealing with the scientific problem, whether it is one or not, are all about more government. Where it is in you know, most European countries that freedom is not a, a huge value. It's not a really, uh, so I, I don't know. That's, that's one theory I have, but I, you probably have better ones. All right, we probably have time for one more question so we can make it to give you, guys, give you a little break before the carbon tax debate and dinner coming up. So go ahead, one more. Uh, Bill, Bill Lindquist from California. Uh, the last question might be a completely stupid one, but it's to you, Jeff. Is there any way of setting up a special court? Let's call it the climate court or the science court manned and women by judges with some scientific background that could more probably um, conduct legal proceedings of the type that we have in mind. So I've thought a lot about this and there were questions about that raised uh, as part of the, the Trump uh, transition. You know, Myron might have addressed them. Um, I'm skeptical of that because one of the branches of economics that I'm particularly fond of is public choice economics. I think that court would become captured very quickly uh, because it would require people to have you know, credentials and they'd probably have some of the same credentials that puts people on the IPCC uh, and you know, then, then we're gonna wind up with you know, an even worse situation. I actually like having generalist judges 
who are appointed by different presidents, right, who, who can, I, I think the problem is they've just, they've turned their brains off and they've been taught this in law school. I think the APA does need to be uh, reviewed. The uh, last observation is one of the things I've thought about for cases that don't get centralized in places like the DC circuit, and there are entire categories of regulatory cases that go to the DC circuit and almost only to the DC circuit, especially all the major Clean Air Act cases. But if you're talking about cases that start in the trial courts, if we had something like the ability that Lord Mansfield had, and he's the, you know, the English jurist who, um, you know, was the first to strike a blow against uh, slavery. Some people, you know, attribute him with with ending that uh, in in uh, in England. Um, he would impanel expert juries, right? So if he had a dispute in a particular trade, he would find the fellow tradesmen, and they would understand the course of conduct and so on. For the modern age, right, where science and technical issues are much more complicated, you could do something like that. I'd like to see Congress uh, uh, experiment with that, but in a decentralized way with district courts or specialized courts in each of the states, a lot harder to capture. I think if we made one specialized court in Washington, D.C., it would get captured, unfortunately. All right, and thank you. We're a little bit over time. Um, I'm Mark Morano, Climb Depot. Thank you as your moderator. Thanks to Jeff Clark and Myron Ebel. If you have any other questions, they'll be here. Thank you very much. That's great.